Welcome and good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for the organization of this Congress, uh, for the wonderful uh, welcome we all of us had received. And uh, so we can start with, with this session on intensive care. Uh, in this session, we will treat uh, several aspects of the utmost importance and starting with uh, some uh, view on the future and the impact of artificial intelligence and then we will touch some other important aspects of the daily practice in intensive care. And I want just to give words to my co-chair. Okay, good morning. I have a privilege to introduce our first speaker. This is my co-chairman, Professor Eduardo De Robertis. He is coming from Italy, as you may know. He is professor from the University of Perugia in Italy and also past president of European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. The name of the lecture, interesting one, Future of Critical Care Between Artificial Intelligence, Augmented Reality and Passion. Please, Professor. Here, here we are. So uh, these are my conflict of interest. Well, uh, first of all, we have to, uh, there are some facts that are now uh, clear to us. And the fact uh, are, uh, I mean, it's, it's very nice this, um, it's very nice this document that has been published by the European Commission uh, about the artificial intelligence in healthcare and what is, mm, quite clear now is that there is high potential for uh, artificial intelligence and our future will be uh, highly touched by artificial intelligence. And we are speaking of uh, um, clinical practice, but we are also speaking of um, biomed research, uh, public health and uh, administration of healthcare systems. So uh, this is a, a, a very important aspect. Uh, as uh, anesthesiologists and intensivists, I mean, our um, field of action, our specialty, is in highly um, dependent uh, on technology, an highly dependent um, technology uh, specialty, and uh, since the beginning of our, uh, of our history. And to some extent, in some aspects, we already uh, deal with artificial intelligence, and 
sooner, I mean, we will hear about uh, uh, clinical applications of artificial intelligence. Uh, but more or less, uh, artificial intelligence at this moment is uh, um, expanding the, the, the possibility offered to us. Um, speaking in, in, in the easiest way, I mean, we can, s we can see that the, the artificial intelligence can be divided in two main aspects, the virtual branch, uh, that is mainly uh, addressing uh, the development of algorithms that are able to uh, improve when exposed to more data. And in, in these aspects, we already have several exp um, already uh, active uh, example, like for instance, uh, algorithms that are used for, to, for prediction or um, also pattern recognition that are uh, what, what is called un under uh, unsupervised uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Or we have also starting to have uh, e examples of uh, deep learning with um, the feedback that from the algorithm modification. So it's, it's much, much more complex systems, but they are uh, already existing. Uh, Mm, these are very important for our practice, but together with the virtual branch, we have also a physical, a physical branch uh, with uh, robots, uh, car bots, and chatbots, but all, all of them are st um, starting to, to, to be uh, present in our um, daily practice. And it, so it's not the case if you look at the, 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 the increasing uh, literature on, on artificial intelligence, as you see, has increased as uh, skyrockets over the last uh, uh, few uh, years. But then uh, what the anesthesiologists and intensivists think about artificial intelligence? We have run um, this uh, European survey a uh, few months ago that has been published a few months ago, uh, in which we have asked to a large population of uh, colleagues what they uh, think uh, about artificial intelligence. Um, we, we, I mean, you see here three lines. The first line is pure anesthesiologists. The second line are intensivists. The third line is uh, uh, mixed, uh, but w with, with some experience in, in, in the field. Uh, several uh, questions were posed, like for instance, uh, the difficulty we have in reading the uh, literature or, I mean, if there are legal aspects that can um, create some as problems uh, or if uh, there is uh, not enough knowledge and um, more or less if the, the problem of the, the black box is a main uh, deterrent for the use of artificial intelligence. Moreover, we have also asked, for instance, if we can use uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for as models for prognostic. Uh, I mean, several other um, questions, interesting questions. Uh, at the end, uh, to summarize the, the main results of this survey is that um, there is quite um, a good awareness of artificial intelligence in, in our field. Uh, to be honest, the, the, the anesthesiologists and intensivists are much more prone to artificial intelligence respect to, for instance, pain medicine. Um, there are, I mean, uh, there is a, a positive uh, feeling towards artificial intelligence, uh, although there are still aspects that, are, that scare the colleagues uh, relatively to, to et uh, ethical aspects and the, 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 the understanding of what is behind artificial intelligence. Uh, more or less in the same period, there is also this other paper that has been published by the group of Kai Zagorowski in um, Frankfurt. Uh, this is a little bit different because the, the population that has been studied is a little bit smaller because it's uh, few uh, colleagues that, we, uh, that were interviewed, but with a very more deep in detail interviewed. So it's, it's a little bit different, less number, but a little bit more um, deep in, in the understanding of what, what those people thought. And I mean, here again, we have uh, uh, the results of, us, uh, of more or less uh, the people are optimistic. There is um, a small group of uh, skeptic that needs to be somehow convinced of the convinced. I mean, I think that that is the future and we cannot stop it. We have just to, 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 to govern it. So what are the things that we need to consider for our future? Well, uh, uh, each 
uh, ICU uh, patients, each ICU bed produce every day a huge amount of data. And the same is for, uh, the same is for um, an anesthesia procedure. The already today we have a lot of data and we have already able to acquire a lot of data. The problem is that the, in, the, in the future, or probably already today, what we have to, to stress is the, the way we can use this huge amount of data rather than uh, acquire them. So this is uh, our main task now. Um, and uh, why the artificial intelligence can make uh, our profession better? For sure, we can, we, through the, 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 the artificial intelligence, uh, have a very, very good uh, idea of what is the uh, pat patient's variability. And I think that this is the main aspects that will be touched uh, in, in the next lecture. Uh, and this means that we can better tailor our care and we can uh, really have better diagnostic uh, in, 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 uh, in a quick uh, period of time. Uh, we can identify patients uh, um, prone to deteriorate, but also the importance of uh, a, stro <coughs> Sorry, a strong interconnection between departments, between different parts of the hospital and the, also the out of the hospital, so that probably we can, uh, are going to, to see a more comprehensive uh, um, um, management and pathways of our patients. Uh, the problem is that uh, the ability to deal with this huge number of data, uh, the volume, uh, as I show you, it's 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 a huge amount, and there is also a variety of uh, dif different format of data. You can imagine that data can come from uh, monitoring, can come from uh, lab, can come from uh, the um, diagnostic. I mean, all those data could should uh, come together, and also the velocity to which we are able to 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 to, to analyze those. Uh, we had uh, uh, an experience during the COVID period with the Envision program that was uh, this is uh, um, was granted with an horizon um, grant of uh, six million of euro, and my center was one of the the, the center of the of the group, and we have uh, developed this um, system to 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 analyze data to 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 import data to analyze data of COVID patients and uh, to, to, to respond, I mean, to, to clinical questions. Um, the, the, those that you see in this slide were the challenges with, we, that we faced, like the, for instance, the difficulty to, 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 for the interface of the, the, uh, the, all the systems. Uh, to be honest, we, we were really running against the time because of you remember that period. We, we, we had a lot of things to do. And so it was very complex. Um, the teaching of the staff, the IT uh, infrastructures, many other aspects uh, about the, the coding and the, 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 the way we, we speak each other because it was I mean, the different language that were spoken at that moment and the standardization of the machine data. So several aspects we, uh, were really highly challenging, challenging, but I think that the, the main aspects that were at the end uh, discussed was the, the, the problem of the quality of the data, because when, when we speak of all this data, we have uh, what we, we say garbage in, garbage out, because if we put the wrong data inside, we will have wrong output. And, and also the, 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 the ethical and illegal challenges of the artificial intelligence. And in fact, uh, the risks of uh, artificial intelligence can be categorized in several aspects. First of all, uh, ethical, uh, the problem of privacy and so on, uh, the patient's harm due to artificial intelligence. Who is responsible of those uh, problems? Um, and, and other aspects, like for instance, the lack of transparency, because the main aspects we deal with is the, what we call the black box. I mean, what is in, what, what, how is this artificial intelligence doing with our data? We not, most of the time, we don't know how the, the, the machines has been developed. 
And uh, for, for many of those aspects, I think that the new uh, Artificial Intelligence Act that, that has been approved at the European level a few weeks ago uh, will help us a lot because it poses some um, clear frame in which we need to move for, for the application and the, the development of the artificial uh, intelligence. But now, uh, some more uh, uh, practical, I would say, aspects linked to our behavior respect to artificial intelligence. Uh, for sure, what we need is to trust what uh, the artificial intelligence is telling us. And, uh, uh, and we, to some extent, we should accept the recommendations. Uh, but then, the problem is that not always we are sure of what we see. Um, sometimes we have a uh, uh, problem of missing data or incorrect algorithms that can be uh, applied uh, or developed for something and applied in other situations and in this way we, we really can end up in some uh, aspects of uh, inaccuracy. I just like I can make just an easy example. Uh, all of us has used uh, Abyss technology, okay? But we exactly don't know what is inside that algorithm. We know that it has been developed with some drug. Most of the time we use this with other drugs. Can we trust that number? We need research, but on the other hand, we are a little bit blinded about what is inside. So what, how can I develop a correct research without knowing some aspects? And this is our main aspects our main problems. The black box, this is what is inside, I mean, what, what we is inside the machine. And uh, I mean, artificial intelligence works like our brain, uh, receive inputs and give outs. Uh, at, uh, and we really don't know uh, how the system arrived to the, their conclusion. Uh, so we, to some extent, uh, needs to, to have more um, understanding of what be happens mm, in, 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 in the machine because the models uh, um, uh, and the methodology that we can uh, apply in studies depends on those aspects. So what we uh, really need is to uh, have a strong a relationship with the industry, uh, uh, a strong understanding of what become, uh, what, 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 what happens inside the, 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 the systems and arrive to a more transparent box. I really like this uh, sentence of uh, Isaac Asimov, that part of the inhumanity of the computer is that once it is competently programmed and working smoothly, it is completely honest. That's a problem. And uh, because we, now we are starting to use and to program, but how with, with machine learning and so on, how we, are we governing the evolving algorithms? They, they keep on working. And so th that is the main, the, main, the main aspects. So what I think is important that probably we are using not a correct word we are speaking of artificial intelligence. We, we need, we, I think that we need to start to speak of augmented intelligence because the, the, te the technology is very potent today and it really can give us a lot of help, but it should be governed by us. Um, and if we arrive to a, a, a compromise, I mean, of, uh, uh, of an, an understanding or of, and of uh, governing of the artificial intelligence, then really our patients can benefit a lot because it will benefit of clinicians that are much more, that will be more uh, prone to, 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 um, to work on, on, on the, or more humanistic and in a relationship with family and with the patients. So we'll have more time to, to, to other aspect of our professions that too much for, for too many years has been not considered 
um, I mean, considered relevant, but probably for lack of time, not, not really addressed properly. So really we need to put the patients at the center, and really we need to, uh, to, to, um, to work on clinical outcomes and to, to have the, the, all these aspects driven and governed by us. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so um, we decided that since the first and the second lecture uh, are uh, on artificial intelligence, um, we, we will have questions after the first two and then uh, after the second and, thir and third one we will have other uh, questions. So it's my pleasure now <laughs> to invite my, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, Professor Peset from Croatia, please. Good morning again. Thank you for your kind introduction. Please first let me express my gratitude to Professor Vesna Durnev that I'm here today on this valuable Congress. I'm happy enjoying this lovely atmosphere and I will give a lecture about uh, artificial intelligence in hemodynamic optimization in perioperative period anesthesia and ICU. I come from the hospital, from clinical department, where we are a referral center of Ministry of Health in Croatia for hemodynamic monitoring of surgical patients. And we are trying to get uh, good education and skills on this field, together with other fields in intensive care medicine. I'm also president of Croatian Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And I will tell you a little bit about this technology that we are using a little bit over three years. We have some investigations running out and finished also in this field. So you will see a little bit about it. First, intraoperative hypotension. Let me go back to this problem. We have this problem every day in our ORs and ICUs. Everything I think is said about that. Uh, several randomized trials. This one is big one. As you can see, a large number of surgical cases. They are all together uh, in one conclusion that strategy maintaining to get above these hypotension levels about mean arterial pressure 65 or at least not well be below the baseline of our patients is something that we need to think about because clinical outcomes of hypotension is very detrimental. Uh, whatever you think about any organ, uh, none of them wants to be in hypotensive period for a long period of time. If, you, if we want to measure or to know our cardiac output, we need to measure it. It is very simple. But yet, this research that included 28 European countries, over 400 hospitals, said that only 10% of our patient, high-risk patient in major surgery have cardiac output monitoring. I think it's a very, very low number. Maybe it's time for new research. Uh, maybe the, this, this will be better numbers, not so low as it is. Advanced cardiac output monitoring, I will not tell you about the levels of cardiac output monitoring. You know, I, I think, a lot about that. I will tell you about this minimal invasive part that uh, is uh, included in this artificial intelligence uh, uh, machine learning algorithm. And as you can see, these uh, uh, clinical decision makers, so to say, are all agreed that we need to use it. We need to use it in high-risk patients, in high-risk surgeries, uh, to optimize our patients, to know what is our hemodynamic uh, parameters, and to perform goal-directed therapy in ORs. And also intensive care unit, we need to use it to optimize our high-risk patients, our septic patients, our hypotensive patients, 
to know what is the fluid responsiveness and to know how to optimize them quickly. Let me go way back in the past. You know this picture. This is a first iter anesthesia. So in this situation, we have Mr. Morton. He's performing anesthesia. He's assistant, palpabing pulse. And we have several intellectuals in this time, which are the monitors. So we have several monitors, at least 10 monitors. Today, we have one anesthesiologist. He's not in this picture, but we have also several monitors. But we are, that is technologies. A lot of technologies, we need to know about these technologies. We need to educate, we need to have skills, we need to put all that data in our brain, so to say, and be quickly in our decisions when the, when the situation comes to be that. Tomorrow, they say robotic anesthesia. I think that we will be the monitors, and the robot will be anesthesiologist. I don't know. Maybe uh, that will be in a short future, in long future, I don't know. But somewhere in between these two pictures, we have to use these machine learning algorithms in order to be quickly in our decision and in order to enhance our clinical decision as much as we can. So can intraoperative hypotension be prevented? I think that we have maybe possibility to at least shorten this period. Hypotension prediction in this is one machine learning algorithm uh, that uh, seems to prevent, uh, to predict potential hypotensive events in short period of time. Maybe before, at least three to five minutes before, then really hypotension will occur. How it is possible? It is constructed uh, by analysis of, of several uh, surgical ICU cases, a uh, large number, as you can see, analysis of arterial vein forms in situations where the hypotension will proceed. And all this analysis is put in one algorithm uh, who is uh, using, uh, which mon this monitor that I will present you is using this parameter. It is uh, put uh, in a number from 0 to 100. So like any other uh, monitors that we are using, uh, number in this, way, in this way, this number is presenting possibility that hypotension will occur in short period of time uh, in about up to five minutes. When this alarm goes on, when it is in high number, so over 85 or 90, the secondary analysis screen is open, and in that way, clinician can see what is the problem. Is it preload? Is it myocardial contractility or afterload? Some of these uh, um, uh, parameters that you, that you can see here are familiar to you, definitely. Stroke volume variation uh, derived from an analysis of arterial wear from uh, the measurement of fluid responsiveness. So we. If it's high, we know patient needs to get fluid. He is fluid responsive. Uh, parameter of myocardial contractility, this is DPDT. Maybe you are not familiar with, uh, with it uh, so much, but it is parameter to know what is the contractility of uh, patient's heart. So uh, in that way, we can go with the inotrop if the situation tells that it is low. And also parameter of afterload, uh, another new uh, parameter, dynamic arterial elastance, that tells us uh, what is the changes of arterial pressure upon changes of preload. So we can change this uh, parameter, maybe just giving fluid. But sometimes it will not be enough. The arterial pressure will not go uh, up. So maybe the vasopressors is something that we need to uh, use. All this situation is uh, going after this uh, hypotension prediction is the index parameter rise. So we will have short period of time and uh, little bit pathways, so to say, in order to uh, see what is the problem and try to fix it on the right way, not giving too much fluid, uh, not giving vasopressor when it is not necessary, or inotropes. So we want to know what is the palpable clinical benefit of this technology. There are not many randomized large trials. It is relatively new technology. As you can see, uh, these uh, papers are published uh, 2020, 21. So it's something, uh, it is relatively within five years. As you can see, uh, on left side, this, uh, this investigation of Grundman and Associates, 
they find out that using this technology, we have five times less hypotensive events in our patients than conventional uh, hemodynamic monitoring with flow track. I think it's okay. This other uh, published uh, pilot randomized trial in anesthesiology is not so uh, optimistic. Uh, first, investigators didn't find any difference, as you can see on this graph, but then afterwards, when they extrapolate all just the scenarios where clinicians really go with this protocol, really uh, intervened upon this uh, high hypotension prediction index number, then really uh, hypotension was decreased. Where was the problem? The clinician said new technology, they didn't educate it very well on that, they didn't know the protocol, some of them were not interested also to use this they were thinking that it was quite complicated to uh, go with, the, with this protocol. So in my institution, we, wa we wanted to know what about thoracic surgery patients. In this time, it was uh, uh, 222, uh, none of uh, thoracic uh, anesthesia uh, patients were included in this kind of investigation. So we performed our HPI anesthesia protocol. Uh, it is on Croatian, but I will tell you a little bit, you will see. Uh, when this HPI alarm goes on, so we expect to have hypotension. First, we will see what is the preload of our patient. If it's uh, high, uh, stroke volume variation is high, so we need to give a fluid. But sometimes uh, it is not enough. We also need to uh, give a vasopressor if uh, systemic vascular resistance or dynamic arterial elastance is low. Or we need to give also together with the fluid inotropes if we have a low contractility uh, of our patients. On the other hand, on the other part of this uh, algorithm, if fluid responsiveness is okay, patient have enough fluid, then will not give excess of fluid. We know together today that a restrictive policy with fluid is better than uh, overload of patient with the fluid. So we will only give vasopressor or inotrop if it's necessary according to this uh, hemodynamic parameter. So we had two groups of patients, this HPI group and this standard flow track group of patients. And among these uh, several endpoints, uh, primary outcome was number, severity, and duration of hypotensive events. As you can see on the red uh, pointed here, uh, number of hypotensive patients were much less presented in this acumen group. Uh, this is HPI group compared to standard Flotra group. Hypotensive events was much less occurred. Also, time spent under uh, hypotension during uh, complete time under anesthesia and in ICU was much less presented. So that give us a head to conclude that this machine learning algorithm can lead to significant decrease in number and duration of hypotensive events in this thoracic surgery, major thoracic surgery patients. You know these are anesthesia with many hemodynamic disturbances and also in ICU. We published that is this valuable uh, journal. So uh, we now are conducting several other investigations using TIC technology. One of these is uh, uh, how to uh, manage major maxillofacial neurosurgical reconstructive surgeries. Uh, in our hospital, we are performing this operation. These are long-term uh, duration operations, with very mutilated for the patient. And after the tumor is removed, uh, you need to reconstruct this defect with free flaps, surgical free flaps from other parts of the body. Some of these operations are going over eight hours, 10 hours, so we need to manage hemodynamically patients quite well. Uh, sometimes it's quite excess of fluid uh, necessary, and that is something that is not good for uh, vitality of surgical flap. So together with this goal-directed uh, therapeutic intervention by this predetermined protocol, as I showed you in the previous slide, we used also a monitoring of uh, tissue oxygenation in order to see what is the tissue perfusion of surgical flap during first 24 hours after surgery just in order to optimize our patients together with these hemodynamic parameters that this technology used. This tissue oxygenation is very important to think about it. Maybe we don't think about it enough. 
uh, because a regional desaturation is something that may even precede changes in systemic variables like blood pressure. We always measure blood pressure and definitely it indicates tissue hypoxia and we don't want to have it first, first time as you can know this technology was used in the brain. Brain uh, desaturation, we know that in anesthesia several trials are uh, together in uh, uh, conclusion that cognitive dysfunction, delirium, even uh, higher mortality is associated with brain deoxygenation. So any tissue oxygenation uh, will be good to monitor and intervene to optimize it. To conclude at the end, Cullen published data in uh, literature and our experience with this technology seems that it can reduce both number and duration of intraoperative hypotensive events. Uh, we are protocolizing this goal-directed fluid therapy and we are finding it to improve po post-operative outcomes of our patients. And we also need to think about this organ perfusion. It relies on adequate oxygen delivery, we know that, but blood pressure alone can not be enough just to ensure optimal organ perfusion. I think that any advanced technology monitoring equipment may enhance clinical decision making. Uh, so we need to monitor our patients just to know what we are doing. But uh, at the end, I have to say that any technology advance is as good as doctor using it. If you know what you are using, if you correctly using this data, if you are educated in this process of using this machine learning technology, I think that we can uh, do it for the better of our patients. This is my hometown Zagreb. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So I think that now we can start uh, some discussion about these first two lectures. Do there are any questions? Please. industry and uh, the, uh, the things, what we have in that uh, area, and particularly in anesthesia and uh, intensive care, would it be changed after that regulation? Or that regulation is, is recently published, is compatible with what we have already? Uh, it's compatible because, I mean, uh, up to now we, we, we were very uh, I think in, 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 in healthcare systems, uh, we were quite uh, cautious in application of artificial intelligence. Um, I, th I think that we are compliant with that regulations. Uh, um, also because in, in healthcare systems, the concept of privacy is already, uh, you can, I mean, th that act is re relating in general to artificial intelligence that touch so many aspects of our daily life. I mean, also the identification of, uh, and so, of us when we are working in the streets and so on. So there are many, many aspects. But under the, the, for, for the aspects that touch our profession, I think that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fine up to now. And um, so, and, but I, I, what is important of that act is that it, it gives us some uh, shield I mean, for, for, for the future development, because really it, it development is so fast. And um, yeah, I, and I think we, we need, um, because what I'm afraid of is that we can face some aggressive, let's say aggressive uh, uh, industry that can bring us some uh, uh, not very well, um, uh, how to say, uh, not well uh, uh, and feasible, I mean, uh, aspects of, of technology. Uh, for instance, when we collect data and analyze data, we, we mix, for instance, I mean, you have really uh, brought a, a nice experience. 
but as you said, I mean, you are just looking at one aspect. I mean, the pressure, what, what, what of all the other parameters that can, can um, we know as physicians that can change the life of, of, of a patient and how this data will be mixed by who and, and how it will be uh, analyzed by the machine. Uh, we need uh, uh, to trust and, 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 and so the act is important for the developer that needs to, to apply to some, uh, to some in, in work in some frame. This is, but this is the future, I mean, in the, and I, I have a question for, 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 for you because one of your, one of your slides, I mean, it was, uh, um, you mentioned that, I mean, we, up to now we have few data about the reliability of the, this kind of systems. And probably one, may, one of the aspects that we have to deal with is the, the trust. Mm -hmm. And um, because we have to change our mindset and start to react to uh, a prediction model instead of an alarm, something that has already happened. I mean, we know that uh, there is a bradycardia, okay, I react. But if something, tell me, I mean, in, in, in a couple of minutes you, you will have bradycardia, what do you do? Do you trust what you are? Uh, so, in, in your experience with your colleagues, you, you had some feeling like that? Yeah, it definitely. Great question. Um, uh, I think uh, the, this technology that is really growing, at least in uh, hemodynamic monitoring uh, last year on uh, Glasgow on uh, European Society meeting, uh, I was in uh, one session uh, where uh, some of these uh, decision makers and uh, investigators on uh, this artificial intelligence in USA are really growing with the researches and uh, performing new uh, technology on basis of this. And um, I think maybe we will have to change our, so to say, learning curves. It will be maybe different because uh, this technology that we are using, it was easier to, to uh, uh, manage, uh, intervene upon this prediction to younger ones, to residents, to younger doctors, younger anesthesiologists who are, so to say, maybe more on this uh, technology and um, uh, easy to, to uh, trust, trust without thinking. Uh, those who are with more experience in anesthesia and ICU are maybe a little bit, you know, uh, cautiously optimized, as you can say, uh, and you said on one of your slides. So uh, we definitely need to change a little bit our mindset also to say, um, really uh, trust this technology. I don't think that it's easy, at least not for one who is experienced and who are uh, using uh, and uh, working in anesthesia practice many technologies we are using many machines and we always uh, you know thinking is it okay is it everything with, with it so um, is it calibrated enough it's whatever so maybe it will be easy for younger ones to accept this technology without thinking is it okay or not and that is my experience on my clinical department. The younger ones accepted this technology very quickly. That, that comes to me that could be a risk because maybe we can think to some uh, aspects that is not considered by the, the machine, but a younger maybe is less prone to... to, to this is also a secret problem, so to say, because they are just looking in machines and not looking on the other things. And I always told to them, okay, you have machine, but you can also your surgeon, your operating uh, field, everything around you, not just monitoring. So this monitoring, you have other machines also. So this come back to what? Uh, I mean, I said about the black box. I mean, we, we need to know how these machines work. I mean, we need to know if they look only to the under the, 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 the arterial pressure curve and and that not consider, for instance, the, 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 the oxygen content and so on, because then we know that there is some, there could be some pitfalls in, 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 in the data that are shown. When all these data will be put together, we need to know how they will be, uh, because at the moment we are probably 
we know all the other aspects that could be involved and, and the younger one may be a little bit less than us. In the future, we will blind too because... <laughs> The thing is, I was always thinking, uh, what will be the learning curve of our uh, specialty of anesthesiology training when all this artificial intelligence will come into practice and they will come because that is the situation, technology are growing uh, in every field, also in medicine. So, uh, what will be the education of our young residents the same? For sure it yeah. will change. I don't know in which, in which way, but it should change. Definitely change, yes. Please. My question to President, uh, actually, uh, the question is uh, regarding to the system you used in your study, I mean the hypotensive protection index. You used the data, the, the single data sequentially, and uh, in a serial in way, but combined, and then produce the knowledge. Would it be much more safer to use that single data with using, for instance, fuzzy logic systems uh, in, in a real meaning of combined uh, data knowledge? Would it be better? Because there are lots of uh, monitor system use that system. Uh, you use the CVV. For in, you showed the slides, and DPDT and uh, LSTANS. These are single parameters, and you use them in a sequential way. You check one, and then other step. That is the way most we use. That is the algorithm of uh, reach this solution. But there are some other systems. Use these three parameters in the instantly, but in different range, and produce another parameters as a fuzzy logic. Would you, would you think in that way, or what do you think that, about that? This, this monitoring, when this uh, HBI uh, alarms this probability of hypotension, uh, gives you uh, all these three parameters instantly. So you immediately can check each of them together in one screen, and then you think about it what to correct so to say first or what is the problem so uh, uh, it is not possible to use this technology on any other way i don't know correct uh, answer to your question really maybe it will be better on other way but this is the way that it's possible to use it so you can uh, measure instantly all of these parameters and intervene upon the changes or uh, whatever you need to correct. If I uh, tell you what you want to know. Okay, if there are no other questions, sh shall we move on? Yes, yes. Uh, I will present our next speaker. This is Professor Tugan Utku. He is professor of Yedi Tepe University, Faculty of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, Reanimation and Intensive Care Medicine, and also he is the president of Turkish Society of Intensive Care. He will give a lecture under the name How did the perception of death change with the construction of intensive care units? Dear presidents, uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to organizing and scientific committee inviting me. Uh, it's a lovely place, and again, one more time, and in presence of uh, dear Vesna, of course. And I bring and convey uh, the sincere love and uh, respect to the community of Turkish uh, intensive care uh, as a president of the society. And I wouldn't talk about technology, unfortunately, but I talk about the consequences of the technology. So, and I sometimes take you uh, the, on the other side of the border. The, the, that border is being constructed between the medicine and philosophy. So, unfortunately, we, oops. 
Manually, okay. Thank you. That is the life circle. Everybody knows that. But sometimes it seems like that we, we do, don't know that uh, ordinary uh, circle. And uh, Stefan Cave said that, if you look at the uh, titles, uh, sometimes uh, we missed we are mortal. And particularly the recently, the patient relations behave in that way. Even in the patients in more than 90 years old, they thought that they are immortal. But unfortunately, we, have, we are mortal. Uh, that's our destiny. And I give a good message to you. About 93.5 of people are dead. And we will death as well. So if you, if you simple count, uh, it's already uh, lived in the world. It's more than 100 billion people. That is in rough estimation. There are only 7 billion people is still alive. But life or living in a good way is another problem. Sometimes that life would be happen in the ICUs. And ICU, I mean the establishment of ICU as a concept and as a reality is change all over the meaning of death. Uh, the Bjorn Ibsen is the guy everybody knows and I'm proud to introduce him because he's an anesthesiologist as what we have, what we are. And since 1952, the, after the uh, big pandemias in, uh, lived in uh, Europe, that is the polio pandemia, and that is the first attempt to organize an ICU. Even they didn't know about the term of ICU, uh, the, the medicine of ICU, and else. That is the first mechanical ventilator, angstrom mechanical ventilator used in positive uh, pressure ventilation used in that uh, era. And after that, after the establishment of ICU, and uh, very fastly giving some health services in ICUs in Europe and all over the world. There's, there uh, create another debate. There are separate uh, areas in the ICUs. Some of them, what we understand from ICU, some of them is very dangerous area. Let's say is a dark side of the moon. And that is not easy to, to be dead. So even in ICU. There are a couple of ways to be dead, even in under health services. What about the perception of that? How it be, uh, evolved? If you look at the philosophers, they thought that uh, the hygienic death means a very natural one. The modern death has been transformed in different typology. And that this death is the other in the body of older people. And sounds a kind of pornography. We don't like to sexuality in the, uh, in the population, in the community. And we don't like to uh, talk about death, even we are intensivists. And we ignored death due to rationalization, medicalism, individualization, and secularization. These are the modern era problems. And health is expropriated, taken from the individuals by the medical professionals, as even Illich said. And the Philip Arias, some of them knows about him. Uh, that is very valuable uh, book uh, concerned to death and actually the behavior uh, of the, or the attitudes of the peoples from the death. You see that's kind of chronological evaluation of that perception. In that time, we mostly behave in a spectacular death. So that means, yes, we are very upset now because of that, but mostly we play to the other persons. And spectacular death is now transform a dignified death. And in intensive care and in most of the health services, uh, all the professions tries to be take care about dignity of patients. 
during the uh, end of life uh, period. Michel Foucault in the Birth of Clinics uh, book, he said that after the uh, establishment of hospitals in 17th century in Europe, mostly in Europe, uh, that's another power is being created and it's, he calls it biopower. And biopower has been transformed the power the governments, the states, is already have. That was a, in the classical reigns, that was lethal to vital power, now it's transformed to reviving or living to die. And Turkish people know that picture, that, is, that picture's from the south of Turkey, it's, it's before, uh, I mean, it's, it's about 7,000 or 7,500 uh, years ago, uh, before Jesus. Uh, it's a Çatalhöyük, it's a very ancient area, the ancient people lives there. You see, that is the ordinary place the people live, just Below where they live, they uh, put their beloved uh, in the base. So they are very happy to we live with them and feel with them during the daily life. But now we change our policy. We don't like to see our death is around us. So we uh, driven out. Uh, of our deaths from the cities where we live in. And if you ask the people uh, where, do, where do you like to, to be died, most of the answer is my home in a peaceful way. It's more than 70%, even in the doctors. But if you look at the reality, unfortunately, 80% of deaths has been happening in hospitals, and at least 20 or 25% of them in intensive care. Is it humanity, humanity or a debatable area? And if you ask the people, they don't like to talk about beloved death and CPR orders. And, but they really do like talk about their uh, emotional needs, physical needs. So it's interesting. And that is really good. Tolstoy said that there is a kind of conspiracy of silence culturally. We do not like to talk about that. I think we need to talk about that because only by talking about our mortality can we understand the lives we lead any and why we lead them the way we lead them. So, oops. That is the talk about, uh, I told about the uh, ratio where the people die. And it is a rough calculation because the intensive care beds is getting increased and increased by the time and after the COVID-19 era, uh, probably that ratio is higher than 25%. What are the goals of ICUs then? The ICUs aim to st stabilize and monitor the patients, preventing further deterioration, optimizing organ dysfunction, facilitating recovery and rehabilitation, that is growing area, and providing palliative and end of life care. Unfortunately, at least in our country, I, mean, I believe that most of the countries have the same problem. We uh, hosting the end of stage uh, patients in our ICUs. And of course, because of that, supporting patients and families. So we need to know exactly when to start and when to stop. It's very easy to start for us even in seconds, between seconds, we can start our uh, support in intensive care, in very sophisticated one as well. But I guess we are not so good in stopping the giving uh, therapy or giving support to our patients. 
there are a couple of reasons for that. It's not just our uh, uh, fault. And Hippocrates said the same thing even in the centuries ago. That is the capability of the physician to refuse to treat patient if it's not needed. And Michael Carradine, in the history of that book, said that the prolonging life, we understand that we do not eliminate our death. We only postpone in an inevitable. Do we? And that is quite interesting. Uh, uh, writings, and if you look at the conclusion side of that uh, article, the intensive as a nosocomial thanatologist, thanatologist means the, the scientist in uh, death, nosocomial thanatology will inevitably become a bigger and more complex component of the intensive care medicine in the future. I guess the future is already come. So then, what has changed after establishment of ICUs? ICUs' transformative impact on health care system, centralized care for critically ill patients, advancements in medical technology, we use very high tech, and specialized training for healthcare providers, improved outcomes for critical ill patients, yes, we do, focus on multidisciplinary care, an increased awareness of end-of-life care. That is the very, very uh, new uh, fashion uh, topics for intensive care. And of course, the research and inno innovation. After the establishment of ICUs, the course of medicine has changed, roughly. And the limits of medicine is directly or indirectly ch totally changed. And the faith of organ failures, no longer destiny. We can help the organ failure in different ways, using the devices, using the techniques. So, and after all that, the perception and definition of that, or how it looks and the different aspects, that is changed. And of course, inevitably, uh, there is another problem phenomenon of futility. Do we work as in futile in uh, style? Yes, I said, the definition of death has changed. That is the traditional way to uh, describe the death. But now, everybody accepts that definition, and I mean the traditional death definition is consists of brain death as well, so it's changed. And What's the position uh, of ICU regarding the inevitable death? These are a new area for us, and we are not educated in that way. We try to be, uh, improve ourselves with our self-education. Respect for patient wishes, focus on comfort and quality of life, ethical considerations, shared decision-making with the family, and of course the support of care, and the support of care and the limit of that uh, support. The prolonging the life and prolonging death is totally different concepts. Sometimes we confuse to use that terms between each other. Sometimes we s explain what we do to the patient relations. It seems like prolonging life, no is actually we prolonging death. And of course a new dilemma, futility. I'm not sure that futility is a correct word, but I prefer to use futility because the futility resembles the correct way what I thought about that, but the modern terminology for that is an appropriate therapy. You remember that slides, and I'll show you the dark side of the moon. That is the critical area. Sometimes we easily move on the other side of the borders. Everybody knows the fertility anyway. But sometimes that gray zone is getting very violent. That is the problem. And that is the motto of the ICUs, dying prohibited. 
so nobody can die. If, can, if they die, we are fail. We are not so good doctors. That is the main problem. And the, I mean, and I believe in that, the governments think the same thing. And that is our uh, basic codes to work as a physician, utility codes. But just one letter put on that, if you use that codes in incorrectly, you may a futility. There is is a very clear regulations to against that. But if you look at the practical side, in the side of the ICUs, at least one in third uh, patients is being faced in that way because of us. And we well know. Uh, the futile care, futile critical care, associated directly with delay in care in the other patients. And it's very expensive. I'll show you some figures. It's very expensive. It's a one statement, and all over the world, it's ex uh, paid for the health services, let's say hundreds, 10% of them using for the last month of dying patients. So if you use that money in correct way, we may solve many problems in the world. So the, by the prolonging life, we understand that we are not eliminating our debts, as I said, just postponing in a, inevitable. And that's my determinations. You are free to uh, think and agree or disagree. That is based on subjective experiences, myself, and that are attempted to be objectified. Unlimited requests from health providers, inappropriate treatment requests, unlimited skepticism, mistrust, tendency to create criminals, search for criminals, economic conflicts, improbability of death, selflessness, I take but I don't give any, self-centeredness, everything for me, patient and patient relative sites. If we look at that slides, submit to unlimited demands, don't surrender to futility, claims to pave the way for skepticism and distrust, Afford to prove that you are not guilty, assigning blame. Economic conflicts caught in the middle, center of the middle of the problem. Death barrier, we are the death barriers, we are not. Selflessness, always giving, trying to find the giver. Giving of himself, everything is for them. That's from our side. And there is a big conflict in the results is divided identities. What she or he knows is right versus what she or he has to. And that's my last verse. It's not conclusion, of course, it's just in, in state of conclusion. Humans is immortal. Most of the people die in hospitals. That is, that is not good, but that is reality. More and more that in hospital and taking place in ICUs. I guess it's almost it's transforming uh, the ICUs in a death centers or death rooms anyway. And medical futility is often thought of as a power struggle for decisional concurrency among the patients, families, and clinicians. And the milieu of unrealistic expectations from the public upon the medical community coupled with the ambiguous line of where and when to stop treatments creates situation described as medically futile. ICUs should be used rationally and humanistically. Too bad to come, too good to come. That are the are, uh, uh, red lines, have to be. And do justice for everyone, to patients, to relations, to others, and of course, to yourself. 
And I'll finish with the verse with uh, Bjorn Ibsen. In the 1975, he said that at the beginning of the intensive therapy, it was a problem to keep the patients alive. Today, it has become a problem to let him die. Thank you for your patience. And I just uh, show you uh, the, my last slides, the end of May in Istanbul. Uh, we organized and very sophisticated uh, meetings with ECICM. And the faculties is being cons consist of uh, ECICM sites and Turkish society sites. If you come to Istanbul, you will welcome. Thank you very much. Question? Mm, we think that we have question at the end, so we have the second lecture now, and uh, thank you very much. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor uh, Kvolik from uh, the University of Osijek in uh, Croatia, uh, that will uh, present the lecture on the discharge of the patients with polytrauma from the ICU. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, first, uh, I have to uh, congratulate to uh, and the uh, uh, organizers on the excellent organization and uh, say thank you for inviting me here. It is my second time. Uh, it is my second time. Criteria outpost. Criteria outpost. Uh, it is my second time uh, of being here, and uh, uh, I uh, should remind uh, last last time when I was here, many of you will recognize themselves. Uh, I was invited then by Professor Jordan Noikov, and uh, there was also Janike Mel Melin Olsen. There was Slobodan Gl Gligorievich here, and uh, many of you who will see themselves here. Uh, it was uh, excellent there and uh, it is excellent again now here. Uh, a, a topic that I will talk about is quite different uh, than uh, those philosophical topics that you, you were talk, talking about. I will give some practical issues regarding discharge of uh, polytrauma patients uh, from ICU and I will also um, uh, say some, something about artificial intelligence and their uh, prediction models that can be used. Uh, uh, we are uh, all witnesses uh, that uh, uh, there are global changes in uh, trauma mortality, especially in polytrauma, and as you can see here, uh, mortality in trauma has decreased by 1.8% uh, 1, 1. Uh, by year, and uh, it is uh, now about uh, uh, 10 to 12%. Uh, uh, but uh, what changed in uh, global mortality in trauma is that the impact of brain injury uh, uh, in mortality uh, of uh, trauma patient has increased, and I will talk about uh, uh, more about uh, uh, brain injured patients within trauma uh, uh, population. Uh, uh, we all know which are criteria for ICU admission. We admit our trauma patient into ICU, uh, uh, hoping that we will increase their survival, uh, that we will uh, make them better, that we will uh, uh, decrease their disabilities, uh, but uh, uh, as uh, it st uh, stands now, many of these patients uh, uh, do not recover sufficiently, and uh, you can see uh, that uh, in, in patients, uh, with patients with severe trauma brain injury, uh, more than half of them never return to uh, their normal activities, to school or uh, to their work, and uh, uh, there are also other uh, comorbidities that uh, influence outcome of uh, trauma patients. Uh, so. Uh, when we are thinking about discharge of trauma patients, we first must remind general principles of discharge patients from ICU. That is that our patient must be hemodynamically stable for at least 24 hours. It means that uh, we will not uh, discontinue uh, norepinephrine infusion uh, and uh, 
say that patient is now stable, uh, we should wait for at least 24 hours. Uh, we will also, also uh, be able to discharge our patient uh, who is uh, breathing spontaneously uh, at least for 24 hours after severe trauma. Also, uh, what is very important is that surgical control of bleeding was instituted instituted and uh, what is important that thromboprophylaxis is also instituted in uh, trauma patients. Uh, uh, it is uh, very important to re recognize new disabilities uh, that will, uh, will result uh, from uh, a disease uh, that is reason for ICU admission. Uh, it, uh, it is also important uh, for trauma patients. And uh, what we should uh, think about is uh, laboratory uh, derangements. That means uh, uh, levels of uh, potassium, calcium, creatinine, urea. And uh, uh, af after uh, we uh, checked all these criteria, uh, we should give uh, proper instructions about what should be done further with uh, our patients. Uh, uh, within that standard discharge criteria, uh, there were some of them uh, which were more important. Uh, by using artificial intelligence, uh, uh, there, uh, there was more than 100 criteria uh, that were listed and that were uh, investigated uh, uh, in great series of patients uh, in uh, Bristol and in uh, one American uh, hospital with a big uh, uh, electronic database and uh, they uh, investigated all those factors that were mentioned, that is respiratory rate, that is uh, a cardiovascular status, pain, central nervous system, temperature, uh, blood hemoglobin, and uh, they uh, uh, have found by using artificial intelligence that their importance is not the same. The most important factor predicting uh, uh, bad outcome and predicting uh, uh, ICU uh, prolonged stay was uh, minimal Glasgow Coma score. After that, it was airway uh, possibility of air, airway control. Uh, and uh, other factors uh, which are listed here by, the, uh, by their importance. You can see that hemoglobin levels, this, uh, that maximal respiration, uh, heart rate are uh, very important, uh, but uh, minimal blood pressure uh, is uh, uh, on the uh, uh, bottom of that uh, list. Uh, bleeding control is very important for discharge of uh, polytrauma patients and the uh, um, surgical uh, bleeding control now has shifted to uh, damage control surgery. That means that all other surgical procedures which are not uh, immediately necessary uh, should be postponed until the patient is hemodynamically stable. That means fractures of long bones, fractures of uh, uh, spine, uh, in hemodynamically unstable patient uh, should not be uh, operated until uh, uh, that stability is achieved. Uh, 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 further, uh, what is to be considered uh, uh, with bleeding control is uh, coagulation management. Uh, treatment is uh, uh, now more than ever individualized and the target values uh, must be also individual, individualized by a patient because many of them uh, have uh, their chronic diseases, uh, many of them are using uh, their anticoagulation therapies at home and uh, those prior anticoagulation therapies should be considered uh, when uh, giving uh, blood products to patients when ordering coagulation tests and uh, when uh, considering uh, when our patient will be ready to discharge. Uh, uh, who is ready for discharge? Uh, patients uh, usually uh, requiring any organ support are not ready for discharge from the ICU. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, one study uh, where uh, a discharge from ICU was investigated in terms of uh, how can we discharge our patients to ward. Uh, we usually want to discharge them now. Now they are stable and we want them to go to surgical ward, but uh, surgeons uh, used to say uh, we don't have a place now. Uh, can he wait one day more or two days more? And this de delayed, delayed discharge uh, 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 that were unpredicted uh, were proven to be protective against readmission. Uh, that means uh, that not, not the same uh, moment when we consider patient ready to discharge, uh, it, uh, patient must be discharged to ward, but uh, in this study uh, they have proven that uh, delayed transfer re reduced readmissions by 78%. And we all know that we don't like readmissions because that patient has higher mortal mortality, low, uh, uh, they have worse outcomes, and uh, uh, it, it is a criterion of our ICU uh, quality. Uh, important issues in polytrauma patient before ICU discharge uh, are also uh, those uh, which are related to control of edema. Uh, this is especially important in patients with blunt trauma. There are bleeding control uh, in terms of uh, uh, red blood cells, platelets, and coagulation uh, can be instituted uh, as easy as, uh, uh, as in, uh, for example, uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, then uh, we must consider a systemic anticoagulation, which is sometimes uh, very uh, hard to start in patients uh, who have uh, blunt trauma of extremities and uh, intracranial bleeding. And also um, uh, what we should consider is uh, whether in this patient uh, emergency surgical intervention or reintervention is reliable within 24 hours. Uh, and um, uh, some uh, missed injuries that were not considered by surgeons or by emergency uh, in the emergency surgical department also uh, must be searched and must be recognized before uh, we uh, discharge our patient to the world. Uh, uh, in a modern era, as I said in a previous slide, traumatic brain injury was the most prevalent cause of death in polytrauma patient. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, 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 when uh, we are deciding to discharge our patient, we must uh, think uh, that uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, sever severity is a predominant uh, reason for trauma mortality and uh, that it must be uh, stable. It must be under control um, as well as it can be. Uh, uh, that missed injury that I mentioned before uh, are found at all levels of uh, surgical treatment. Uh, uh, when analyzing uh, patient records, uh, we can see that uh, some injuries were missed by emergency department doctors, by uh, trauma surgeons, by, by neurosurgeons, and uh, also uh, they were missed in ICUs. Uh, uh, those, uh, those are uh, already uh, minor fractures that must, must not be operated uh, immediately, but, uh, and there are also some nerve injuries that are in relations uh, to uh, uh, long bone fractures, uh, but those are usually uh, a point for SUS, uh, so we must consider those uh, injuries also, and we must record them. Uh, which factor uh, will influence uh, discharge of our patient to specific surgical wards? It is important to consider a patient's physical status at the moment of discharge because uh, we must choose proper facility to uh, discharge a patient. Some of them, uh, uh, and uh, very rare, patient will be uh, ready to go home, but many of them uh, will go to surgical wards, uh, neurosurgery, and uh, in uh, specific conditions and specific patients, we must be uh, 
uh, aware that our patient uh, will uh, have better outcomes uh, if we discharge them uh, to rehabilitation centers when uh, some uh, specific measures uh, will be undertaken early. And it, uh, this is especially uh, important for patients with head injuries, pelvis injuries, spine and uh, legs. Uh, injured uh, because their outcomes were prov proven to be better when discharged to rehabilitation centers uh, than uh, uh, if discharged to other departments. Uh, and uh, what about readmissions? Uh, readmissions we don't like, but the most common uh, reasons for readmissions of polytrauma patient is worsening of their uh, chronic diseases. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we must assess uh, also Charleston comorbidity index, uh, which rates liver injury uh, as uh, with highest points and also uh, cancer. Uh, Charleston comorbidity index was uh, the uh, uh, most important uh, within readmissions in polytrauma patients. And I think uh, I'm at la uh, my last slide. Uh, uh, my take home messages uh, is that discharge uh, of polytrauma patient must follow up uh, all guidelines for all ICU patients. Uh, and that we must adhere to general discharge, discharge criteria. Uh, then uh, we must, uh, during ICU treatment, we must uh, do proper detection of surgical and medical comorbidities, uh, that treatment of all comorbidities and all injuries must be instituted, and uh, we must schedule uh, discharge to the facilities where uh, their treatment uh, will be continued. And uh, uh, as being a member of uh, uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medici Medicine and a member of uh, uh, examination committee for European Diploma in Intensive Care, uh, I, uh, I'm inviting all of you to join to European Society of Intensive Care Medicine uh, because of many uh, learning opportunities which are uh, for free available to members uh, and uh, also uh, to invite uh, to uh, invite you to join uh, us at LIVS Congress with, uh, which this year will be held in the Barcelona. Some of uh, uh, education initiatives and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we can have uh, some uh, discussion about the last two uh, lectures. Please. Uh. Thank you. Uh, for those who don't know me, Biljana Kuzmanovska from Macedonia, welcome. Very nice session. Uh, I would like to address uh, uh, every lecture. It was great. <laughs> Thank you very much for contributing to our Congress. But I would especially like to address uh, the lecture of Professor Tugan Utku, uh, very useful, and that is something that we uh, face day to day. Uh, so uh, as we mature, I mean the anesthesiologist since 1996, uh, so uh, here is the professor who accepted me at my work, <laughs> Professor Shalyakova. So uh, as we mature as uh, uh, doctors, we see a lot of deaths. And Doctor knows when it's the end. Doctor always knows when it's the end. Uh, it was your point that uh, the pressure we uh, see from the family, society, uh, our need uh, to uh, present ourselves as uh, great, uh, <laughs> great doctors, um, it is uh, something that it should be more discussed, I think. Uh, we need lectures like this. We need lectures uh, with pure medical data. We need lectures with pure medical um, knowledge. But we need lectures like this, this much more. Because sometimes we go, we go above and beyond what is rational to do for the patient. 
We generate costs, we generate uh, workforce, uh, we, um, uh, too many work hours, uh, too many costs, and we know that it's not going anywhere. So maybe uh, as society of uh, intensive care units, uh, maybe this is a good topic to start, a starting point to uh, build up upon this uh, knowledge and this uh, topics uh, because all of us are mature doctors, we have seen a lot of things in our uh, practice and um, we know that sometimes we do things uh, beyond, rational, beyond rationality, what you said, futility. And it's for my, <laughs> this is a little philosophical, as for my own personal uh, view on that, <laughs> I, after uh, so many years in medicine, I adopted stoic views <laughs> from Marcus Aurelius. He said, consider yourself as a dead. You have lived your life. Now take what's left and live it properly. So I think that's what all we do here. We live the rest of our lives properly by sharing knowledge, uh, contributing to our society, contributing to science, uh, caring for the patients in the right way, yes, and uh, this is my personal regard to the immortality. And uh, once again from Marcus Aurelius, that smile said us all, all a man can do is smile back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, uh, sorry. Thank you for that uh, valuable contribution. Uh, I just want to express uh, an, an effort of Turkish society. Uh, we organized a meeting with sociology uh, professions, I mean academics, uh, with intensivists. We, uh, all day program, we discussed the death and the different aspects of the death. So, and then after that meeting, we published a book, of course in Turkish, uh, the approach of the uh, death is in professions, in the different uh, professions, and I think it's a valuable and it's a important point, you showed that. Uh, we need to discuss much more than we do uh, regarding to death and the, uh, all of the aspects of the death. And there are a couple of courses uh, being uh, organized within different uh, disciplines like in philosophy groups. Uh, one or two days course is consists of all the uh, parts of uh, that approach. And I personally believe that as an educated and philosophical way. So I really uh, prioritize that kind of uh, educations even in a very strict intensivist group as well. Thank you. I will just uh, continue one observation. Uh, anesthesiologists are the people who are in the intensive care uh, have the most uh, problem to tell the family to accept the inevitable coming death of their loved ones. And, um, Probably it's cultural, probably Turkey, Macedonia are, are much more, uh, you know, in a way that the families uh, are struggling to keep the, their, their loved ones and similar. Uh, I had the chance to work in Denmark with a few colleagues uh, from here and Scandinavia has uh, maybe much more uh, approach of acceptance that one, uh, either cultural or, or, or the location. And uh, there, you know, when they accept, we took the patient to uh, uh, one part of the intensive care, you know, the loved ones uh, are standing be beside the, their loved ones, and you know, the, the end of life comes that. But, uh, uh, but it's the problem, you know, uh, anesthesiology has to be psychological to show them and to, to, to tell them that uh, it's uh, coming that uh, which we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, stop. Anyone else? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think that what has been said is very, very important. And uh, to, I think that for us it's, it's a duty to bring these aspects forward and to, to, to create discussion, to create a confrontation. Um, because really we need to, to change some uh, aspects and we have also sometimes also to convince our colleagues that are uh, so inside inside our profession and outside I, I think that it's 
quite difficult because now there are some solo sociological aspects that are very complex and very slow to modify. Uh, what I also uh, would like to, 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 to ask, I mean, to, to, to both of you, because I mean, both of you have touched these aspects, is um, uh, how much we can work uh, together with the rising the, the aspects, the problems, uh, also to offer some uh, uh, kind of uh, solution of, uh, like, for instance, creating some step-down uh, uh, words for some kind of patients, or um, creating some form of assistance, like under the big umbrella of palliative care for other situations in which probably the hospital is not the best place, but could be the, 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 the home with, with, with the help of, uh, of people that can come. Because I, I think that in this way, probably we can humanize more the debt and we can bring some different approach to, to other kind of patients and reduce the burden for, for the intensive care that should be focalized on, on very acute situations that can be, uh, in which we can be of help for, for, for them. Do you? Uh, I totally agree with you and just giving uh, some example from my country. Uh, the Turkey is the, I guess, is the first or second row. Uh, the country has, has a huge uh, intensive care capacity. As far as I know, we are the second row uh, after Germany because we have uh, uh, 38,000 uh, level three beds. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's been divided in three different levels, uh, the ICUs. Uh, the three level means the real ICUs. So it's a huge number. And Turkey is, is about uh, 84 million as a, a population. So if you compare uh, the one bed per uh, thousand person, it's very high. But even that uh, huge figure, we have a big ICU capacity problem. Because we don't have as a well-organized step down uh, units or something in in that manner. I mean, uh, the, the, the between the ICUs and the seems like ICUs places. So we have to uh, accept all the patients to ICU. So that's a big problem. Uh, that is, it's not a, just a cultural problem. That is a real health politics problem. That is preferences of the governments. Uh, and. I guess that is the result of the industrialized medicine uh, because the ICUs is gain much more money uh, compared to the step-down units or uh, the others. But we really need some certain things. One is that kind of places to protect the uh, end-of-life care situ situation and the patients because they really need such a care. And the second point, we need uh, clarified uh, ICU indications. I mean, that must be a consensus, at least in a national consensus. Uh, and then after, we can move uh, freely one uh, step forward. That's my belief, and w that's my experience in, in, in my country. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, your national guidelines, maybe, for end-of-life care from your society in Turkey? Actually, we did. And we uh, got some invitations from the health ministry to, to create such an indications, but they mean that's not in that the same way. Uh, they try to uh, get the patients in the systems. That is the tendency of the wish of creating indications. But in, <laughs> in our uh, sites, we need not to uh, accept the patients, the ICUs. This is, this is quite a uh, different approach. Okay, thank you. I think that if there are any other questions, we can close this session.
and I want to thank all the speakers and for the, all of you for the, the kind discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Почитувани колеги, добар ден, добро дојдовте на втората утринска сесија или предпладневна сесија во салата Бидлјана, седми анестезиолошки македонски конгрес со меѓународно учество. Во интерес на времето веќе доцниме, ние само ќе ги представуваме предавачите, а дискусијата ќе оставиме на крај. So dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, welcome to the second uh, morning session in this uh, hall, Biljana. Uh, for the, uh, to keep on the schedule, I will just introduce the speakers today, and uh, for the last, uh, we will leave the discussion. So the first speaker is our old uh, dear friend from Norway. <laughs> uh, we've met a long time ago. She's a friend of Macedonia. She's been in Skopje. She's been in Ohrid. Our dear Melik Olsen. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, and for that. And uh, yeah, here. What I'm going to talk to you about today is about safe medication, and that means safe anesthesia. And you will see what I'm uh, talking. How do I proceed here? Is there a. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Here, no, but it's okay now. I found it. Uh, I'm. Um, these are some of my backgrounds. Uh, the only thing that gives me money is my hospital. So you, it has been shown here in this very good book of Alan Mary that 5% of all patients who are admitted to a hospital experience a medication error, 5%. And an average hospital will have also a, quite a lot of medical errors. And, uh, and uh, that is uh, partly due to, to medication. And one important issue when it comes to medication is that you have the medication that you should have. And one big problem in my country and in your, uh, all countries in Europe and globally is the lack of access to medications. And uh, this is the shortage situation in my hospital. Uh, no, in my country, and you can see how it has increased from 2010 until uh, 2022, where are the last figures. And of course, if you do not have the medicine at hand, which you should give to the patient, then you will have problems. And here are some uh, examples from anesthesiology of medication shortages. Chlorpropacaine, bupivacaine, ketamine, thiopental, heparin, saline. You remember in, in, in the United States there was a hurricane in Bermuda or something, and it, it shut down the whole only uh, plan for saline uh, production in the United States. So suddenly all of the United States do not have access to saline. That creates big problems, of course. So what happens if you don't have your medication at hand which you need to give to your patient? Or you will find a replacement. And, uh, you try something new, something different. And then just to see how it was, we didn't have this uh, paracetamol codeine, which we were used to having. We got this other thing, which was produced a different place and so And every time it looks different, it creates problems for you. And uh, I will use an example of Digitalis when they, when they had to, uh, uh, when that, that production was going to stop and they had to, to change medication to digoxin in my country and in Europe that I'm using. So they spent so much time educated everybody. Here's how you should do it. You have warnings to physicians. There were media warnings to the public that it, there was a foolproof uh, plan on how to change. And you can see from how many changed when that happened, mo the, the total number of doses went down uh, all together, uh, but oh, it's going too fast here. But then there were still a lot of overdoses, there were deaths, and the errors were made by physicians, by nurses, by pharmacies, by patients. Everybody makes errors. And this is the same when we had to change our medication in anesthesiology. So that's a big risk. People are dying when they get the we give the wrong medication. Then there is another problem, and that is when you, what is in the vial? When you get something you don't know what is. Is there counterfeit medicines? And that's a problem even in Europe where it's so well, uh, well uh, uh, regulated. And here you can see some of the numbers that have been, uh, been uh, 
been reported. Uh, so uh, in, in Europe, there were 27.5 million counterfeit medicine that was retained. It's a lot. And of course, if you go to Africa, I don't even talk about it. But even in the United States, 50% of case medicines that were uh, purchased over the internet that produced errors. And there is another example, and that is when you uh, have, uh, have uh, cheating with how you produce medicines. Uh, here was in Hyderabad, they were cheating with bioequivalent studies, so they used all the EKGs in one study, they were the same copy, and uh, 1,250 different European medicines are involved, and many had to be withdrawn, 50 active uh, substances, and that creates a big problem on the whole system. A colleague of mine, that was not in Europe, but he was working in Afghanistan, and they were giving halothane to the to, uh, to uh, the patients to put them asleep. Very strange, the patients didn't fall asleep. What was the problem here? And he just took some of it back home and had it analyzed, and it was a solvent that had been produced. They said it was an anesthetic, but it was a solvent. So instead of putting the patient to sleep for anesthetics, it put it because the brain dissolved in, in that uh, thing. So this is just very, very bad. And for, for that, there have been a falsified medicines director introduced by the EU that all packages should have a, an identification number and that you have to make all the packages so that you cannot open it with, without seeing the unique identifier. So they're trying to do measures, but it's not so easy. And, and in the uh, anesthesiology department, uh, Karen Namji, who's, you may know her, uh, she's a very uh, good in medication errors and things in Boston at Harvard. And uh, she has done a lot of service on, uh, on uh, uh, medication errors and things. And they were in the operating theater observing how people were giving medications. And one out of 20 perioperative medication administration, every second operation resulted in a medical error or an adverse drug event. So again, it's something we see probably much more than we uh, appreciate. Yeah, here you can see some of the medication errors that she could find. It was labeling errors. We know all of these documentation, monitoring, wrong medication, wrong timing, inadvertent bolus, and all of these things. So they are all known to us. So they have given this in the WHO, this recommendation. Before you give any medication, you should have known your medication. Do you have the right patient medicine route, dose, time? And ask the patients. Of course, when they are asleep, you cannot ask them. But uh, we also have this recommendation of double checking. I'm not sure. If any of you, do you use double checking? That you, before you give anything, you ask what's in here? You don't say this is fentanyl, but you say what is this? It's fentanyl, and then you should give it. Uh, we do it to us quite a large extent in my hospital. When they introduced it, I thought this is just stupid because nobody can do that, but we do it, and it's, uh, it's quite useful. Because we are normal people, we have normal cognitive uh, uh, function. We are, whether, if we are able to concentrate all the time on what are we giving, okay, I, now I turn this, uh, I'll open, I put it in the glass, I raise the glass with my right hand, I drink. If you concentrate on all of that, it, it takes a lot of, it's not very effective. And normally we know what to do, so normally we just do this automatically and we drink. It's the same when we administer uh, medication. But that is also a problem for us when we are uh, in, uh, in busy situations. For instance, here, here are some of the incident reports from Karen Nanji. I administer two incremental doses of morphine in place of the intended drug, which was atracurian. No consequences, because I have intended. But contributing factors, distraction, as I had a medical student to teach, failure to label syringe and failure to check. That is why we need those checking things, because on the way from here to here, something might happen. You might talk to me, 
and then I, I'm distracted and I forget what I was doing. The same in the second uh, here. I had a trainee and uh, we were talking what's going on and then the syringe was wrongly labeled. It happens all the time. So we have to put some things in place. And I'll give you one example from my own experience. I was doing in the pre-operative assessment. We have a special clinic for that when we prepare patients for, for surgery. And there was this, she was going for gastric bypasses. She was fat. She was so nervous. She seemed to be a little bit stu sorry, stupid. I mean, everybody, oh, she was just making a lot of noise in the, in the room. She was reading this very cheap, simple literature. Everybody was stressed, and it was a very busy day. And then they said to me, Janneke, can you come and check this patient? She has some kind of, uh, uh, some shivering or something. And uh, everybody thought this was something you know, hysterical. And uh, I, I thought something is strange here. Now let us take her to the post-operative for better monitoring and, and so. And, and she went into the post-operative uh, care unit to be monitored better. And then a colleague of my, mine, he came <laughs> looking around the bed. And then he saw the, this. It turned out that the, uh, the uh, doxycycline, which was given preoperatively, it was put in an epidural bag with, with bupivacaine and things, which, which we are using for postoperative pain treatment, and not in the ringers or in the saline. And uh, that was also, so that was a real toxic reaction to local anesthetics, which everybody had thought was just, uh, just uh, for her. Luckily, we had stopped the infusion before going into the postoperative care unit. And the whole thing was how the things were labeled. And, uh, and uh, after that, we changed the way on where to put the label on what you have on additions and so. And the learning points is, of course, double checking, as I just talked to you about. If somebody else has, where, how am I putting this back? And, uh, and also um, to uh, store where the medicines are stored. Now we don't have the local anesthetics together with the saline. And then also that we should remember that we have some prejudices when we are talking. So that is a fixation error. So there's a lot to do about that. And then there are other horrible things. This is a, a, a case also from Norway. Uh, this young boy, he had a medulla blastoma. He was going to have metotrexate uh, uh, intrathecally and the increased in intravenously. Now you can imagine what happened. It was given the other way around. So he had uh, uh, the the increased in given intrathecally and, um, and uh, both were in syringes, he died. It was horrible. Uh, but at that time, both were in syringes, and uh, now they have changed it. So they had the vincristin in a syringe, metotrexate in the bag, only the intrathecal room in the, the drug in the treatment room and so on. Very simple thing, which was, uh, was, uh, they were unaware of. So when these things happen, you have to be transparent to the patients and the relatives. Tell them what happened. There is a horrible story from, from, uh, uh, from the United States. It's about Justin. He was 11 years old. He was taken into the, to, uh, the operating theater to drain a swollen ankle. It's healthy, but he never survived that operation. And then uh, the parents ask, what's going on? What has happened? No, no, complete silence from the whole room. And then after 10 years where the parents had tried to find out what really happened, they got a letter from the doctor who said, I cannot keep this anymore to myself. The thing is that we mixed up phenylephrine and fentanyl because the syringes were so similar. And so he got too much phenylephrine instead of fentanyl. And then he had a brain ha hemorrhage, and that was the reason why, why he died. And the parents said, I mean, you don't understand how much this means to us to get a, a reply. So this open disclosure, be open, and then show your empathy, and then uh, apology, and take care of them. It's, uh, it's uh, very important. And also, you would know that in the Helsinki Declaration of Patient Safety in Anesthesiology, we have special recommendation on 
uh, on uh, uh, on patient uh, how, uh, on how to deal with medication. Uh, the principal requirements there, it says syringe labeling, which I'll talk about. It's, as you can see here, it's uh, quite a lot of, uh, of drug errors that happen in anesthesia, and some of them are fatal. We also have the recommendation to have pre-filled syringes, which will immediately remove that you draw up the wrong drug, that you label it uh, incorrectly, and uh, also infection is important here. So here they have uh, shown the evidence, you know David Whittaker in the United Kingdom is very keen on this, that, uh, that it's much safer if you are able to color the drugs uh, uh, accordingly. I did tell you about Justin Michalitsi, so I'm not repeating that story, but I'm showing you how it looked in our department, the fentanyl and the phenylephrine. Then another problem is that when we are, oh, this is, Another problem is that when we are in the, in the, the operating theater and we, if we do not flush the drugs which are in the, in the, the line, once they come into the, to the PACU unit, you, might, you risk to flush it with a drug which is still in the, in the line, which might be uh, muscle relaxant, it might be fentanyl, it might be something that you certainly do not want to give to that patient. So that's important that you flush after administration, always do that. And uh, we talked about, uh, we talked about um, uh, labeling, it goes too fast. Uh, here, of course, this is not how you li like your trade to be. This is on the other side, and very fancy thing where they scan the color codes and the, the bars and things. Uh, but at least to have a system where you can scan or, or make sure you give the right drug to the right patient. Another thing which is a big problem in globally and also in our countries uh, could be is that if they scheduled some medications, for instance, ketamine. Is, I use ketamine a lot. Uh, I'm not sure about what you do. It's coming back again also to be more important. But it has been a question of, of scheduling that internationally so that it will be very hard to get for poorer countries, low-income countries, where that is the only anesthetic. And also halothane is a problem now that they want to schedule it and get rid of uh, the production. And that causes, of course, a big problem if you do not have access to any other, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have water and things. And what happened when they shed, made international scheduling on morphine in India? Then you needed six, six applications to get the drug out of the pharmacy in the hospital because of the bureaucracy. Nobody wants to write six application letters. It's too much. So they didn't do it. Okay, the pharmacist, nobody's asking for it anymore. We don't stock uh, morphine anymore. And then the producers, the manufacturers, nobody's asking for morphine anymore, so we stopped manufacturing it. And the medicinal use of morphine dropped, which was low before. It dropped by 97% afterwards, leaving the patients in a lot of pain. And that would be a big problem, so we have to do lobbying campaigns in order for that not to happen with uh, ketamine and also uh, stop production of, of uh, halothane. What happens then is that you will have here is from Iraq during the embargo, they didn't have access to any medications and uh, they were operated uh, in, uh, in, uh, without anesthetics, which uh, still is a problem uh, some places today. So I'm uh, already 23 seconds over time, so I'll just uh, take the final thoughts here. We are human, normal human beings and we need to create systems for safe medication delivery that help us with that. We must have a culture of openness support. Access to medicines is an issue and we have to work on continuous uh, improvement of our processes. And so this was just a small dip into a very large subject, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yannick Emelin Olsen. Very insightful and very, um, very important labeling, uh, double checking, simple things, but that uh, 
very important. Thank you very much on your input. Uh, we'll leave the discussion for later if we have time, uh, since we are running out of uh, time. Uh, next speaker is our distinguished guest from Denmark, uh, uh, Dr. Ola John Nilsson. He has been in Macedonia before. <laughs> I think a lot of you know him. You can still hear me. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Vesna for the invitation. I met uh, Vesna in Montenegro last year, and I heard about this Congress here, and I begged to be invited, and I got invited. And um, then we discussed what should I talk about, because I cannot say the same things that I said in Montenegro. And then she said something like, well, you can talk about something more general. So this is a bit of an experiment for, for me and for you. So do we understand our personal impact on climate change? Yes or no? Probably no. Probably no. <laughs> but first of all, um, I was in Montenegro first time 2013. I apologize for the bad picture. I didn't take it, but it was 2016. Um, I didn't know that I was going to be back one year later in a different capacity. In my free time, I'm a basketball coach, and that's me. And we came to Skopje, and we won the European Championship as a big surprise. You can look at the spectators, they are like grabbing their heads. We went one in the last second. So Macedonia means really a lot to me. It's dear to my heart. Now on to the more serious part. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the author of this book. Um, Bruce Logan from Penn State, and my friends and colleagues Tim Wallington from University of Michigan, and my former student Mass Anderson, with whom I discuss climate change a lot. Well, very briefly, it's going to be quick introduction, units, emissions, can we electrify, what car should we drive, what food should we eat, and some conclusions. First of all, climate change will not go away. Um, the energy use is, of course, central for the CO2 emissions, but other greenhouse gases and land use change is also a factor. So we emit about 30 gigatons of up to 60 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, every year. Temperature will rise. Um, on, the, on that figure over there, you see the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere even though we are doing a lot with green transition, scientists, we measure, and it just goes one way. From the IPCC on this figure, everything goes as predicted. Temperature is rising exactly as predicted. It's kind of good, but it's also bad. I um, have to talk a little bit about energy, because I'll use some examples from Denmark and the US. In the US, they use 101.6 exajoules of energy every year. How much is that? Well, on that table you find 10 to the 18. There's a lot of zeros behind. That we emit the 33 gigatons of CO2. That's 10 to the 9. Or if it's gram, it's 10 to the 15. So there's a lot of zeros behind. And I'm married to a psychologist. I'm very lucky. And she tells me that we can only relate to numbers between 0 and 100. And all those big numbers are really difficult to think about. So what to do about that? Well, we can think about how much energy we use. And these are some questions for you if you're not looking at your phones. I think many of us can say how many liters of gasoline, or if we have an electrical car, how many kilowatts hours it takes to run 100 kilometers. But I think the rest of the questions, we really have a difficulty. I mean, I can calculate how much electricity I use every day at home if I take my electricity bill and divide it by 300 and 
65.25. How much energy to cook a meal? I'm not sure. How much energy do I use every day? I'm not sure. And if I have to translate my energy use into CO2 emissions, I'm completely lost. We have apps, but it's still diff difficult. And then we have the energy units. We have joules, calories, kilowatt hours, British thermal units, barrels of oil equivalent, electron volts. I'm a spectroscopist, I'm a chemist. I use that last energy unit that most of you probably have no idea what is, centimeters to the minus first. So we have all these energy units and then we have all the things we put in front, kilo, mega, giga, pizza, exa, whatever. And it's really hard to keep track of what is going on. So therefore, there is one energy amount that many people know and most people can relate to. Do you have any idea what that energy amount is? Uh, no, but that horsepower, it was said, is that you're doctors. How many, how much energy does it take to run a person for 24 hours? Yeah, how many? 2,000, yeah. And that's how, that's so, that many mega joules per day. So that's kind of a nice number to think about. And you can kind of think about how many light bulbs can that energy light? We do a quick calculation, yeah. Is it one or is it eight or how much is it? So 100 watts times 24, 2400 watt hours, 2.4 kilowatt hours, turn it into to joules, that is 8.6 megajoules, like 8.4. So that energy can light one light bulb for one day. It's kind of nice to know. But then we can actually use that. I will define some new units for you that you will probably forget, but it's kind of fun. So now the new unit, 2,000 calories per day is one D, D for daily. And when I consume that, I probably, I consume a bit too much, uh, but uh, I exhale about one kilo of CO2 from that energy. And I call that CO2 for one C. So now we have a unit 1D and 1C, one for energy and one for CO2 emission. Okay, so we use 1D, but let's think about what it takes to give me that 1D. And I think when I first got that, I was kind of surprised. It takes 24 Ds to give me 1D. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. And then, you know, you can have electricity, uh, energy, and it's nice to know that there's 4D in a liter of gasoline, so you have some feel for what we are talking about. The energy use of people in the U.S. is 101.6 Ds per day. Now, if you want to compare, I try to compare the U.S. and Denmark. In the U.S., they get their energy from various sources. In Denmark, we get them from slightly different sources. They give rise to a certain amount of CO2 emission. It turns out that we use per person about one-third and kind of also emit one-third of what they do in the U.S. So you take all this energy production and convert it into CO2 emission. So that's kind of a nice comparison. You can see that wind in Denmark is actually uh, quite important. We produce more electricity from wind than we can actually use, so we have to have people take it away from us. Now, it's very important to think that all the countries want more energy. If you look at China and the US, China has a D unit of 32 and they emit 23 of these new units. In Denmark, we have 37 Ds and we emit 17 Cs. But if you look at all those countries, probably all of those countries, Macedonia, Denmark, the US, we all want and use more energy. Now, what are we going to do about it? Can we really electrify? And this is a picture from a place that I've actually visited. It's outside Abu Dhabi. It's a solar plant. It's uh, eight square kilometers big. It produces electricity at a cost of 
2.42 cents per kilowatt hour. That is extremely cheap. So, from an atmospheric scientist point of view, there is a lot of cheap energy to be harvested. Actually, the sun provides a thousand times more energy than we use at the moment on the Earth. So there's enough cheap energy. Um, how much area would it take to supply the entire world? We run at 30 terawatts per hour with 50% efficient solar farms. It takes about an area that 10 times the size of Macedonia. And I put some areas just randomly around the world to see how much area to actually just use solar energy. And of course, there will be some problem with some power lines and some things that we need to fix. But I think it's kind of interesting to see that we can actually supply the entire world with solar energy and there are some engineering things that need to be fixed. Can someone see a, a kind of a strange, uh, not, a, uh, not a quadratic, but a, there's a square that's different from the rest of the squares? Do you see that? That one? Yeah, in Saudi Arabia. I, I gave this talk in Saudi Arabia and I thought that they should know that they have plenty of space and uh, money to actually do something about the energy thing and forget about the oil and then do some solar power. Okay, so we can have all these nice cheap energy, uh, green energy. What do we need to actually use it? We need batteries. Batteries are really kind of rising big time, slowly, but it is coming and that is what we need. And, uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, there'll be some breakthroughs in battery uh, technology. We're still using old time batteries, but uh, I know as a chemist, there's a lot of work going into getting new type of batteries. Now let's talk a little bit about transportation. Um, I just put three different cars up there. There's a regular gasoline car, 21D, 14C. There's a hybrid car, a Prius, 10D and 7C. And then there's a fully electrical Tesla, 12D and 5C. And then the question could be, what car should I drive in order to be best environmentally? And this is kind of interesting. If you concentrate on that far column that's indicated with blue, we have taken the, the, the cars in different uh, surroundings. So the average gasoline car has 14.2. The hybrid car is 7. The Tesla in the US grid is 7.9. But if you use the Tesla in an area where you produce electricity from coal, like in China, the C is 11.9. So actually, China doing electrical cars and producing electricity from coal, that's not really smart. They should actually be driving hybrid cars instead or change their electricity production. But I don't think Tesla wants this news to get out. Then let's talk about um, the food system. So again, in the US, you use electricity, petroleum, natural gas, and other sources to produce food. And in Denmark, we, we do differently. But again, when you take this and convert it into uh, D, it's 24.5 Ds to give me that one D of energy to run my body for 24 hours. So what kind of food do they eat in the US? Hamburgers. Yeah, hamburgers. Hamburgers. So let, hamburgers and fries. Let's look at hamburgers. Concentrate on the blue column. So a normal industrial hamburger gives you a C of 6.2. If it's a free running grass beef, it's kind of uncertain what it is, but it's less. These three burgers are made from plant material and uh, I actually eat them and they taste okay. If you put a lot of ketchup and cinnamon, you, uh, mustard on, you can't tell the difference. But you actually save uh, a lot of emission if you can uh, cope with a plant burger. What kind of food should we eat? Should you eat? I think some of us had uh, fish last night, right? So we take a look at seafood. And I forgot actually where I got this graph from. I'm sorry about that, but I can find out. 
So here's a different kind of, of uh, seafood and the sea unit below. And you can see there's a huge difference if you want to eat clams, oysters, or scallops, or you want to eat lobster. And there's also a difference if you want to use, uh, eat wild fish or farm fish. Farm fish is actually more environmentally friendly because you can control the, the, um, the nutrition to the fish and also you don't have to run a big boat out on the ocean to actually catch the fish. So just if you like seafood, you might actually think about this. Now, what are the challenges for everybody, for all the countries? For petroleum use, we should use electric vehicles if there's green electricity. For fuels, we have to learn to convert green energy into fuel and use biofuels. Electricity, we need to decarbonize. We need to use wind and, and sun, and then we need batteries. So that's the challenges. The energy in the food system, if we want to address climate change, we need to think about the food system. It's 25%, one-fourth of total emissions is from food. We can do a lot ourselves. Um, we can think about the 24D, and we can lower that by eating less meat, less uh, beef, local food, less processed, electrify and decarbonize the food system. That's the way forward. Something I will not talk about is actually building concrete and steel, huge emitters of greenhouse gases of CO2. We need to use carbon capture and storage. And much of all of this requires chemistry. I'm a chemist, so I'm kind of happy for the future. There'll be a lot of jobs for, for chemists to make all this happen. So maybe if you use D and C units, it might give you a different perspective on yourself and climate change. Now, I know you're an anesthesiologist, and uh, there should also be something for you. And this is a one-page summary of my talk in Montenegro. The numbers on the far side is lifetime in years and the global warming potential, and many of those numbers comes from our laboratory. They are greenhouse gases, as you know. Uh, you should use the anesthetic with the lowest global warming potential if the clinical procedure allows and low fresh gas flow and all that. You are the doctors, you know what you can do and what not. You have the numbers. Uh, use as little as the clinical procedure allows. Avoid emission. Get a system to collect anesthetics. And what I'm working on at the moment in the lab is actually to try to destroy captured anesthetics. And uh, that's a bit of a challenge. We are in the middle of it, but uh, it's interesting work. And uh, we hope maybe next time I come and give a talk that I'll have some interesting results to show you what can be done. So do we understand our own personal impact on climate change? Maybe a little bit better now. I don't know, you're not nodding your heads. But anyway, Fala. Thank you very much for that. Uh, oh, now it is. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very interesting and provocative uh, 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 presentation. We are going to discuss all, everything at the end. And we are going to follow up on what you just spoke about with uh, Professor Eduardo de Robertus, how we all know, and who is also very much involved in the climate uh, impact on what we are doing in the operating theater every day. So we are looking forward to listening to you again, uh, Professor de Rupertis. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I want to thank again the Macedonian Society and uh, Vesna for the kind invitation and for the wonderful organization. Um, to be honest, I was a little bit scared to speak after Professor Nielsen, and, uh, but now, I mean, uh, it, it really kicked me the ball. And, um, well, as Italian, I'll, I'm a little bit sensible about the food, so I will not speak about food, but I will concentrate on uh, anesthesia and intensive care. Well, uh, these are my conflicts of interests. Uh, I mean, as all of you are well aware, I mean, our profession has an impact on, on the environment. 
Um, just to give you a, a brief uh, remind, I mean, and uh, just because we are a little bit dummy, uh, we compare uh, our halogenate with, with cars, and you see that, uh, I mean, uh, driving uh, desflurane, uh, it consumes much more than driving a sevolurane car. But uh, nevertheless, uh, what, I, what I want to bring to you is just that we have it's important, the impact of uh, 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 inhaled anesthesia, but we have also to concentrate on other aspects because if we look at the, 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 the how much uh, an, um, a normal ward bed or uh, an ICU bed uh, impact in terms of uh, carbon footprint uh, equivalent, uh, you see compared to our houses, it's, it's incredible the impact of one ICU bed. Uh, which is the, uh, how we uh, think about the, uh, the, the environmental aspects and impact of our profession. So this is a, a survey that was done uh, one year ago uh, and uh, it, it really uh, um, give a picture of uh, the fact that uh, many of us uh, are not well aware of the impact of our profession and that uh, for sure, inhaled uh, anesthetics uh, have, uh, have a different level of uh, impact and that should be considered when we use them. Uh, there is uh, um, a problem mm, amongst the countries because, because for sure the high income countries have much more facilities to, 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 be, to, to go green. And uh, uh, what is important is that we need to improve education, we need to raise the attention on, on these aspects. Uh, this is the situation of the, uh, how we uh, anesthetize people. Uh, I mean, in general, the, the, the inhaled anesthesia is the most used one. And so it's, it's, it's not uh, a case if we look at the, um, the trends in, 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 the, in the market of uh, allogenates for the next years. Uh, and for, I mean, the, the Severin is the, the most used one. Uh, but when we go to see if we use low flow anesthesia, then the problems it come up because most of us is not going towards a true low flow anesthesia. These are facts. Um, you know that uh, last year there was a, a discussion in, in Europe uh, about the regulation on, on, on fluorinate. And uh, amongst them there are also the, 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 the allogenates. The, the law is not, I mean, for, for us, be, but I mean, because the industry behind is so huge. But nevertheless, the, uh, our uh, drugs have been also included in, in the law, and as European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, we have participated in the debate uh, at European level, and we uh, wrote uh, and sent to the uh, Commission uh, a statement uh, about uh, how to um, better put in perspective the, the, this law. And, and just to summarize, uh, what we uh, stressed in, in our statement was that uh, there is uh, among our, uh, in our field, um, a lack of education that we need to cover. And the, 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 the societies, the, Euro the, the national and international societies needs to address these aspects because we have to raise the attention. Uh, for sure, the inhaled anesthetics uh, can bring, um, can increase, I mean, our impact on, 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 on environment. And that, that's why, I mean, we have to, to concentrate on, on the correct use of them, on the correct use of low flow anesthesia, on the correct use of uh, eventually scavengers systems that are rising and, and now are starting to be, to, to be seen on the market. Uh, stress the aspects of the uh, total intravenous anesthesia. Uh, on these aspects, nevertheless, there are some uh, uh, aspects that needs to be considered, and um, we know all, all the um, doubts. I mean, uh, of the use of total intravenous anesthesia without a correct neuro monitoring, and for those of us interested, I think that is a wonderful review uh, published recently on anesthesiology. 
Well, uh, and I, I think that as, as physicians, we ne really need to, to, to couple two aspects. Uh, safety, I mean, Janneke is, is, is a champion of, of safety, um, but we have to be careful not to put the, our uh, duty to be sustainable uh, again the best practice. So we have not to see these two aspects against each other. We have to, to try to couple it. And for instance, coming back to the total intravenous anesthesia, uh, as international society, as national society, we have to fight in order to have all the um, devices that are uh, needed for a, a correct and safe use of our drugs. So, as a European society, I, I, I had the problem to be careful to state go for TIVA because in many countries there are no uh, good neuromonitoring available. So uh, we have to to think about also the, our patient safety. And in fact, if we go to 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 uh, to see why we use total intravenous anesthesia, few of us responded because of an environmental aspect. The majority, I would say correctly, responded because the, pri the primary uh, motivation is to, uh, for the impact of TIVA on, on the patient's experience. Uh, total intravenous anesthesia is, give us a lot of uh, uh, advantages. Uh, Mm, I mean, the literature has uh, published a lot of papers over, over the last years about the impact on cancer. Up to now, to be honest, we have no evidence of any impact uh, or different impact on, on cancer progression uh, under TIVA or under inhaler anesthesia. Uh, there are also some papers that are now starting to be published about also the detrimental effects of total intravenous anesthesia. Um, I, I will go over these aspects because uh, we have no time. But as everything in our hands, there are good aspects and bad aspects. We have always to balance what we what we use and what we do. To be honest, the, the another aspect that needs to be uh, considered is that if we work in that environment, uh, I think that up to now we have too much focalized on the aspects of the inhaled anesthesia or, or as the only problem we have, or, or, or the only aspects we have to deal with. Um, because when we look at also intravenous drugs, there are aspects that needs to be considered. And we can also starting to calculate, for instance, the environmental hazards of each drug we have in terms of persistence, bioncolancy, toxicity for the environment. So there is the way to, to wait. Um, and for instance, if we go to compare the, the drugs that we normally use, uh, we see that, for instance, propofol uh, uh, has a higher hazard with respect to other drugs. And, um, and if we look at how much propofol we waste every day for every single patient, it's a huge amount of drugs. And I don't even know in my institution uh, what happens to the to the propofol that I uh, throw away. Uh, is it going to a process of incineration or is it going to be wasted in some other way? We know, for instance, that the propofol has a problem in, 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 if dispersed in, in waters. So there are, we have to, to, to address these aspects in a more comprehensive and holistic way. Uh, just to, 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 to add a bit, uh, another small piece. Uh, this is a very interesting paper. Uh, you see this picture represent a patient, is the author, uh, she's the other, but I mean surrounded by all the, um, the things that are wasted and, and, and thrown away after one single surgery. Uh, and the question of this paper was uh, what is better in terms of uh, green effect. Uh, general anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, a combined anesthesia. Uh, and uh, there are few uh, patients that were around 12, if I remember well, that were, were studied. So 
not many patients, but very, very in deep. And uh, astonishingly, the spinal anesthesia uh, had a worst impact on climate respect to general anesthesia with Severin. And this is mainly due to the, to the, to the, to the use of uh, energy, to the use of uh, uh, disposable uh, plastics, and so on. And for sure, the, if we look at the, 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 the um, combined uh, anesthesia, for sure, we, we have the sum of these two aspects. And this is true also if we look at, the, as it was shown before, the way we produce energy. Uh, so there is a little bit difference in, between, in Europe, but uh, if you look at the uh, United States or uh, China, I mean, there are, these problems are everywhere. General anesthesia it's more, uh, has a, more, a higher impact with respect to a spinal. So uh, we have to, as always, to, 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 it's, it's, uh, our profession is complex. When we address the aspects of uh, sustainability, is a complex aspect. And what I want just to uh, um, give you as a message is that we have, n we have to be aware of all our uh, daily um, effect under several aspects, drugs and also other aspects. Uh, and we have really to, to keep in mind that we have to be comprehensive and, uh, and, and, and have a, an holistic view. Uh, this is uh, this picture I liked because it's emblematic because we have concentrated on, on, on the halogenate, but look at the the waste that is behind us, and and, and so I, I think that, that this is an important aspect, and we know that the majority of impact on the uh, on the environment is not uh, uh, a direct delivery of care, but is linked to the what is behind our world. So. Uh, if we want to, to reduce our impact, uh, I mean, in, in this slide you see this line that is a trajectory without interventions, and if we just look at the anesthetics choices or waste in anesthetics, we reduce, yes, sure, we are going, uh, we are performing better, but we are not reaching the optimum. We have to, to try to intervene in all aspects of our profession. That's why uh, we have, we have uh, uh, decided as a European society to address these aspects and we, after a, a strong work with the Commission on Sustainability, and I have to thank uh, Patricio Gonzalez that has uh, led the, this commission, we ended up in Glasgow with the, the Glasgow Declaration on Sustainability in Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. And this was a moment in which we really want to uh, bring awareness and uh, we want to, to advocate our role uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this field. And the priority area in which we have to, 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 to better work are the for sure, medication use, uh, so the choices of the drugs, the way we use these drugs, and um, stress some uh, approach if we go for inhaler anesthesia, go for uh, uh, low flow anesthesia, and so on. But we have also to look at the energy use. And um, I mean, my mother always told me switch off the light. Do we switch off the light in our operating theaters? Do we switch off our uh, monitors and our ventilators, uh, I'm not speaking of the emergency room, but the other rooms that wait for 12 hours before coming back to work. So do the temperature in which we are living correct? Is uh, too hot, too warm? Uh, can we do a little bit better? So all these aspects need to be reflected upon. And also the, the way we, uh, we, we use um, devices, uh, if we can reduce the use of uh, some kind of, uh, uh, if we go to reusable devices if it's possible and so on. So all these aspects have now uh, have been uh, um, addressed by the, uh, our um, consensus document in which we, uh, has been published uh, one month ago, uh, in which we stress some aspect and we give some recommendations in which way we could impact less 
on the uh, environment. And the main aspects that, on, that we uh, address, as, as I said, uh, linked to the anesthetic and drugs use, uh, energy efficiency, waste and scavenging, and also the, 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 the well-being of the professions that cannot be separated by the uh, also thinking on, on the way we go to work and the way we eat and, and so on. So all these aspects need to be considered. And last but not least, what we have done at the European level to change the aim uh, of our society. Before we were much more concentrated on patient safety and uh, uh, health outcomes, we have added that we also have to, as our aim, to offer a, a sustainable profession that will um, affect as less as possible our, uh, our um, environment. So there is a problem. Uh, we have to work on this problem. But for sure, we have, we have all the, the tools not to come back to all the world system to give anesthesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running over time, but I think we will keep some time for some questions and discussions. Yes, first, but first, I was, I just would like to see in the audience how many of us, when we have a patient in front of us, how do we select our anesthetic methods? Do we think environment, or do we think what we think is best for the? safety or patient in that. I'm just curious. So these are for the safety of the patient. This is uh, the environment. Okay. <laughs> and, and it will be the same when once the environment Thank has you. been tailored and we can get to it. And, and that we also understand more, I think, because what was illustrated by you uh, is, uh, is that it's complex. We have to look at productions and uh, all of that. It's very interesting. But okay, uh, Silverman, please. Okay, okay. Sometimes in order for an electrical device to work, it has to be plugged in. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Macedonia. It's the first country I travel and teach and preach low flow anesthesia like a preach in the desert for more than 10 years. This was the first country where I ran my first workshop with uh, Adrian. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, second, um, safety comes with knowledge. If you don't know what you're doing, just making safety in the environment, you, you it backfires. Third, uh, I went to Jean Moret clinics in September. I correspond with Patricio, with, with many people in the Euro European Society of Anesthesiology and beyond about Judy, Judy Sherman, all over the place. The truth is nobody cares about anything in the hospitals. We have another case, we have another list, we have to do this, we have to do that. Fast, 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 nobody cares. Third, um, Professor David Whitaker, his baby is pre-filled syringes, like you mentioned. I try to implement this in my hospital, nobody cares. And I can tell you a lot of other things. The problem is, Professor Nielsen said, I only today learned your wife is a psychologist. We should find a way to use our dopamine wiring to do the right things. How we can stimulate directly, even financially, the, end, the last anesthesiologist in the chain to do something. Maybe we should interest a chief of department. You will not get the position if you do not address safety. Safety, okay, if you don't address uh, environment issues. I can tell you that in my hospital, usually you made the laundry at home, but I'm, I'm head up to here. I'm trying to implement low flow anesthesia in my hospital for years. Nobody cares. We are running no preparation for the accreditation. 
some wise guys from the U.S. are coming and uh, we have to write here, we have to answer like this, we have to do this. We have not a single word about sustainability, not a single word about environment, not a single word about how to keep our, our working place clean. So these are questions that should be addressed because they are very important. It is our planet. It is our only ship that we have. Of course, we read about space medicine and all the other stuff, but for the moment we are here. We need to keep our, it's our own safety. If we breathe all the time gases, if we don't see electricity wiring going down, nothing will work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any more comments? Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I, I share your, your words. Um, I, I think that over the last years, I, in our professions, a lot has been done for the safety, and already in our institutions exist, I mean, positions that look at these aspects already. But although, I mean, we have to fight every day for uh, with, with, with the administrators and so on. Uh, as concerned the, 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 the sustainability uh, in, in, in the countries that are uh, a, a little bit well, well uh, um, ahead of, of, of many other countries, like for instance the northern countries, Holland, um, Sweden, Norway, um, there already exist in, in institutions uh, people that are uh, with the task to control the environment, to stress these aspects. In the Netherlands there are uh, popping up some uh, green hospitals that they are uh, in which, I mean, the doctors are also a little bit uh, stimulated to, to behave and live differently. So there are, but it's, it's a problem of uh, uh, education. It's a problem of uh, rising the, 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 the problem, bring the problem to the public and before among us, but then to the public. Uh, it's a slow process, uh, but I think that we really need to, to work a lot on that aspect. Okay, thank you. I think uh, it's time because I know that uh, they are waiting for the Octa Pharma uh, Symposium. But again, I would like to thank the Macedonian Society with Wesna and Philip and, and, Adrian and everybody to make this, uh, this session which so interesting uh, interesting topics, uh, at least uh, the environmental. And uh, we will discuss more outside than the, in the breaks and at dinner tonight. So thank you very much, and I close this session. And thank you to thank my you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We thank you. Thank you. Uh, we opened uh, the, uh, this session needs a separate conference, I think. Yes. <laughs> it's so interesting. We learned about our terrible effect on the environment, our sustainability, safety from Yannike. So I think that this uh, topic needs to develop furthermore. Thank you very much, uh, all the t uh, lecturers. Thank you, Yannike, <laughs> for co-chairing with me. <laughs> and uh, see you later. Uh, we are now continuing with Octa Pharma Symposium. Kolegi, продолжуваме со Octa Pharma Symposium. Ги повикувам професор Dejan Marković и доцент Dragana Unić od Srbija, predavači na sljedniot simpozijum.
guys. Така, добар ден. Добар ден. Се слушаме така во корист на времето. Значи накратко само би сакала да ве поздравам во името на Велетрогерија Септима, во името на фармацевската компанија Окта Фарма и во мое име и би сакала денес да го поздравам вашето присуство на симпозиумот во организација на Окта Фарма на тема употреба на фармаконцентрати во третман на периоперативни коагулацијски нарушувања. Сега ја поканувам професор Бинјана Кузмановска да ги представи предавачите. Благодарам многу. Започнуваме со првиот предавач, почитувањиот професор Деан Маркович од Белград. Првото предавање го поканувам, дискусиите, прашањата ќе оставаме за крај. Велете. Thank you for invitation. Добар дан, драги пријатели. I will continue in English. Uh, I am Dr. Dejan Marković, anesthesiologist from Clinic for Cardiac Surgery Clinical Center of Serbia. My topic today is PCC, PCC use in perioperative bleeding disorder. If we have enough time for preparation patient for elective surgery, we should stop oral anticoagulant therapy three to five days before surgery. This time, three to five days, we should bridge with the low molecular weight heparin or unfractional heparin in high risk patient, high risk patient for thromboembolic events. Also, if you have a patient on direct oral anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulant uh, therapy, we should stop this... No, it's okay. We should stop this medication uh, two to three days before surgery. Uh, the bigatran, five days, and apixaban and uh, rivaroxaban, uh, two to from two to three days before surgery. It is not need to bridge this period before surgery. If you have a patient on antiplatelets, dual antiplatelets therapy with acetylsalicylate and another antiplatelets therapy like ticagrel or clopidogrel or, or prasugrel, we also have to stop this medication. For ticagrel, we need to stop three to five days before surgery for clopidogrel five to seven and for prasugrel seven to ten, ten days before surgery. If you want to perform deep nerve blocks or spinal or epidural anesthesia, we need to have INR less than 1.5. If you want to remove epidural catheter, we also need to have INR level less than 1.5. For superficial nerve blocks, we, we can have INR more than 1.5, but we should be very, very careful with, the, with these blocks. This situation is situation when we have enough, enough time. This situation is for elective surgery. What we should do with the patient on oral anticoagulant therapy for emergent surgery? In this case, we have guidelines from European Society of Anesthesiologists and Intensive Care from 2023. In this recommendation, we have that in patient with oral anticoagulant therapy for emergent surgery, we need to know what is the level of INR on admission on hospital. The first, the first one, we should measure INR. The second, we should immediately reverse oral anticoagulant therapy. How we can do that? <clears throat> we should give PCC 25 unit 
per kilo if we have INR up to four. <clears throat> if we don't have PCC, we can give fresh frozen plasma in doses from 15, 20, up to 30 milliliters per kilogram. In situation, when we have patient on oral anticoagulant, pre-operative, and we have severe bleeding post-operative, in this situation, we can treat post-operative bleeding also with PCC, 25 to 50 units per kilo protrombin concentrate complex. This is European consensus statement on the use of four-factor protrombin for cardiac and also non-cardiac surgical patient. In situation when we have patient on preoperative oral anticoagulant therapy, we should immediately reverse this effect using PCC, 25 unit per kilo in severe bleeding patient. In patients with high risk for thromboembolic complication, we can give, we can give half of the dose, 12.5 unit per kilo, and repeat carefully after that. In situation when we have patient without preoperative oral anticoagulants and severe postoperative bleeding, we also treat these disorders with PCC, 25 unit per kilo, and fresh, uh, uh, fresh frozen plasma in the same time together, both PCC and fresh frozen plasma, especially in trauma patient. Also in this situation, in, in high risk patient for thromboembolic events, we should give half of the dose. In patient on direct, or, uh, direct oral anticoagulant therapy, we should also this patient treat with PCC. This is off-label usage of this drug, but we have a problem with the direct oral anticoagulants uh, therapy because we don't have an um, antidote or the cost of antidotes is very, very high. Antidote for apixaban and rivaroxaban costs more than 20,000 euro, euros. In this situation, we can give 2,000 uh, 2, international units of PCC to treat severe bleeding in this population, or we can give 2,000 international units of PCC in this patient for preparation for the emergency surgery. There are guidelines for several uh, societies for PCC and treatment of IN, uh, high level of INR in preparation or treatment severe bleeding. What is with the regional anesthesia, with the epidural and spinal anesthesia and deep nerve blocks in patient on oral anticoagulant therapy. In this situation, if we, if we need emergency surgery, we can also give 25 units PCC and vitamin K up to 10 milligrams to reverse effects of oral anticoagulant therapy. We should check INR. If we have INR less than 1.5, we can perform spinal epidural, epidural or uh, deep nerve blocks. In patient on oral anticoagulant therapy with intracerebral hemorrhage, we can also give PCC. We can treat this situation with the PCC. There are recommendations of several uh, societies in this situation. This is guidelines from 2023, European guidelines on, on management severe bleeding in trauma patients. Uh, in this guideline, we have recommendation 33 that say in the bleeding trauma patient, we should emergency reverse uh, oral anticoagulant uh, therapy using PCC and uh, with the vitamin K, 5 to 10 milligrams. So what is PCC? PCC is lyophilized protrombin complex concentrate. It contains factor 2, 7, 9, and 10 
and also inhibitory proteins C and C, C and S. Octaplex is brand name of this medication. We can see that we compared with the, with the fresh frozen plasma. We need lesser volume of drug for reversal oral anticoagulant therapy. We need between 20 and 40 milliliters compared with the 1.5 or 2 liters fresh frozen plasma. Also, PCC is very quick. We can very quick use them. And also, we don't need to detect blood groups when we use PCC when compared with fresh frozen plasma. Storage is at room temperature for PCC. We know that for fresh frozen plasma, we need refrigerator and minus 25. And having time for fresh frozen plasma is at least 30 minutes. There are recommendations for different INR values and different uh, dose of prothrombin complex. This is one of the first meta-analysis uh, from 2020. Uh, 17 uh, trials, one randomized control trials and 16 observational trials. In the conclusion of these trials, we can see that PCC administration in bleeding patients not using anticoagulants had no effect on mortality. But in trauma patient, both PCC and fresh frozen plasma reduced mortality compared to resuscitation strategy when we use only fresh frozen plasma. Also, PCC reduced the need of red blood cell transfusions when compared with treatment strategies not using PCC. In cardiac surgery also, PCC administration reduced perioperative bleeding. Risk of thromboembolic complications are not increased compared with the fresh frozen plasma. Another meta-analysis meta from 2022. <coughs> In this meta-analysis, we have 25 studies with more than 1,000 and half patient. Uh, this is meta-analysis uh, for the treatment directoral anticoagulants. Uh, the first group are the group with the fixed dose of PCC to treat directoral anticoagulants. This fixed, fixed dose is 2,000 units. Another dose is variable, uh, is uh, weight-based dose, and this dose is much higher, 37, 38 uh, units per kilo. In conclusions of this trial, we can see that fixed dose of 2,000 unit PCC are enough and good alternative to another base, uh, weight based dose. There is no difference in thromboembolic complication, and also there is no difference in the bleeding between these two groups, but amount of the PCC is significantly lower in fixed dose when we give 2,000 unit of PCC. And one more meta-analysis in cardiac surgery eight randomized control trials with 1,500 patients. In patients uh, who received PCC, it was significantly lower chest tube drainage in the first 24 hour, hour and also fever units of red blood cells are using in this group of population. So we have very good drug. We have drug for preparation of the patient before emergency surgery and also for the treatment of the bleeding in the situation when we have patient on the oral anticoagulant therapy, when we have patient on direct oral anticoagulant therapy, or even we have bleeding patient without preoperative peri uh, preoperative oral or another another anticoagulant therapy. I will show you very quick one of the case reports from, from my clinic. It was eight years old woman 
70 days before uh, she was uh, aortic uh, wire, she has uh, had aortic wire replacement and single vessel uh, aortic coronary bypass. At this situation, she is in emergency center. She is, is with dyspnea, oxygen blood saturation is 80, and PaCO2 is 9.5. She was intubated in emergency center on the CT scan. Uh, we can uh, see hematoma 20 with uh, 6 centimeters in the left pleural space. Uh, she was hypotensive on norepinephrine infusion. On the chest X-ray, we can see this problem on the left side here, and we it was uh, uh, after 22 hours evening, uh, evening uh, and the uh, surgeons decide to uh, to explore this uh, left pleural space in the labor laboratory labs finding, we can see here that INR is 6.96. In the therapy, we start with the octaplex with the PCC, 1,000 units plus another 1,000 unit, 2,000 unit of PCC at 23 uh, hours. After that, we perform revisio uh, hemostasis evacuation of hematomatis. After that, the first INR, it was 1.67, and after that, with the, we gave vitamin K only one milligram in this patient. Uh, tomorrow, we have INR 1.67. Sixteen uh, hours later, she was on invasive mechanical ventilation. 16 hours later, she was extubated on uh, non-invasive ventilator. After 24 hours, uh, she was on conventional oxygen therapy. Two days later, she was stable and um, moved to semi-intensive care unit. And seven days later, she was discharged from the hospital. In conclusion, we can say that we have PCC for reversal oral anticoagulant therapy effects in emergency situations for preparation patient for emergency sur surgery and also for treatment bleeding patient. This drug we can give in trauma patient, cardiac patient, non-cardiac patient, in patient on oral anticoagulant therapy with intracerebral hemorrhage. This drug we can give to patient before epidural or spinal or deep nerve blocks to obtain INR less 1.5. This drug we give to patient in lesser volume than fresh frozen plasma. It is very important in patient with uh, chronic or acute heart failure that we cannot give more than 100 or 200 milliliters of the volume. It is very important that there is no need for blood group detection. This drug is for all the patient, all the, all the group. And this drug has also off-label usage for bleeding due to direct oral anticoagulant therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Dean Markovic, for uh, reminding us for uh, the indications of PCC here in Macedonia. We know uh, protrombin complex concentrate for a couple of years now, and we use it in almost all that indications that you pointed out. We know the advantages. Uh, and now with the beginning of liver transplant, uh, we are even more involved with uh, uh, concentrates of uh, plasma coagulation factors, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker, Dragana Unic Stojanovic from Belgrade.
прашања за професорот Дејан Маркович во врска со протромбински... Да, професор Нанчева. for elective surgery for octaplex do we have experience how we manage how many hours we give before operation to short three days uh, thank you for the question uh, in the situation for elective surgery yeah. you we can wait three to five days it's yes. okay Generally, three if days. You, if, if, you, if you want less than three days, yeah. we should check INR. If we have INR more than two, we can give 500 or 1,000 international units. And in the next one hour, we can perform procedures. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's a little quick. bit short time. Yes, short yes, time. interesting. It, it is not necessary to wait. If you have enough time to wait next 24 hours, you can give vitamin K and wait 24 hours for INR less than 1.5. Uh, you mean without octaplex or octaplex octa and without octaplex if you have more than 24 hours to wait. If you need less than 24 or less than 12 hours to wait, you can give only PCC. And you mean if we have INR between two and three, we have result for 24 hours with uh, vitamin K to uh, goes to 1.4. Okay, if you don't have less 1.4, you can give 500 or, or 1,000 and perform yes. in the next one hour. Only procedure. with K, means it's not. I mean, it's not possible. But with octaplex, maybe it's possible. Uh, several yes. hours or maybe one day. Yes. yes. In, okay. In one Thank hour. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we shall continue with uh, Dr. Dragana Unic Stojanovic. Uh, thank, you. thank you. I would like to thank you, Octa Pharma Company, for uh, uh, inviting me to give lecture about the using of fibrinogen and SD plasma concentrates in perioperative correction of coagulation parameters. My name is Dragana Unic Stojanovic. I am anesthesiologist and I work at Cardiovascular Institute Dedinje in uh, Belgrade. Uh, fibrinogen is the final product uh, of um, a coagulation cascade and um, it is a ligand between activated platelets. Um, uh, fibrinogen has important role not only in primary but in secondary hemostasis and uh, fibrinogen facilitates uh, platelet aggregation binding uh, glycoprotein 2B3A receptors on uh, the surface of activated uh, platelets uh, and uh, in that way uh, forming um, a spider web on activated platelets. Besides of that, uh, the crucial uh, role of fibrinogen is uh, in uh, stabilizing uh, von Willebrand factor platelet platelet interactions, and uh, also fibrinogen is a precursor for uh, fibrin formation. Actually, uh, platelet bound uh, fibrinogen um, is uh, converted to fibrin monomers um, uh, by uh, uh, thrombin. Uh, action and uh, uh, f fibrin monomers uh, are polymerized to uh, fibrin uh, uh, by uh, thrombin activated uh, factor 13. It's also known uh, uh, that uh, about uh, 80,000 uh, glycoprotein 2B3A receptors are present uh, on activated platelets and because of that that would be known that larger amounts of fibrinogen are captured by the few platelets of uh, abundant glycoprotein 2B3S receptors. That would be known when we uh, look at the relationship between platelets and the fibrinogen during blood clotting. On the left we can see normal clot firmness with the normal levels of platelet and uh, fibrinogen uh, present as a black line. Uh, in the middle, we can see reduced clot uh, firmness with the reduced number of platelets and level of fibrinogen. And on the right, we can see that clot firmness are restored 
and that can be explained by increased fibrin interactions in the presence of fewer platelets and uh, low platelets number. It's also known that the fibrogen concentration decreases um, uh, for the f as the first uh, factor of coagulation during bleeding, and that uh, is uh, particularly explained by the uh, blood loss about 90%, uh, as well as because of dilution, consumption, hyperfibrinolysis, acidosis, and uh, hypothermia. Uh, when we look at uh, the other coagulation factors, actually uh, the uh, fibrinogen uh, is the first factor to reach the lowest uh, value, critical value, with the uh, uh, blood loss uh, of 140% uh, of estimated blood loss compared to uh, prothrombin, actually thrombin, uh, that uh, reached the, the critical uh, level with uh, about 200% uh, of blood loss and platelet count uh, about 230% uh, of blood loss. Uh, when we talk about target level of increasing fibrinogen in the surgical and post-operative patients, we should know that uh, the normal value is below 2 and uh, 4.5 gram per liter, and the uh, critical level of fibrinogen is actually, according to recommendations, 1.2, 1.5 to 2 gram uh, per liter, and this is based on the results of some studies, including study that performed in cardiac surgery patients, uh, observational study that included more than uh, 406, uh, 4,000 uh, uh, patients. Uh, and uh, in this uh, study, it was shown that the patients uh, who were in category defined as low fibrinogen, that would be no, with fibrinogen lower than two gram per liter, 18% of patients uh, required five and more red blood cell transfusion, compared with the category of patients defined at high fibrinogen level, that would be no, more than two gram per liter, where 13% of patients uh, required um, uh, uh, five and more red blood cells transfusion. Uh, in trauma, massive uh, transfusion patients and uh, massive bleeding, it was shown that the uh, fibrinogen level is uh, associated with 24 hours and in hospital mortality uh, if uh, this uh, level below 100 uh, milligram per deciliter. And this study defined fibrinogen level 100 milligram per deciliter as independent risk factor for the death and because of that recommendations is uh, recommendations are to use as critical level 1.5 to 2 gram per liter of fibrinogen. And what we can use uh, for replace the fibrinogen level in bleeding patients, so we have several products uh, including uh, plasma cryoprecipitate and uh, fibrinogen um, uh, concentrate. And um, uh, availability and licensing status of uh, these uh, hemostatic uh, agents uh, vary between uh, countries. Each of them is prepared different, and uh, each of them uh, has a different concentration of uh, fibrinogen. Actually, it was shown that uh, in the fresh frozen plasma, fibrinogen is present in concentration about one to three gram per liter. That would be no one, 0 0.5 gram per unit of uh, plasma. When we talk about cryoprecipitate, uh, we have about uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, gram of fibrinogen uh, per 20 milliliters per uh, actually one unit. And uh, it is uh, characterized for cryoprecipitate that besides of um, uh, fibrinogen, it uh, contains also factor eight, uh, von Willebrand factor and uh, factor uh, 13. And we have a plasma derived fibrinogen uh, uh, that is characterized by one gram per vial of fibrinogen per actually per 50 milliliters. And fibrinogen concentrates contains not only fibrinogen, but also the small concentration of, um, of uh, factor 13. And fibrigo actually is a highly purified and pathogen inactivated human fibrinogen that is uh, characterized by concentration that is standardized and uh, very important, it is stable on uh, room temperature. There are no, no need for showing, showing and cross-matching blood type. Also can be reconstituted within minutes, may be applied in low infusion vol volume, and very important, there is double pathogen inactivation. 
It is recommended to use one gram during uh, 10 minutes. That would be no, that 50 milliliters uh, per, uh, on uh, infusion pump may be administered uh, at a speed uh, 300 milliliters uh, per hour. If you need uh, to elevate blood concentration of uh, uh, fibrinogen, 100 milligram per deciliter, uh, and if we use uh, for this uh, plasma, we need uh, about uh, 2,500 uh, milliliters of plasma. This is, this is too high volume. And only 150 to 200 milliliters of fibrinogen concentrate. And very important, if we use uh, in bleeding patients combination of fibrinogen and plasma, it was shown that we increase more rapid fibrinogen level by roughly five times that the ratio of red blood cells and fresh frozen plasma and is lower, and uh, this combination allow administration of lower dose of fresh frozen plasma. Fibrinogen should be a uh, dose based on uh, uh, bleeding, uh, or a level of bleeding, and uh, coagulation test and results of this test. And uh, there is some suggestion that uh, 25 milligram per kilo, that would be no, about two gram uh, for other pa patients, result in four millimeters increase MCF in FIPTEM in ROTEM analysis, while uh, we, have we need to use 50 milligram per kilo, that would be no, four gram uh, for adults of fibrinogen concentrate, this is equivalent uh, to 20 units of cryoprecipitate and result in uh, 8 millimeters increase in MCF uh, in FIPTEN on ROTEM. And according to guidelines in trauma patients, there is recommendation to use fibrinogen concentrate uh, or um, cryoprecipitate for major bleeding uh, if uh, is, it is associated with uh, hypofibrinogenemia diagnosed uh, by uh, a Klaus method the, of uh, fibrinogen uh, measurement or viscoelastic test. And uh, there is suggestion for initial administration of three to four gram of uh, fibrinogen in uh, our patients. If we need, repeat um, uh, those that uh, should be based uh, on uh, uh, viscoelastic test measurements or, uh, or uh, measurement of fibrinogen level and concentration in blood. When we talk about perioperative bleeding, again, there is a suggestion uh, to use uh, for the supplementation of uh, coagulation factors, coagulation factor concentrate, cryoprecipitate, or high volume of uh, plasma. And there is suggestion for initial uh, fibrinogen concentrate uh, dose uh, 25 to 50 uh, milligram per kilo, and uh, also we need to measure fibrinogen level at uh, blood or uh, to perform viscoelastic test, rotem or thromboelastography. And uh, when we talk uh, and we heard a little bit about uh, fresh frozen plasma and uh, more about uh, PCC, but very important, I said that uh, high volume of plasma is needed uh, to replenish plasma fibrinogen because of that, that is not recommended. Uh, that is uh, related with the contains of plasma because the main part of plasma is uh, water and small part is proteins including fibrinogen and, uh, and the other coagulation uh, factors. And fibrinogen is present actually in a um, higher level compared to the other coagulation factors uh, and very important the amount uh, and activity of coagulation factors vary varies from one to another uh, donors, and because of that, we can uh, see in plasma very different and very variable concentration of coagulation factor between 50 to 150 or uh, 200 percent. Uh, besides of that, we have several uh, side effects related to plasma, including uh, particularly allergic react reactions, transfusion-related, acute lung injury, transfusion associated graft versus host disease and transmission of viruses. And here we can, see, we can talk about uh, solvent detergent uh, plasma, SD plasma, that is post human plasma formulation, that is very important pathogen inactivated through solvent that detergent treatment and two times uh, filtrated 
So the coagulation factors uh, in this uh, plasma are uh, in a stable concentration above 0.5 unit per milliliter and only with modest reduction of protein S and more significant reduction of alpha-2 anti, uh, alpha antiplasmin. And the major benefits of uh, this uh, uh, solvent detergent plasma are standardized clothing uh, factor levels, reduce adverse transfusion reactions, particularly transfusion re related acute lung injury because of diluted antigens, antibodies, and uh, cytokines in SD plasma, and very important, enhanced uh, safety profile because of the uh, SD treatment and the reduction of uh, lipid-enveloped um, uh, uh, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and so on. When we look uh, at um, uh, hemostatic efficiency of uh, this uh, plasma, actually, this uh, plasma, SD plasma, is comparable to untreated frozen plasma with respect to hemostatic efficiency. And uh, it was shown that uh, SD plasma is effective in improving coagulation parameters and achieving uh, clinical hemostasis in various patient populations. Dosing volume is uh, similar, but is very important. The number of units uh, may be different uh, because unit volume of SD plasma is smaller but consi consistent, and this is 200 milliliters. When we uh, look at the patients who are um, uh, acceptable for uh, this kind of plasma, this uh, acceptable for almost all patients group, but contraindication is uh, to use SD plasma in severe protein as deficit um, uh, uh, that is very rare condition, but may present with thrombosis, and in these patients, there is uh, um, a suggestion to use the other form of uh, plasma. Uh, what's about results of some studies? One review uh, found six randomized control studies uh, published several years ago, including patients uh, undergoing cardiac surgery, uh, liver transplant uh, with coagulopathy or uh, with prolonged uh, prothrombin time. Uh, there was a comparison between SD plasma and um, the other forms of, of plasma showed that, uh, that uh, there was no, no clinical significant difference between this uh, different formation of uh, plasma, but it's uh, very important uh, that uh, actually this study uh, were very small, and because of that, we do not uh, have adequate conclusions. Uh, one study conducted in cardiac surgery patients, including emergency surgery uh, and patients undergoing uh, surgery because of thoracic aortic dissection, and uh, it was, uh, comp was conducted comparison of octaplas and uh, uh, standardized uh, fresh frozen plasma. And very important and very important finding was uh, that um, in patients who received uh, uh, octaplas, uh, damage uh, to endothelial glycocalyx and, redu and um, uh, tight junction uh, injury was significantly lower than in patients uh, who received uh, uh, standardized plasma. And also in this group of patients, we had a significant reduction of bleeding, total transfusion volume, uh, the volume of platelet concentrate, concentrates, as well as uh, uh, fibrinogen concentrate, PCC, and the uh, cryoprecipitate. What's about administration? Uh, similar to, f to um, a regular plasma, must be ABO blood group compatible. And also there is risk of, a high, of hypervolemia, pulmonary edema, or a cardiac failure if we use a large dose uh, for a short uh, time. In conclusion, uh, I would say that fibrinogen is critical hemostatic protein required for prevention and treatment of bleeding. And the fibrinogen level can best be replaced with commercial fibrinogen concentrate or in uh, its absence with cryoprecipitate. And as the plasma can be preferred over uh, fresh frozen plasma because of its greater standardization of coagulation factor content and because it is associated with lower incidence of uh, adverse effects and, be, and lower incidence of uh, uh, transfusion-related infection. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dragan Unic Stojanovic, for this very insightful presentation about the usage of uh, fibrinogen and solvent detergent plasma. Always better to use concentrates and uh, purified uh, medications. Yes. Uh, 
uh, avoiding uh, volume overload, avoiding uh, viral uh, inoculation. Yes. Uh, yes uh, uh, so uh, we do have fibrinogen. Uh, uh, we didn't use to uh, use it in our clinical practice uh, very much up until the beginning of the liver transplantation. Now we are very familiar with this product, and I really hope that soon we will get. We don't have uh, solvent detergent plasma, but I really hope that uh, we will. Uh, soon have solvent detergent plasma, especially the point that you said about the preservation of the glycocalyx of the endothelial membrane. This is very important for the septic shock, for the and for uh, reduction of inflammation. Yes, and uh, it is very important in bleeding, uh, in the traumatic uh, hemorrhagic shock. Yes. Uh, so, uh, preserving the glycocalyx is very important. Uh, uh, now I shall open the discussion. Uh, Dalima Prashanya, uh, commentary, da, Professor Adrian Kartalov. Da. The majority is Macedonian here. Huh? As you wish. Može mikrofon za Professor. Najdobro menadžiranje na masovno krvarenje je upodrvata na fibrinogenot, prednostite ki vidovme in na pisisito. No, mene što me zabrinuva, bideki nije sepak živejeme na Balkanite, je fakto deka ušte v urgentnijo centar treba da se napravi, da se potroši eden kertrič na rotem, koji što košta nekada 80 evra. Во старто треба да се дадат 4 грама на фибриноген, како што вие кажавте. Уште најмалку два флакона на ПСС, цената веќе расте. Најдобро се менеджира хемостазата на овој начин, со фибриноген, и со ПСС, и со следење на хемостазата со рота. Мегутоа, мене што ме забринува е трошковите. Трошковите се на висти на големи, затоа што во старто, Во првиот сад веќе имаме потрошени околу 2000 евра. А што станува после? Какви се вашите размислувања за тоа што точно е тоа дека ова SD плазма е поевтина од класичната плазма и дека предности да се тука? Меѓутоа уште во стамиот старт во ургентниот центар имаме трошок од 2000 евра. А какви се вашите размислувања бидејќи сепак 2000 евра за нашиот здравствен систем уште во стартот на една политраума на една масовна хеморагија не е баш мал. Какви се вашите размислува? Да, најчешче се хвала на питање и на тон коментару и тоа најчешче ја сте оствари проблем у велико веќини установа, посебно каде се убоди неки лек кој е нов и тоа е оствари колико он кошта. Меѓутоа тоа е сте цена старт и оно што видимо, али оно што не можеме видети у почетку е заправо колико ќе тој пациент крварити и уколико примени мо такав еден приступ, дека ќе му оствари на време да пише оно што е потребно. А основна предност и фибриногена и ПССИА е управо тоа да се може примени и за десет минути у односу у односу на оној момент каде смо донели одлука да се примени da će pacijent imati adekvatniju hemostazu sa brzom primenom i adekvatnim postizanjem koagulacijonog statusa u kraćem vremenskom intervalu, što znači da ćemo imati manje gubitke krvi, manje krvarenje, manju primenu eritrocita i svih neželjenih efekata koji su udruženi upravo sa masivnom transfuzijom, sa velikim brojem eritrocita, sa primenom kasnije i plazmi i aktivacijom inflamatornog odgovora. To u startu deluje kao viša cena, ali ako uzmemo kasnije u obzir i redukciju dužine mehaničke ventilacije, manje broje eritrocita, kraće lečenje u jedinici intenzivnog lečenja, onda je to sigurno nešto što će biti isplativije, ali te kada pacijent ode kući, a ne u tom samom startu. Zadovoljni? Da li ima drugi prašnje od publikata? Povelajte. Just two remarks to underline the lectures. First um, of all, it's very great that Professor Dejan mentioned um, PCC in antagonism of DOACs, because in Germany there's a big discussion now 
You know, everybody is on Apixaban and Rivaroxaban and things like that now. We use very, very little vitamin K antagonists by now only for um, heart prosthesis, but not for fibrillation or things like that. And the company who's producing the Dexon at Alpha is pushing a lot to use it. But we will have one trial published in the next month that shows the difference in survival of intracranial bleeding. That's the only indication for Dexon at Alpha. In Germany, it's not 20,000 euros, it's 16,000, but still a lot of money for small hospitals, and so um, it is completely clear that if you want to bridge or, or antagonize um, DOAX, you use PCC. It's standard of care still, it's off-label use, but at Exxon at Alpha is also off-label use. We only have data for intracranial bleeding, nothing else. And about fibrinogen, we were very happy to hear that it is now available here, uh, because I think it is for more than 10 years, uh, first recommendation in European guidelines of bleeding, tranexam acid and fibrinogen. And um, some of you know that I'm also giving a lot of lectures on patient blood management. And using single factors like fibrinogen, like factor 13 and so on, is one of the pillars of patient blood management to use less blood products. And so I think it's absolutely perfect what yes. was told here. And it's, it's completely the, the modern future of, uh, of bleeding management. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Huppertz. Thank this you. is uh, very much in line uh, with your lecture and the lecture of uh, Professor Dejan Milicu, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yes? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, samo jedan komentar. Ja još uvijek nisam koristio ovu SD plazmu. Uh, jedno pitanje koje mene muči, muči lo, znam da ti koristiš, da imate na raspolaganju. Uh, treba poklapanje krvnih grupa, to je ok. Samo izuzetno važna informacija. Da li možemo da imamo univerzalnu SD AB plazmu za ne daj Bože ono hitna situacija da možemo da damo? Da, mi koristimo AB krvnu grupu plazme, tako da nam je ona uve stvari uvek dostupna. Znači može univerzalna AB bude dostupna? Znači može univerzalna krvna grupa, univerzalna krvna grupa, nema potreba da odredujeme, da čekame krvna grupa, možemo je vidno da je upotrebime ta univerzalna solven detergen plazma, da, za politrauma v urgentni te centri, može dori v prehospitalno zgrižovanje na pacijenti, kada što bi bila i najkorisna v prehospitalno zgrižovanje na pacijenti, se kako je v emergency centers. Da li ima drugi prašenja, komentari, lični iskustva, kardiohiruški anesteziolog, gledam v publikata, da, transfuziolog. Dobar den na vsite. V princip, vprašanja je, da kažem, v imetu na vsite kolegi, koji što smo državna, ta kardiohirurgija nemame. Blagodarenje na kolegite, koji što deneska nisi tukaj, na vsite nivni kolegi so, koji što oni rabotata, doagija kaj nas, kako mentorska klinika, ne obučuva, tako da je vsakam, da go izkoristam momentot, javno da se zablagodaram na Instituto Dedi in na Klinički centar za kardiovaskularni bolesti Srbije za nesebičnoto znajenje koje što go spodelija so nas, tako da ovije predavanje na nas, bez da zvučam neskromno, se naše to sveko dnevije. Bi blagodaram. Blagodaram, doktor Mehmedović. Doktor Dejanova, transfuziolog. Jaz kako jedinstven transfuziolog ovde, na visti na ubavo se čustvovam i samo da pozdravam koliko ubava organizacija imate na kongresot. Bi sakala da spodelam lično iskustvo koje što nije go imafme so fibrigata, kaj bidek jaz doagjamo centaro za hemofilija, kade što gi tretirame i site vidovi na ostanati koagulopatiji. I imafme bremena žena so hipofibrinogenemija, koja što prethodno imala četiri abortusi i kada što celata bremenost se održa i uspešno se završi radjanjeto, tokmo blagodarenje na ovoj koncentrat. Međutoa, ona što i mene me zagrižuva, kako i profesor od Kartalov, je za žal faktot što ne možeme da go isključime finansijski od moment, bi dejki fibrigata ne je del od našijot nacionalen tender za kako zaostanatite koncentrati na koagulacijski faktori, I za žal, našata pacijentka moraša celata bremenost da go podnese celi od toj trošak. Međutoa, od druga strana, ako zememe, ne možeme da napravime komparacija i kako da go efektuirame, se je to toja da go izrazime matematički, kolikava je vrednosta 
на тоа што се оствари како мајка или колкава е вредноста на секој живот кој што ќе го спасиме со тоа што ние го сопираме многу брзо крвавењето, а тоа е нашата основна цел впрочем. Меѓутоа, мислам дека треба да размислуваме долгорочно, заеднички, со заеднички сили, ние како Центар за хемофилија, вие како Сдружение на анестезиолози, уште понатаму, сигурно и вие и ние до сега сме вршеле напор до фондот, до сите здравствени авторитети, ова да го предочиме и едноставно да имаме еден заеднички ефект за крајно овие концентрати да бидат достапни за сите и да си го најдат своја, да си ја најдат својата клиничка употреба. Абсолютно, доктор Дејанове, се согласувам со вас. Благодарам. Дали има други прашања, коментари од публиката? Добро ви благодарам. Го прогласувам симпозиумот за завршен. Благодарам на предавачите, благодарам на Окта Фарма. Пожелувам успешен работен ден понатак.
Hello to everybody. Uh, we are a little bit late, but anyway, we, we will do our session. Thanks to everybody who decided to stay here with us because of really nice weather outside and very beautiful place. So uh, decide to be here, not to be out. It's big decision. Uh, now I will uh, introduce to you Dr. Markus Fuppers from Germany, who will talk us, uh, us about antibiotic stewardship, antibiotic therapies in the ICU. Put it there. Yeah. Okay. So hello together. Um, welcome and thanks again. I see Philip and I once again want to thank, thank Philip and Vesna and all the committee, Andrea and his team uh, for inviting me once again to a congress on the Balkans for the first time in this lovely place in Orhit. And I want to tell you something about antibiotic stewardship in the ICU and uh, yeah, it will be for a little bit provocative talk. These are my disclosures, but as I will tell you how to use less antibiotics, there's no conflict of interest. Um, why do we have to do antibiotic stewardship? Um, we know that resistance of bacteria, especially gram-negative bacteria, is a growing problem in the world, and we are starting to lose the carbapenems, and that's a problem, because bacteria become, became from multi-drug resistant to extended drug resistant to pan-drug resistant, so we lose everything. And what we have to keep in mind, the more we use it, the quicker we lose it. And um, we had a session on environment and sustainability um, here. And uh, in Germany, everything at the moment is only focused on CO2. And that's a little bit monosynaptic because there are more problems in the environment. And one of the biggest problems in the environment is the pollution of water with antibiotics in India and China because we want to have cheap, antibi cheap antibiotics. Uh, not cheap antibiotics, but cheap antibiotics. Um, and that's why we produce in these countries who have no standards at all about the protection of environment. And so with our travel activities, this becomes a one world problem. It's not their problem, it's all our problem. Um, and if you look back, uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, he already knew that in 1947, that the more you play with antibiotics, the quicker you will lose it. And for the younger among you, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. He invented penicillin, and he's not related to Ian Fleming, who invented James Bond. So antibiotics are not a magic bullet. It's far more the, pr the problem that many doctors use antibiotics when they don't have any other idea. And um, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about the do's and don'ts in the ICU. Um, the timer is not running, um, so it's nice for me, but will be a little bit problem of time management. Um, I will tell you what you should do or do not do in the ICU, and I really recommend this article. If you want to know something about it, read this article. I will have several slides out of, taken out of this article. It's excellent. It's an excellent review about what we can do. What is antibiotic stewardship? It's about giving the right drug, the right antibiotic at the right time in the right dose for the right duration. And this is difficult, especially in critical ill patients. Um, the first step is to understand that you do not have to give antibiotics for every ICU admission. In Germany, many, many people working in internal medicine are convinced that as soon as a patient gets to the ICU, he needs antibiotics. And I won't go through the whole slide, but this is very nicely shown uh, how to decide when to give antibiotics and when not. ICU stay is not a reason to give antibiotics. Especially fever is not a reason to give antibiotics. According to Paul Merrick, um, around 40% of fever on ICU is due to infections, 40%. And there are many, many other reasons, as shown here, that con can cause fever, but they cannot treat them with antibiotics. Fever is not a sign of reaction deficiency. Keep that in mind. Yeah? There are many reasons to have fever, and if you think of other decision-making on antibiotics, on starting antibiotics, if you do CRP, Everybody who had an operation, everybody who has heart insufficiency, renal insufficiency, they will all have CRP, and you can treat peritonitis, you can treat pneumonia, but you cannot treat CRPitis. It's impossible to treat that. If you use antibiotics, have a five-day bundle, ask yourself after two to three days if these antibiotics are really useful. We will go back to that. Um, one of the most difficult tasks in the ICU is uh, to hit hard and get to the point pharmacokinetics, and this question was raised by Roberts uh, 10 years ago. 
very, very good articles to raise the questions how to individualize, individualize the, dro the dosing of antibiotics in the critical kill patient. I will show it here. We have a different pharmacokinetics in the ICU. Um, very, very often we have a hyperdynamic state, we have extracorporeal circulations, and the drugs we should use are beta-lactams, and beta-lactams are hydrophil drugs. So we go really back to the basic, back to your studies, to everything you wanted to forget, but you need it on the ICU. And if you use hydrophil drugs and you have ECMO, or you have uh, renal insufficiency, or you have hyperdynamic sepsis, you very often may need higher doses, not lower doses. Yeah? That's very important to understand. And then everybody is talking about therapeutic drug monitoring. We're talking a lot of about that in Germany. Therapeutic drug monitoring is mandatory for vancomycin, for aminoglycosides, I agree. It's not mandatory for beta-lactams. It may be useful in certain patients, but ask yourself the question, are you only treating bloodstream, bloodstream infections? If you are measuring a level of drug in the blood, does this help you to know what happens in the, in the peritoneum or in the brain? Yeah? So this is not the magic bullet either. You should use penicillins. You know all the problems about fluoroquinolones, and uh, we are talking about antibiotic stewardship here. What is important uh, with this regard is that fluoroquinolones are being secreted on the skin and may create resistant bacteria on the skin of your patients. Yeah? This is not so well known, but it's important. And if you use beta-lactams, penicillins are better than cephalosporins because cephalosporins are causing more clostridium and more extended spectrum beta-lactamases, uh, and carbapenem sparing should be a principle yeah, to save the carbapenems. If you use beta-lactams, use prolonged infusions or continuous. We may discuss about that, but it's no doubt that short infusions are not uh, the, the right way to give it. We know that from a very good meta-analysis from Vardakas from 2018, where was clear, clear proof that prolonged infusions, they enhance survival. This is basic pharmacology. We are asking that a lot in the European exam, so uh, you should keep it in mind if you want to do it. Um, Beta-lactams are time-dependent, and aminoglycosides are concentration-dependent. And the problem with continuous infusions of beta-lactams is if they are continuous infusion and you are all the time below here, you will never kill the bacteria. So if you do continuous infusion, you should do TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring. So we use prolonged infusions, and the Vardaka study didn't show any difference if you should do it or three hours or four hours or six hours or continuously, there was no difference. The difference was prolonged infusions versus short-term infusions, and no short infusion prolonged. How many hours or continuous or, or prolonged, do it according to your ward and what you can, you can do and to your laboratory. This is a very great paper of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, uh, which is telling you what to do, what to adapt for which drug and for which site of infection. It's not the same if it's the brain or the lung or the bone. Yeah? So uh, it's a little bit, uh, it could be simple, but we have to make our life a little bit more complicated. And I just can touch this in this lecture here. So in the summary, it's clear that we should give a loading dose, that we should do prolonged infusions, and TDM only in special cases, special questions, not generally. We cannot recommend TD, uh, TDM generally because nobody has it. Yeah? Even in Germany, it's a big problem. If I want to do TDM of a beta-lactam, I get the results two days later. That won't help my patient. Yeah? Um, so uh, sometimes in life, length matters. Um, do short courses. We have a lot of data. I show you just three slides. There's a lot of data that short antibiotic courses are as good as long courses. The only exception is Staph aureus uh, bacteremia. That's the only exception. For all the rest, there are a lot of studies, eight days with 15 days, seven days with 14 days for pneumonia, per for peritonitis, no difference. So you can do half of the time of antibiotics without any adverse outcome um, for your patient. Yeah? And so bring the evidence to the bedside. We have a lot of evidence of these courses and uh, that we can shorten it. If you start with a combination of antibiotics, you can de-escalate quickly. This is surviving sepsis campaign. So probably the most severe ill patients we know and we have on our wards, even they recommend you can start with a combined therapy for two or three days and then de-escalate. Yeah? Do not do seven days of uh, Mero, Wanko, Caspo, uh, Cipro, yeah? like in some German universities. Um, implement an algorithm of de-escalation. Again, we don't go to the slide in detail. Just do for your hospital, for your ICU, do a standard operating procedure how to de-escalate antibiotics for your ward. So and let all the people work together yeah, so that they 
really have it in mind and implement it. If the boss says, says you have to do it, nobody will care. Yeah? But you have to have a group that creates such uh, documents. And actually, de-escalation saves lives. This has been shown in several uh, studies, reviews, and meta-analyses. So uh, if we don't de-escalate, it's more the fear of the doctor. And so I'd say with Homer Simpson, and like we will do it this evening, don't have fear, have a beer. Um, de-escalate at last after three days. Um, don't treat bacteria that are not likely to cause the infection. Um, perhaps the older ones remember it, this nice city of Tarragona. There was something called Tarragona strategy. When I asked that in the German board uh, exams, uh, people are looking at me. They never heard of Tarragona, um, and it's a nice city, actually. Uh, but two, uh, look at your patient, which risk factor says your patient, and listen to your hospital. Know your own resistance. If you are working in a hospital that's ha that has 70% uh, of resistant Akinetobacter to carbapenems, okay, then you have a problem. But if you don't have that, give the smallest antibiotics that you can give. Uh, you don't have to cover MRSA and ESBL and everything in the calculated therapy. That's not useful. Um, use uh, PCT for therapy control. Um, there are a lot of lectures on PCT at the moment, also here on the Balkans, from some very well-known professors, friends of mine. And it has clearly been shown that using PCT reduces even mortality. Yeah? Why is that? There are two hypotheses. Um, if PCT is low, perhaps you may think about another diagnosis. Perhaps it's not infection, but something else. Yeah? And the second thing is um, you detect if your antibiotic fails. If PCC is high and is not going down, probably you choose the wrong antibiotics or you didn't um, do the focus control. Um, so this uh, reduces side effects and mortality. This is clear for PCT, and you can have as many reviews as you want. It's always the same conclusion. Yeah? So avoid typical crucial mistakes. Single shot is only single shot. Single shot is not two days, not three days, not five days. Single shot is single shot. And perhaps in cardiac surgery is 24 or 36 hours. But that's it. For the rest, it's single shot. Do not antibiotic prophylaxis for any drain in the patient. For CVC or urinary catheter, that's not a reason to give antibiotics. And then you may argue, but at least the drain in the brain, that's dangerous. No, it's a no-brainer. It's really a no-brainer. No matter where the brain is, no matter where the, where the tube is, no matter where the drain is, um, you do not use antibiotics to protect your drainages. That's bullshit. Yeah? Don't do that. And so repeat after me, no antibiotics for or against catheters. If a catheter tube or drain is suspicious to be the source of infection, remove, the, remove the, 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 the tube, remove the drain, but don't give antibiotics. Um, yeah, this is clear that antibiotic stewardship reduces uh, the multi-drug resistant bacteria. This has also been clearly shown in a big meta-analysis. Um, these interventions for antibiotic stewardship are safe. This is a big Cochrane meta-analysis. They included a lot of trials, as you can see here. And at the end, they just stuck, uh, sticked, stuck, I'm lost, um, 28 high-quality RCTs, and it was nearly 16,000 patients. And the conclusion was that antibiotic use can be reduced without adversely affecting outcome. Yeah? So this is really, really high-level evidence if you have a Cochrane meta-analysis from 28 high-quality RCTs stating that it's, it's really, yeah. And if you don't believe me, then study yourself. Just take a photo here, and you have all the trials you can read. Um, then uh, if you don't believe me, you have to do the work yourself, yeah? like the poor cat there, and read all these papers. It's, it's really interesting, and you feel much safer afterwards that you do not need antibiotics just for survival of everybody. So to summarize all what I told you, again, the paper I showed you at the beginning, antibiotic stewardship in the ICU, time to shift into the overdrive, Clinical examination, uh, image giving, microbiological sampling. If it's a septic shock, then use combination therapy in the beginning. Without shock, just start with one antibiotics. Um, review, reassess. This is the most important after 48 hours if antibiotics are really needed and if the patient improves. De-escalation should be done. Um, Definite treatment should always be a monotherapy. There are exceptions like stuff aureus and, and foreign bodies in the patient, things like that, but normally monotherapy. Short therapy, normally not longer than seven to eight days. Um, prolonged beta-lactam infusions, therapeutic drug management in selected cases, in problematic cases. 
Um, yeah, and that's it. You summarize the whole lecture on one slide, and I, th this is why I recommended you to, to read this paper. It's really great. And then you have to establish your local standards and make them mandatory. This is from my ICU. And of course, people do not stick to 100% to that because the chief is not always there and cannot always uh, punish the people. But you should write something like this at your local standards and make it mandatory. Yeah. If not, no, everybody will do whatever he wants. And so I'm just in time. Uh, if I raised your interest, you have my email address there. And uh, the whole lecture will be in the, in the Macedonian Journal, all the, the PDFs we gave them to Vesna for the Macedonian Journal. And I wrote these two articles where I summarize it more in a more general way, not only for the ICU, but for the whole hospital. One is in English, one is in German. If you'd like to have it, just send me a mail. I will send you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kupitz. And so, um, so uh, we have to change the roles. Uh, next speaker will be uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Ivan Chan from Croatia, and she will tell you about sedation in the ICU. Hello to everybody. Uh, I think that that there it is. Okay, uh, 15 minutes is not enough for to talk about this, 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 these topics. So, but I will try to do that in 15 minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, what I would like to talk about, it's to review the recent changes in goals and practices of ICU sedation, then focus on the detrimental role of the ICU environment, environment including uh, sedation, brain fu function, sleep disorders, delirium, cognitive impairment, and to discuss the role of dexmedetomidine and sevofluran in the modern era of sedation and, and analgesia. Uh, how it looks like in the past from 1980 to 2000, sedation was to provide, uh, to provide sedation is beneficial to ICU mechanically ventilated patients. Actually, when a start uh, need for sedation, it was in the 60s when uh, ICU appear and when uh, mechanical ventilation started for patient in the ICU. Uh, from 2000 to elevate sedation improves patient outcome and we were only, only uh, was thinking about uh, how does our patient in, in ICU will survive and how we can help to, to, be, uh, to have better outcome. Uh, from 2000 to 2010, we were thinking uh, about protocolized monitor and detrace sedation when nurses driving algorithms allows to improve pain control and avoid, and avoid over sedation. At that time, uh, appear a lot of protocols for sedation and, and how to uh, our nurses in ICU can manage that. And from 2010, to develop cooperative sedation and physiotherapy still improve outcome during and after ICU, ICU stay. And that at that time, from 2010, we uh, discovered that uh, not only medicine, not only drug, can, can do uh, good sedation in the ICU, that it's a, a multifactorial uh, component that can improve our uh, patient stay in, in ICU. Patient uh, in intensive care unit is treated with many interventions. So uh, to put uh, the tube, to put the central vein, to uh, uh, drainage the, ch the chest, uh, uh, to put the chest tube in, uh, and we know that pain is the most common memory patients who uh, leave from the ICU. So we need to uh, think about that. So never give just sedation without <laughs> pain control or uh, what is the worst, never give uh, relaxant 
without sedation and pain control. Goals of sedation in ICU, you know, that is patient comfort, control of pain, uh, anxiolytic and amnesia, uh, blunting otherwise autonomic and hemodynamic response, facilitate nursing management, facilitate mechanical ventilation, avoid cell extubation, uh, reduce oxygen consumption, and with all of this, better outcome of our patients. Uh, how we can do that? Uh, we can do that with uh, long-term benefits, with short-term benefits, or, uh, and reduce uh, harm. Uh, absolutely comfort and safety, uh, we need to titrate uh, to clinical needs, uh, this, this sedation, and uh, facilitate necessary intervention. Comfort of patient uh, centered with care without excessive sedation. This is the uh, e-cash uh, concept. Uh, it, we have to think very early and implement very early sedation for, uh, for our patients, uh, for their, their needs, uh, how we can, we can uh, do that. We can uh, comfortable, cooperative, and, and calm human uh, person, uh, family-centered. So it means that if we would like to have really uh, really good uh, outcome for our patients, we need uh, to give them uh, analgesia, we need to uh, allow uh, the family to be in ICU if it's uh, for more time than we are allowed them now. Uh, we need to do uh, physiotherapy, we need to talk to the, our patient uh, every single time where we have opportunity to do, to do that. Principle of sedation, uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, something uh, what, uh, what we have to, to uh, uh, do. It for the first is anxiety, pain, delirium, uh, to prevent that, that it doesn't happen. And uh, we need to see when our patients are agitated, uh, maybe when they are uh, Discomfort, feel discomfort in the bed or uh, just uh, uh, have anxiety and panic uh, in, in, in our ICU. So we uh, do need to uh, recognize that and uh, give them some medicine or any other interventions. Uh, how we can me uh, monitor sedation and how we can know how much sedation and for how long our patient needs. Uh, because over sedation can increase time on ventilatory support and prolong, prolong ICU duration uh, of stay, but under sedation can cause hypermetabolism, immunosuppression, hypercoagulability, and increase sympathetic activity. Uh, looking at hemodynamic responses as a measure of sedation are unreliable and Ill in the critical ill patients, so don't uh, think that if uh, your patient became, become uh, uh, become, become uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, it's, it's not the measure, it's not something uh, on what you need to uh, react with sedation. Uh, like I told you, uh, there is there appear in in 2000 uh, from 2000 2010 a lot of scoring system that we can uh, give our uh, our uh, sedation uh, medicine, uh, and it, it's done usually in all ICU by our nurses. Uh, one of this is Bloomberg sedation scale, and this is a uh, number uh, of of how we need to treat it. Uh, instrumental measure of sedation uh, to provide another approach to monitor sedation and, uh, and avoid the interpreter variability on clinical scoring system. It's uh, the most uh, use, the most useful is now uh, BIS and we are uh, using it in, in operating room and in ICU today and it's very good to, to uh, manage our sedation in, in ICU. It's very easy to use it. 
but there is a lot of non-pharmacological methods of AD uh, sedation. It's multidisciplinary approach in addition to pharmacology, includes uh, frequent communication, explanation to the patient and all the staff and the family uh, of, about the care of the patient uh, and what is most important is everyday physiotherapy and uh, because, <coughs> because uh, uh, this is important as prolonged immobility uh, and can be painful and this physiotherapy can re reduce uh, assessment and the treatment. And what else is very, very uh, important is uh, that we uh, feed our patient uh, in ICU that don't feel uh, hungry or uh, they don't have all caloric uh, needs for what they need. Uh, by literature, uh, we can, we, there is a controlled trials consistently support the use of the minimum possible level of sedation. In a landmark trial that compared routine daily interruption of sedative infusion with discretion in interruption by treating cl clinic clients and it calls use uh, uh, holiday sedation uh, during, the, during the day. Uh, what, is, what is consistent message from all the literature that uh, sedation inter interruption trials is the minimizing sedation among the patients in the ICU provides clinical benefits that uh, sedation, uh, daily interruption of sedation reduce administration of, of benzodiazepine, reduce duration of mechanical sed uh, ventilation and reduce uh, length of the stay in the ICU and sig significantly uh, sur increase survival rate. Uh, what pharmacological agent we, we use, it's usually, it was propofol, it was midazolam, it was haloperitol, it was lorazepam, diazepam, morphine, fentanyl, sufentanyl, and alfentanyl, right, like uh, uh, for treating the, the, the pain in the ICU. But what, was, what is unwanted side effects of sedative agents is general sometimes over sedation and delayed awakening and extubation. And what uh, benzodiazepines are doing to our patients is uh, in increase hypotension, respiratory depression and agitation, propofol, uh, CVC depression, hypotension, ketamine, hypertension secretion and dysphoria and alpha agonist hypertension and bradycardia. Do we need that in our ICU? No. The, like I told you, neuromuscular blocking agents don't provide sedation and never give it uh, uh, without sedation and, and uh, giving uh, painkillers. Uh, a sedation holiday involves stopping the sedative infusion, allowing the patient to wake every single day, uh, do that. Uh, the, the infusion should be only restarted once if the patient really uh, feel discomfort in, in, in the bed and uh, ideally this sedation holiday should be performed on a daily basis. Uh, what we do have uh, really, really a um, uh, big problem in, in, I, in I, our ICU is delirium. Delirium appears in a 75 to 80 per 80 percent of the patient in, in ICU and can be hyperactive and uh, hypoactive. So uh, it's more dangerous, it's hypoactive delirium because we don't recognize them and uh, in increase mortality rate uh, a lot. So what is the uh, reason to, uh, for delirium? It's a multifactorial, multifactorial. it's not only uh, age, it's not only cognitive impairment before procedure, it's uh, it's, it's pain, it's panic, it's, it's uh, uh, our sedation, especially with midazolam, uh, when if you have 80 years uh, old uh, patient in your ICU and you know how, what is their attitude that uh, they're sure only in a, in a uh, known uh, environment, but uh, when he woke up in, in uh, uh, ICU and he, this, our patients don't recognize anybody and it's totally new environment. It, 
and they start panicking and we uh, saw it like like uh, delirium. It's multifactor and I, I don't have a time to, uh, to talk about, but if you are interested, I can uh, leave this presentation and all the literature uh, to you after. Uh, the same, the same uh, uh, problem and I don't have time to talk about all this. How we can identify delirium uh, in routine practice, ICU staff members typically don't diagnose delirium to almost three quarters of our patients uh, who have that conditions. Uh, and uh, whereas active screening by research nurses identify delirium in up to 65% of patients who were considered to be delirious by, by psychiatrists, by geriatricians, or a neurologist. ICU doc doctors is not that person who really recognized uh, delirium in our patients, it's nurses and other stuff. Prevention and uh, treatment of delirium is absolutely, uh, uh, it's, it's well known that delirium can be prevented outside of the ICU. Uh, repeated reorientation, so it means talk to your patient uh, in every single time uh, when, you, when, when you can do it, uh, cognitive stimulation, vision of hearing aids, adequate hydration, early, early mobilization, and uh, maybe give them haloperidol uh, uh, before the procedure uh, if you uh, are uh, sure that this patient will uh, develop uh, delirium in, in the ICU. Choice of, of sedative agent, despite of the more than 90 trials comparing sedative reg regimen in general. No sedative drug in, uh, clear, is clearly superior uh, to all others. Sedatives uh, are common, who are commonly used in the ICU are benzodiazepine, midazolam, lorazepam, propofol, and now new agent dexmedetomidine. Uh, benz benzodiazepines uh, act uh, like uh, uh, through the uh, GABA re receptors, and it's in, in, in a part, uh, those like propofol, uh, where dexmedetomidine is an uh, alpha-2 adrenal receptor agonist, and remifentanil is uh, new opioid receptor against. Uh, it, uh, this is uh, published in, in a British med Medical Journal, uh, how we can uh, use how we can uh, treat our patients and what is the challenge and uh, barriers to optimizing sedation in intensive care unit. And uh, it can be uh, seen here that there is no uh, really, really uh, uh, good, uh, uh, what, what, what kind of, of sedation we can do. But, but this, this uh, is uh, new. Uh, that sedation and winning for mechanical ventilation, time for best practice to catch up with new realities. And they are talking about dexmedetomidine, who is, may also have advantage over benzodiazepines. It means it uh, produces uh, sedation and analgesia. It, uh, uh, it don't cause respiratory depression and uh, you can stop it and in a, in a, when you stop it, you will have a totally awake in a two, three minutes your patient and you can talk to him and uh, uh, make a evaluation, does he needs sedation anymore? Uh, does, does you will continue with sedation or not? And what is most important that dexmedetomidine uh, you can use for uh, every single patient in ICU because they, um, it's very, uh, when you sedate patient with, with this, it's very uh, similar to normal uh, sleep at home. So you will have uh, in the morning uh, patient in a good condition. And what is another new in, it's a volatile anesthetic, new uh, player emerging in critical care sedation and it's very, very, um, Sim simple to use it, advantage, advantage is uh, rapid onset of, of action, no significant tolerance uh, tachyphylaxis or something like that. Uh, it's, uh, everything is expelled from, from uh, lungs 
and what uh, they cause its uh, bronchodilatation, what is very important for our patient ICU. It's, they have anticonvulsant effects and no alteration to uh, renal or hepatic uh, laboratory markers. Disadvantage, absolutely, those depend on cerebral vasodilatation that make, they can increase uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, those depend hypotension risk and malignant hyperthermia in general, but uh, it's very, very rare. Uh, why, uh, how we can use it with the, through the system of anaconda, and very, very easy that system of anaconda just put on the tube and uh, give, give uh, uh, severan through, through the, through the uh, like, like in operating room. Uh, and what is good, if you need only um, a few hours of sedation and you are doing uh, your anesthesia in, in, uh, in the operating room, uh, balanced anesthesia, and you use severan, uh, so you can uh, keep going with severan in ICU, and you don't need to use any other uh, sedatives. This is the literature uh, and uh, the data about uh, how uh, we can improve our sedation with, with uh, Severan. Uh, Non-sedative properties of Severan, you know, you heard about preconditioning and post-conditioning and how, uh, what, what uh, uh, effects on other organs they uh, Severan have in our, our, in our uh, body and uh, what is very, very uh, good to know that cellular sedation with anaconda can be in a child. We did it uh, undergoing extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it's very, very And this is um, a proposal that uh, uh, sedation, analgesia, and paralytics are not a treatment, it's just an uh, additive therapy that never use uh, paralytics without sedation, never use sedation without analgesia, uh, that use right medication, right dose according to condition of patients. It should be con confirmed by prescribing doctors and increase use of dexmedetomidine and anaconda. Avoid midazolam as much as possible because of his, um, uh, uh, because, because they, they uh, uh, Oh my goodness, <laughs> because they, they can cause um, uh, memory, in the, uh, lose, lose memory of what, what, they, uh, what was before. So conclusion, over sedation can increase time on ventilatory support, prolonged ICU stay, and may uh, precipitate unnecessary neurological investigation, especially with the, in a patient with delirium. Uh, Continuous infusion of benzodiazepine has been implied and as an independent predictor of a longer duration and me mechanical ventilation. Sedation uh, score should be used to allow titration and drug administration. Uh, sedation holiday strategy uh, needs to be used in every single ICU uh, to uh, make shorter time of mechanical ventilation and stay in ICU. And sedation protocols should be standard in every single ICU and followed by nursing and medical staff. And if you are, if you are interested, just read these two uh, and implement the sedation protocol in, in your ICU. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Ivan Chan, for presenting one of the most complex topics in the ICU in a little bit more than 15 minutes. Um, now I have the honor to present you Professor Palibrik from Serbia, Belgrade. Um, he will talk about nutrition of the critical low. <coughs> Dear colleagues, uh, good day. At uh, the first I want to thank uh, Vesna, Philip, uh, Simonas, and other from organization to invite me and give me a very interesting lecture, lecture but about uh, uh, nutrition therapy on critical patient. And before I start my lecture, I very short want to introduce you with my clinic. I am coming from Clinic for Digestive Surgery, University Clinical Center of Serbia. Two years ago, we celebrate uh, 100 years of founded. And uh, 
and this clinic we performed surgery from esophagus to the periana oregia region. And because of that, we have a uh, very huge experience with nutrition therapy. At the beginning of my lecture, I want to define who is critically ill patient. It is very difficult, but my opinion, and Professor Jean-Louis Vincent, that this is patient which need uh, continued monitoring and continued therapy, and that patient have more, one or more very serious disease. Uh, as a simple of critical ill patient, I, takes, I take uh, uh, sepsis patient and we see on the uh, sofa scoring that the that patient have uh, destru destruction of diff difficult or, uh, different organs. And the surviving sepsis tell us that uh, enteral nutrition have very important uh, role in uh, therapy of our patient and that it is necessary in the first 72 hours start with enteral nutrition if it is possible. If it look at the different uh, guidelines, we can uh, see that uh, it's very important that, that something is uh, very strange between three or four days at the beginning critical ills. What is happened during the first uh, two or three days the patient uh, is acute phase of critical ill. This is time when is a very huge catabolism, when patient uh, have a very huge destruction of the proteins, the destruction of the muscle, synthesis of uh, inflammatory proteins, uh, insulin resistance, and uh, it is very important part of this first uh, two or three days. After these days, patient will go two ways. Per, first way is that uh, we'll go to improvement and rehabilitation. Second way is to go to prolonged, prolonged hospitalization and persistent catabolism. Because it is very important this third or fourth days of the beginning from the beginning of critical ill. And recommendation is that uh, enter root in the critical patient, uh, critical ill patient is uh, we must use in if it is possible. Uh, but if it isn't possible, if, if we have destruction from enteral of uh, we don't have intact gastrointestinal tract, we can use parenteral nutrition. As I will tell you, if oral intake is possible, we must use enteral root and in some situation enteral plus parenteral nutrition to reach a nutrition goal. It, uh, is our, it is our patient with uh, biliary peritonitis, septic patient and the patient received nutrition therapy by nasogeginal tube feeding. How much energy, energy need the uh, critical ill patient? We have two different guidelines. First guidelines is ESPEN guidelines and uh, it tell us that always use indirect calorimetry to decide for decision how much energy need our patient. And they recommended that don't go more than 70% of uh, rest energy expenditure. But ESPEN American Society tell us that during first day, seven to 10 days, uh, critically, we can use the 12 to 25 kilocalorie per kilogram per day. How much proteins? Aspen tell us 0.8 to 1.3 kilogram uh, grams per kilogram per day, but uh, Aspen 1.2 to 2 gram per kilogram per day, and after chemodynamic stability, our patient. Why we have this recommendation? Everything starts with Caesar study, 211, and one group of patients start with early, early parental nutrition, and the second group use early enteral nutrition, and they conclude that late initiation of parental nutrition 
was associated with faster recovery and fewer complication compared with air early initiation of parenteral nutrition. 25 years ago, me, Ivan Andenberg, which is in this study. Next study, very important, is Heidegger study, when we use uh, uh, in co randomized, randomized control trial, uh, one group patient take uh, enteral nutrition all time, second group uh, start with the supplemental parenteral nutrition after four days, enteral plus parenteral, and uh, they conclude that uh, uh, is necessary to give every pa patient uh, individual uh, nutrition therapy and supplementation uh, parenteral nutrition starting from four days after intensive critical care should be considered a strategy to improve clinical outcome in patient in the ICU with insufficiency enteral nutrition. As Professor Jean Louis tell, no urgency to start parenteral nutrition in that time and now. Now, two, three slides before, energy was main. Now, our proteins are the main stain. Alinkstra tell us that uh, patient which we take uh, higher, uh, higher uh, protein uh, during nutrition support, which is during critical ill, have a better surviving than patients which take a lower level of low, uh, low number, number of uh, proteins during critical ill, during nutrition therapy. Then they conclude that the result of their stud study suggests a better treatment outcome if the albumin intake is approximately 1.5 gram per kilogram per day. Similar result give us wise in your study, but uh, he tell us that is more better result when patient reach uh, the goal for proteins together with energy goals, then only some only energy goal. How much energy, energy is uh, the best for our patient? Tussman tell us that is the best energy for our patient, approximately no more than 70% of rest energy ex expenditure. And what is uh, with albumin? When we increase, left graph, when we increase uh, 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 protein and albumin, uh, we decrease odd, odd ratio for, uh, for uh, complication and mortality. Same result is protein uh, study when we see that the patient will, uh, which will take uh, more proteins, more than 0.8, uh, have a better surviving. Next, uh, about proteins. This protein and caloric intake tell us that in septic patient, late moderate protein intake and late high energy intake, late after three, four days, are associated with better survival. Effort protein study tell us that intake of higher dose of protein in critical ill patient does not improve the outcome of treatment, but may worsen the outcome in patients with acute kidney injury and with more severe disease. No too much proteins, no too much energy. Nutria study, uh, Reiner make hypothesis that early calorie and protein restriction improved outcome in this patient compared with standard calorie and protein target. And uh, he support this hypothesis. They found that uh, if uh, uh, give his patient low energy, low protein diet, they did that lead to faster recovery and with fewer complication. Uh, 
Question, does improve the early nutrition therapy, full nutrition therapy improve outcome? It is question. But uh, the, the support of this hypothesis that lower energy, lower protein in the first two or three days, we find in this uh, hypothesis, this uh, explanation. First is that uh, good full therapy, full nutrition therapy, don't have beneficial effect because this therapy don't suppress endogenic catabolism. When we have catabolism in first third day, we have uh, huge destruction of proteins, muscle, and huge uh, uh, concentration of urea and creatinine, and that find that uh, this ratio of urea and creatinine in critical ill patient is in direct relationship with bad uh, results. Second is that uh, something about uh, autophagy. When we have uh, early parenteral nutrition, early full uh, enteral nutrition, this uh, uh, decrease autophagy. But we, when use late parenteral nutrition, this stimulate autophagy. Autophagy is very important for defense of organism. Autophagy is useful. Autophagy is uh, uh, normal, activated in critical ill patient. This is, it is natural process, homeostatic process, and autophagy protect uh, organs and the organism from damage. Third hypothesis says that uh, early enteral, full enteral, parenteral uh, uh, nutrition, suppression of ketogenesis. It, ketogenesis is very important. It is good fuel for organism. Ketogen, ketogen uh, body uh, have a signal rule. Uh, ketogen uh, supplementation uh, stimulate muscle regeneration and uh, have anti-inflammatory effect. But the uh, new strategy now are that we, during nutrition, use intermittent nutrition, ketone supplement, and sometimes some, uh, some keto diet. How to avoid complication during critical, the nutrition critical ill patient? We must, uh, we, mm, must uh, make a good plan of diet and constant monitoring of our patient. And the end of this story, we back to the, this uh, graph, Dr. Wishmeyer, which tell us that in the beginning, first third day, we use a low calorie intake and step by step increase protein intake during first third day and after, uh, after uh, early phase during late phase of critical ill. At the end, let's be more at the conclusion. Nutrition therapy is necessary for critical ill patient. It is very important to measure energy needs whenever it's possible use indirect calorimetry. In early phase critical ill, we use hypocaloric diet with lower protein intake. During chronic phase and recovery phase, increase energy and uh, protein intake for our critical patient. Thank you for attention. Thank you. And I will now introduce you uh, Willa Passar, Life Protective Strategies in Mechanical Ventilation. Thank you, dear chairman. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to. Uh, sorry. I would like to uh, thank uh, the Congress Organizing Committee and dear Vesna, of course. Uh, it has been uh, my first time uh, in Ohri, uh, and uh, I would like to say Ohri is really beautiful city. Thank you again. 
uh, this uh, session, uh, my topic is lung protective strategies in mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> mechanical ventilation uh, is the one of uh, cornerstone of treating patients with respiratory distress, especially uh, respirat acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, but uh, we know that mechanical ventilation itself can damage uh, the lungs uh, since uh, 1974. Uh, these injuries are called ventilator induced lung injury. Uh, actually, uh, two main mechanisms here, two main and basic, uh, I, I may say that. Uh, dynamic lung expansion and uh, repeated opening and closing um, uh, lung units. Actually, the main mechanism, but uh, the, uh, these basic mechanism very, uh, have very uh, serious consequences. Uh, the concept of mechanical ventilation uh, causing lung damage uh, has an interesting history. Uh, Dr. Faderil performed a uh, successful mont mont resuscitation uh, many years ago. Uh, he later expressed uh, the mont mont resuscitation may be a better option uh, using mechanical devices because uncontrolled air intake and uncontrolled uh, pressure intake uh, always damage the lungs. Uh, later, we saw that uh, polio epidemic uh, researchers uh, noted the harms uh, of mechanical ventilation. Uh, this is very important uh, paper, uh, 1974. Uh, an important paper showed that a high inspiratory pressure and cyclic opening and closing of the lungs always lead to alveolar damage. And uh, this situation, this uh, point, uh, can be prevented PEEP, uh, so P, uh, positive and expiratory pressure, I mean. Uh, a lot of, uh, at the same time, a lot of experimental studies uh, showed that volley trauma caused not only by overdistension, but also uh, by high inspiratory pressure. Uh, additionally, two uh, important concepts uh, were discussed, uh, infant lung and respiratory lung. Uh, these refer to uh, excessive alveolar infiltration and damage caused by mechanical ventilation. Uh, as a result, all of this, um, uh, the concept of ventilator in this lung injury were uh, defined, uh, is defined. Uh, ventilator in this lung injury, you know, uh, the acute lung injury inflicted or aggravated uh, by mechanical ventilation. Uh, this period uh, potentially injures both disease and uh, normal lung. And of course, this injury will be much uh, more severe uh, disease lung due to the um, uh, micro scale stress. Uh, at this point, uh, I should uh, say that um, ventilator in this lung injury and ventilator associated lung injury are not, uh, are not uh, same terminology. Ventilator associated lung injury concept more uh, appropriate uh, when there is a no strong evidence uh, lung injury is ventilation uh, uh, related. Uh, as you uh, show that, um, uh, four main mechanisms for uh, ventilator induced lung injury. One of them over uh, alveolar overstretch, uh, so volume trauma and barotrauma, atelic trauma and biotrauma. Other mechanisms include adverse heart-lung uh, interaction, deflation-related injuries, of course, uh, local lung me me uh, mechanics, stress failure in pulmonary capillaries, and of course, genetically determined inflammatory mediators. Uh, barotrauma and volume trauma, similarly concept, but uh, very important. Barotrauma is a pressure-induced lung injury. Air leaks, pneumothorax, pneumomediation may occur due to the uh, excessive stretching. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, volume trauma is caused by high volume into the uh, small airways. Uh, the um, uh, really um, relevant uh, concept uh, is a transpulmonary pressure, which is uh, alveolar, the difference between alveolar and uh, pleural pressure. It's important because transpulmonary pressure is a uh, very close um, concept, uh, tidal volume. Tidal volume. And uh, we can use pleural pressure uh, um, as, a is a, is, as a reflection of bedside transpulmonary pressure. And atelic trauma. Atelic trauma is a, a cyclic opening and closing of atelectotic alveoli uh, can damage but non-atelectotic alveoli uh, due to the sheer stress forces. Uh, of course, higher uh, PEEP um, lead to alveolar overstretching, but uh, lower PEEP uh, also lead to insufficient to stabilize the alveoli and keep them open. Uh, in this point, at this point, uh, the concept of optimal peace, uh, PEEP is significant to prevent atelic trauma. 
And bi biotrauma, of course, uh, we know that the release of inflammatory mediators from injured lungs, uh, lungs uh, cells, uh, due to the bio uh, barotrauma or volotrauma. Uh, so uh, this uh, um, uh, literature very uh, interesting because uh, this patient in this uh, study uh, without ARDS, uh, approximately 3,000 uh, patients in the study, uh, and uh, researchers uh, um, said that risk factors really were a high tidal volume, a blood product transfusion, acidemia, and a history of restrictive lung disease. Uh, another uh, less effective secondary factor were respiratory acidosis, respiratory rate, and pulmonary vascular pressure. Uh, additionally, a uh, high tidal volume, low PEEP, uh, of course, uh, caused volume trauma, but uh, not only volume trauma, collapse, inflammation, and increased surface tension. Uh, and uh, all of these factors uh, actually lead to uh, ventilator in this lung injury. So protective ventilation, what can I say about it? Uh, pro protective ventilation means uh, protection the lungs um, uh, as much as possible or from all these effects, actually. Uh, uh, I want to uh, talk about uh, this study. Uh, in uh, 1990s, uh, the concept of permissive hypercapnia highlighted for limiting the intensity of mechanical ventilation. And this thought inspired the design of ARDS network study. Uh, uh, you know, this study is very important, ARDS patient especially. In this trial, um, uh, 8,000 patients divided into the two groups. Uh, and one of them, a uh, lung protective strategy group. Uh, in this group, uh, um, tidal volume adjusted uh, 6 milliliter per kilogram and plateau pressure at least 13 centim water. Uh, this uh, uh, group uh, was compared with traditional group. Uh, as you can see on the table, um, traditional group uh, in this traditional group, higher tidal volume and higher plateau pressure. Uh, so uh, a, a low uh, uh, tidal volume strategy reduced mortality significantly. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, in this graph, uh, red one, a traditional group, and other one, uh, survival graphic, uh, other one, a low tidal volume group. As a result, in the study, uh, the study was finished early because the mortality difference uh, was confirmed. And additionally, this study revealed the significance low of low tidal volume and low plateau pressure. Uh, so uh, it's, it's now clear that uh, static parameters such as a tidal volume, PEEP, or, or other pressures, and dynamic uh, parameters uh, such as um, respiratory rate, uh, inspiratory and expiratory flow, play an important role in pathophysiology of ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, but uh, relatively new, uh, there is a relatively new concept. Uh, the concept of lung strain and uh, strain and stress. The lung stress um, is related to transpulmonary pressure and, of course, plateau pressure. But the strain uh, concept is a little different because the strain uh, refers to uh, the deformation of lung uh, in response to applying stress. It means uh, the ratio of uh, volume changes uh, to uh, functional residual capacity. Uh, bedside application, uh, the concept can be done, uh, the stress index, and uh, the stress index assessing, uh, you know, a pressure time curve uh, during a constant inspiratory flow. Uh, as you see, the uh, pressure time curve, normal uh, graph, and uh, in this normal graph, stress index equal one, because, uh, because tidal volume uh, is normal and uh, pressures uh, are normal. But uh, if there's an over distension, always tidal volume high and always compliance is low. It is very important because stress index always greater than one. Uh, in this situation, we recommend that reduce tidal volume, reduce uh, PEEP or both of them. And uh, another tidal recruitment graph, stress index uh, less than uh, one, but it's not normal, of course. Uh, it's uh, uh, always PEEP level needs to increase in this situation. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I want to say that basic lung, lung protective uh, interventions include a pressure and volume limited ventilation, uh, frequently high PEEP, and prone position. 
we uh, can use or alternatively and e easily driving pressure on the bed side. Driving pressure is uh, very important and very relatively new because Amato at, uh, at all, uh, in this study, driving pressure was uh, the physical variable, uh, variable with the best correlation with that. Uh, and uh, you see plateau pressure and uh, the difference of a P uh, plateau pressure. Uh, experimental and clinical uh, uh, evidence suggests that driving pressure is more important than plateau pressure. Actually, I, in my mind, this uh, point is very important because uh, we uh, uh, we use a lot of uh, plateau pressure, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, on the daily practice, we should be uh, considered both. Uh, this, uh, in this graphic, you show that uh, protective ventilation history, uh, uh, actually uh, everything start uh, 1974, uh, and plateau pressure less than uh, 30 centim uh, water. And then baby lung concept, permissive hypercapnia, or open lung concept, uh, uh, and then now these parameters uh, we uh, help, help us. Uh, the recent editorial, uh, uh, current evidence and clinical guidelines have determined uh, lung protective strategy. I can say five steps actually. Uh, one of them, low tidal volume, less than six uh, milliliter uh, estimated body weight, uh, then low plateau pressure, and uh, important point, low driving pressure. Always uh, it should be uh, less than uh, 14 uh, centim water. Then, uh, prone position treatment at least, uh, at least half a day, and of course, adequate oxy oxygenation. If uh, necessary, uh, it can be used alveolar recruitment maneuvers. But to date, uh, all, this, uh, all of this, uh, only low tidal volume and uh, prone position has been supported by high level of clinical evidence. Because uh, we know that the uh, prone position was particularly beneficial in a patient ARDS. Uh, after uh, COVID-19 pandemic, prone positioning has become uh, common in uh, non-intubating patients. And uh, you uh, saw uh, that uh, prone position, uh, less mismatch, of course, less compression by the heart. Uh, in this slide, uh, um, I want to say ventilation uh, intensive care unit with ARDS, mild to severe patient, uh, level of PEEP and low uh, driving pressure uh, uh, is very important. But uh, uh, use, of the, uh, use of higher PEEP does not benefit patient without ARDS, it is an important point. Uh, of course, I am uh, also an uh, anesthesiologist, uh, what can we... Uh, um, do, what can we do uh, under general anesthesia patient? Under general anesthesia, uh, we always should a uh, low pre, uh, uh, driving pressure, but PEEP level is um, um, type of operation, depend on type of operation, of course, uh, patient's condition. Um, uh, lastly, I would lo like to uh, need um, a concept patient self-inflicted lung injury. It is very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, the concept is now lung damage is induced by a patient's own inspiratory effort. Um, in fact, uh, patient's inspiratory, inspiratory effort uh, in di daily practice is a good news for us, uh, but uh, the um, uh, inspiratory effort, effort uh, not regulated, it can be harmful. It can be harmful. Uh, Paisley is a dynamic situation, but uh, sometimes can be harmful. Uh, we uh, controlled uh, this situation, invasive mechanical um, ventilation, uh, may use as a um, preventive or a prophylactic uh, treatment uh, in this situation. Uh, finally, uh, uh, I can give you uh, from Paolo Pelosi review 10 golden rules uh, protective ventilation strategies and try to uh, talk about all of them. Uh, as a conclusion, our main goal must be preventing uh, the additional lung injury and protect of normal lung, of course. Patient-specific maneuvers should be performed, in my mind. Thank you for your attention. Wow. Thank you very much, Professor Bashar, for this perfect lecture on ventilation pathophysiology and even in closer time than intended. <laughs> Respect. Very impressive.
Um, so uh, I thank you all for being here. We had a session where we learned about antibiotics, about um, sedation, about uh, critical illness nutrition, and about ventilation. In Germany, to take the specialist exam in intensive care, you have two years to learn that. We did it in one hour, so uh, thanks to you all. And I think we have five minutes for questions or discussion before the next session has to start. Are there any questions or remarks from the audience? Yes, please. Do we have a microphone? This is Slavik, Professor Slavik Katolik from Osijek, Lubelski Hospital. Uh, hello, my name is Slavica Kvolik and I have a question for uh, Professor Markus Huperts. Uh, and my question is, uh, based on your level of evidence, because you are from a high developed country with um, uh, great availability of your own data, uh, can you tell us which sedation uh, should you recommend for ICU um. based on uh, available data, outcomes, and uh, maybe some research. Yeah, I, I don't do research myself on that topic, but to, uh, it's, well, the conclusions were, uh, were the same. Um, we are in a changing management in Germany at the moment. I would say the standard of care in most hospitals is propofol plus uh, opioids, normally sufentanil, sometimes fentanyl. Um, we know that it would be ideal to use remifentanil, but that's a problem of understaffing. Because if you want to use remifentanil, you need a one nurse for one patient. Because if perfuser is empty and you don't have the time to change it quickly, patient will leave the, uh, the ICU on his own feet. Um, so uh, we have a big gap, even in Germany, between the theory, what we know what we should do, and what is done regularly. I completely agree that we should not use uh, benzodiazepines. And we try to implement in the German uh, clinics that if we use benzodiazepines, we give it as a bolus if the nurse needs it. The newest German guideline states that we should use analgesia and no sedation at all, if possible. If we use sedation, propofol for maximum seven days. And dexmedetomidine is a very, very interesting substance, but there have been some limitations uh, published to dexmedetomidine due to uh, adverse outcome in younger patient. It has a problem with bradycardia. It has a problem with hypotension. Um, and so uh, for me, I think in the center of our efforts uh, should be the analgesia, either by opioids or by regional anesthesia. There's a big place for regional anesthesia in intensive care. You know, everybody here knows, I think, uh, that I'm a fan of regional anesthesia, but we can do the trunk blocks, for example, in an in intensive care unit. It's no problem. Um, and the, the other concept is inhalative uh, sedation, which is very, very good. Uh, that we, was my uh, yeah, another we, question. We yeah. use it a lot, but it's nearly a question of belief in Germany. There are people who love it and there are people who hate it. Um, it's no problem with environment because it's absorbed completely. You can even use isoflurane, not sevoflurane, because it's much cheaper. And we use it very often, but most of the, the, um, the, the hospitals in Germany who use uh, inhalative sedation, they use it for polytoxicomanic patients, for patients who, where you put ketamine and propofol and opioids and they don't sleep. And then you put on the, the, the uh, sedaconda and it works perfectly. So I'm a big, I, I nearly use, don't use any gas in the OR, but I love uh, the inhalative sedation on the, on the ICU. But I think um, where we have the biggest gap in Germany, the biggest problem is that our own guideline states we should do analgesia first and mostly no sedation at all, with some exceptions like brain surgery and things like that. Um, and if you go on the wards and have a look in different hospitals, everybody is putting the patients to sleep just because we have a big lack of nurses and the sleeping patient is not so dramatic if something changes as they wake patient. That's the main problem in Germany. Okay. And uh, uh, agree with you because we change in my uh, department on KBC, uh, Rebel in Zagreb. Uh, we never, we for uh, eight years now ago, we don't use um, 
Mi da zelo vedo, da ti jaz pravpopovi jaz čas na konda Severan and Exmeritom Edin. Why is that? Because it can be really, if you turn it off, your patient is awake in a few minutes after Exmeritom Edin, in one minute. And what is new about Exmeritom Edin? Yes, if you if you use it in a low dose. Uh, you will never have this bradycardia or hypotension in, in a patient, but they uh, don't, uh, the exmeritum, they don't change cognitive uh, function, even in a small children, in, in a newborns. So in the future, it will be only sedative drugs who can be, who will be allowed to use in, in, in pediatric patients. What, what, what is important about dexmedetomidine, it's the only drug we have at least low evidence data that it's protective against delirium. We don't have that for any other yeah. drug. Um, and uh, what is, will be the next trend in Germany is probably that uh, brain monitoring will become uh, nearly mandatory as well in the OR as well as in the intensive care unit. Of course, that's a problem of money. But perhaps you heard about the ESAIC uh, Brain Save the Brain Initiative by Joanna Berger, and uh, we will do a, we will have a um, whole day uh, how is it called workshop or uh, boot camp they call it in, in Munich on the ESAIC Congress on Monday. This will be very interesting. I think it will take 10 to 15 years, or even in a rich country like Germany, to implement all that. But the future will probably be drugs like dexmedetomidine um, inhalative and uh, for very invasive ventilation, for example, in a ARDS, you cannot yes. have an awake patient, and you need some sedatives. But I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting development. But the problem is that even in a rich country like Germany, the, the evidence we have is far away from the bad. The, the way from, bad, from benchmark to bad is very long in these questions. So. And uh, just one sub-question, <laughs> because I offered only one. Uh, do you use all of the anesthetics in brain trauma patients? Sorry? Uh, do you use volatile anesthetics uh, for sedation in brain trauma patients? Um, I don't have a neurosurgery. I have a big neurology, and uh, we don't use it uh, in uh, acute uh, brain bleedings, for example, not at the beginning. But this is also a question, a, a topic that is discussed, and uh, I would not say that it's contraindicated anymore. When I was a resident, I had to learn that it's strictly contraindicated as well as ketamine. We know by now that ketamine is not a problem at all. Um, and so I think if you use low levels of sedation, and when we talk about isoflurane or sevoflurane uh, on the ICU, we talk of, of a fourth of the MAC normally. We are, uh, with isoflurane, we are at 0 0.3, 3, 0 0.4, and not at uh, 0 0.8 to 1.2 like in the OR. And probably it's not a problem in Germany in general if you have real brain trauma, you always have a, 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 a probe, a drain to measure the brain pressure, and so you can use it. But if you don't have a, 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 a drain to measure it, I would be careful. Uh, because in the textbooks it's saying something different, yeah. And so if you have a damage, uh, there will be somebody looking in the textbooks and accusing you of doing the wrong thing. Other question? I have one question for you, Marcus. Uh, I was really uh, use PCT uh, for uh, giving uh, uh, antibiotics to a patient, a PCT algorithm, procalcitonin. Um, yeah, yeah. Measuring. We, we, uh, um, we do not decide on giving antibiotics uh, due to the level of PCT. I don't. We well, very rarely use PCT for diagnosis, and it's not recommended in the guidelines. The literature I showed you was about guiding antibiotics and ending antibiotic therapies, not starting it. But if I have a patient where I have clear clinical evidence that, it is, that he or she is septic or septic shock, then we do a PCT normally on the second day, because if the patient is coming on the first day, PCT may not be induced. It needs 19 to 24 hours to induce, P to, to induce PCT, like for CRP. So you have sometimes a lag and you measure it too early. So normally we measure it on the, the patient arrives on the ICU and we measure PCT the next morning. Then we measure it after two or three days um, to see if it's in line with the clinical uh, improvement of the patient. And then we measure it after five days or seven days just to be sure that we can finish the antibiotic course. 
And if you cannot finish the antibiotic course before, because PCT is still high, normally I'm working with uh, surgical patients, uh, it's operative intensive care, normally the focus is not clean. Yeah? They have to do a second look, a third look, whatever. And that's how I use PCT. And uh, like that, you can use it very usefully. It's very helpful to be sure that you end your course. And we very often we end peritonitis uh, antibiotics after five days already because we see that PCT is down to 10% of the first level and then we end antibiotic therapy uh, and we can be very sure that we are doing the right thing and uh, I don't recommend it doing di differently or more often because in Germany PCT is still a very expensive parameter. Uh, we pay more than 10 euros for one PCT test and uh, so don't do it every day. It's, it's nonsense. Don't do CRP every day either yeah, because Half-life of CRP is between 24 and 48 hours, so it's no use measuring it every day. So that's why I, I put the question, because of the money. And how many of you in Macedonia can do PCT testing before and after giving the, mo the antibiotics? Do you have? Not Macedonia. Not Macedonia. <laughs> Turkey? <laughs> Serbia? <laughs> You're not Serbia. <laughs> Okay. Okay. You, you had a question? Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, you know, antibiotic stewardship program, uh, I mean, antibiotic resistance is very important. Uh, my question is related to uh, um, what can I say about that, um, about this um, empiric treatment and colonization because uh, each of uh, e each other uh, very relations, you know? Yeah. That that's, that's a big mm. problem because many people, they, they have a good idea. In, in, in many countries where you have problems with uh, a lot of uh, high-level resistance or multi-drug resistance, um, they do uh, some, uh, how do you say, some swaps when the patient arrives and then pay, they find some MRSA in the groin and then patients develop pneumonia. It's clearly, in Germany, it's clearly stated by all the infectiologists and all the antibiotic experts and I know a lot of them personally that, that doesn't correlate. You don't need to use vancomycin or linezolid for the pneumonia just because you found MRSA in the groin. But there I understand that people are afraid that they say we have to start treatment, we, we, we cannot, the patient is so bad, we cannot allow losing one day or two. Um, so there's two solutions. Either you stop doing the swaps. In Germany, we don't do that, we could, uh, except uh, burn uh, units or something like that. Um, but we don't do it in the general ICUs because we have a very low incidence of multi-resistant drugs compared to other countries. Um, or if you do it and if you have this information, okay, then take samples from the lung, take blood cultures and okay, for God's sake, start with vancomycin. But after, if you have after 48 hours the information that streptococcus pneumoniae, stop vancomycin and give cefazolin or penicillin. Yeah, that's, that's so de-escalation. De-escalation. Uh, do you have any team uh, about an antibiotic resistance team? Yeah, uh, we have an know? antibiotic stewardship team, but uh, my hospital is in a luxury position. That's not the normal. The big hospitals, university clinic, like where my wife works, they all have an infectiological department. That's fine. But the small hospitals, um, they are forced by law to have one ABS uh, guy or girl. Um, but there are four steps of ABS. And what is mandatory is the first step. It's a basic step, it's a 48 hour course uh, in the weekend and you can take four steps to be really an expert. And we have an expert in every department of my hospital and so we reunite four times a year in a group with all the ABS experts and all the hygiene uh, responsibles and we discuss our standards. And I'm the one in our hospital who is interpreting the, uh, the bugs and the resistances we get every year from our laboratory and so we have what I showed you, some guidelines. We have different guidelines for the normal ward, for the intensive care ward, and for perioperative prophylaxis, so that we don't mix up the different things, and I don't want people on normal wards to use tigacycline or something like that. Um, and these guidelines normally are renewed every two years. And if we say that you see there's a big changement, then we have to do it earlier. But this kind of luxury situation, which I was able to implement when I, when I took over in that hospital seven years ago, um, mandatory is to have one ABS uh, specialized person in the hospital um, and it is recommended to have these teams and it's ideal if you have in that team an infectiologist, which I don't have, 
And uh, don't forget to have a pharmaceutical person. That's very, very important because I, sh I showed a little bit in the short time about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and it's much, much more complicated. And I know that from University Clinic of Münster when, when we had pharmacists there, it's very, very helpful. Yeah. I think time is over. Uh, Yes. Uh, I don't know, is Philip here or Vesna or one of the organizers? Because you can stay here. Or, I, I, I cannot take over the Congress. But you have the question. I don't want to uh, test your patience. Thank you very much for, uh, for the uh, opportunity. And first of all, I thank all the presenter uh, colleagues. I just want to ask uh, and I wonder about your idea, uh, Marcus. Uh, you um, directly focused on the treatment itself mm -hmm. because of the time constraint and etc. But I, I want to ask the first uh, step you formalized the stewardship program, uh, the diagnosis, uh, and then uh, designed the empirical uh, antibiotic therapy. Mm -hmm. So my question is regarding on uh, the uh, rapid diagnostic tests, I mean the molecular or uh, uh, m multiplex syndromic panel and uh, do you use it and do you believe it and the second question is regarding to the uh, quasi uh, targeted antibiotic uh, empirical ter therapy you need uh, to see uh, your big picture in your uh, ICU and hospital I mean antibiotic uh, cumulative antibiogram you use it yeah Thank you. The fir first part of the question, uh, it's not standard of care in Germany. There are university clinics testing it in a, in a big style, and I was very impressed when we were at a congress in Banja Luka at the beginning of the year that they have it in uh, Republika Srpska. But one of these tests is around 100 to 150 euros, so nobody is doing it in daily routine. It's for special questions. I don't have it, but I think that's the future, probably, because waiting for a blood culture for 48 hours, that cannot be the end of the story. And second question, yes, of course, in our antibiotic stewardship team, we, we are looking at the development of our uh, bugs, of our resistances, and of the number of antibiotics we use. So uh, recommended defined doses, daily defined doses, and we benchmark ourselves with other hospitals. That's uh, standard in Germany because that's mandatory by law. Uh, I would like to suggest that we can uh, continue our conversation uh, on the lunch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so because it, it's really over time. Thank you a lot.
I know. I know. Don't worry. <laughs> That's my presentation. Yeah. I think we can start. Yeah. There we are. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I know it's an anesthesia a reanimation congress and intensive theatres. I will take for the last part um, to talk about, let me introduce myself first. I'm uh, Arthur van der Del, I'm from the Netherlands and I'm the global clinical marketing for advanced monitoring with our company Gettinger. Um, I'm mainly an educator, so for me it's more in educate you in what is possible with hemodynamic monitoring nowadays. So. When we go over the menu, when you go over the agenda, I will give you a short uh, overview about advanced monitoring and why is flow so important. Pulse couture analysis is one technology of it, and the other one is uh, cardiac output in transpulmonary turbo dilution. Um, I want to explain to you that we should never miss this beat when we're measuring continuously, and why this is so important, but especially that there are other ways to get a complete picture. And this complete picture will make for you right decisions at the moment you are treating your patients on the intensive theater unit. Um, mainly for advanced hemodynamic monitoring on the intensive theaters are septic shock, ARDS. That's where you see our PICO technology coming back in. Cardiogenic shock also and hyper hypervolemic shock, but how do we recognize it, you know, because there are a lot of numbers, there are a lot of parameters, but how can I recognize correctly what kind of patient am I dealing with? And I will show you at the end uh, two simple cases, how you can see in one view to get a quick picture what your patient's situation is. So, it is very important to have these pillars, you know, is it uh, fluid status, uh, is it uh, cardiac contractility? Is it maybe a vascular problem? So when you have an instability, when you know I have an unclear volume status and I've got some therapeutic conflicts, what should I do? What is the best treatment to do? So why flow? Why is flow so important? Well, it's not us, but it's already been in 1961. Arthur Guyton already knew that your blood pressure is of course, very important to use, but it is an auto-regulated system, which means that it does not predict anything what's going to happen. It's just happening when it's there, like a hypovolemic hypertension phase. And he knew that if we have an irreversible sh hemorrhage shock and we're measuring the cardiac output, we can see that it's coming up. And I know there are a lot of AI systems coming up at the moment that predict that it's coming up. Yes, but then, then what are you going to do? Because that's the main question. And you can ask the system AI, what are we going to do? And it doesn't give you an answer. You need to give that answer and you need to get to see that complete picture. That is what is important. So Pulse Couture Analysis Cardiac Output with the PICO technology will give you this overview. It is combined in two techniques. We do have pulse couture analysis, so it is a continuous waveform, and we have transpulmonary thermodilution. And both techniques are pretty old, as I, will let you, as I will show you on the screen here. So, why do we use pulse couture analysis? Why are we using this kind of cardiac output monitoring? For you not missing this beat to see that if you are doing any intervention, that you see the changes are working directly. What is it about? How do we do it? Well, we know that this arterial waveform curve is a continuously measurement that we are doing beat to beat, measuring the diacritic notch. We want to see this diacritic notch, because this diacritic notch will give us, as Otto Frank said, already in 
1899 that if I measure the area under the curve, I know there is flow. This was the first pressure transducer in the world, 1878. That's how long it is. And now, finally, after many, many years, we found out that we can really use it. But there are, of course, some techniques that we have to add to make it complete. So he created this algorithm, and on the bottom you can see CAL, CAL. That's the important issue that the industry and that all the physician has to put on. Can I do something with it and optimize it? So the call will be done here using a transpulmer terminal illusion technique. So when to do this, you always need to have a starting point. You need to start somewhere. That can sometimes be automatic in devices we have, or it can be with a transpulmonary terminal illusion. And if you've got this, then with Otto Frank 1899, we have this continuously measurement until we want to see it. The second thing is transpulmonary terminal illusion. The terminal illusion technique is a technique that has been out there for many years. Meet Stuart, the first person who was responsible for the algorithm in transpulmonary terminal illusion. Um, he saw that if I am creating this curve, I can simulate flow. And he was not talking about blood flow, he was talking about speed in water lines, whatever. So he knew already if I use a special technique as a curve looks like this, I can give you the answer on what the speed is at that moment. And there's another person, Hamilton. So we get the Stuart Hamilton algorithm. Two persons and finally, 1932, they created a circulation. And this gentleman created this algorithm you can see here to create a transpulmonary term illusion measurement. And you probably know this formula from the Swan Guns because it's been started in 1980 and the Pico was from the 1990s. It gives you uh, unbelievable much of information of your patient. This picture, this total picture is important. What is this giving you? Well, if we are doing transpulmonary terminal illusion with a PICO, you will get about, I think, 20 parameters. Too much to handle. But if you take out just three of them, which the most important, of course, is my cardiac output, and the second one is extravascular lung water. We can determine an adequate extravascular lung water parameter, which indicates for you, what should I do with my patient? So, by using this calibration technique and continuous flat technique, I'm getting this complete picture. How does it work? Give you a short overview. With the Pico, you need to have a central line. You need to have a Pico line here because the tip needs to be as close to the left ventricle. And when we are injecting a 20cc cold C line into the patient, it goes from the right part via the lungs to the left part, and then the tip will pick it up. And then the Stuart Hamilton algorithm will come up and create for you a calibrated cardiac output, one of the most accurate cardiac outputs you will get at the bedside. Besides that fact, you will get a lot more information because of other measurements that are in this algorithm. This overview what gives you is, of course, my cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, and then the three determines what is the right. Because as an intensivist at the bedside, you have normally three options. And Professor Manu Malbrin always says to me, listen, I don't have a difficult job as an intensivist. I need to give fluids, I need to give inotropes, I need to give some vasoactive drugs. But if I choose the wrong one, I'm in big trouble. So I need to know the right one. So I need to get a complete picture. And on top of that, he wants to know if it is fluid, I want to be warned if it's safe to give fluid. And that's what the PICO is giving me. It's giving me a cardiac index, it is giving me, of course, stroke volume, heart rate, but then it gives me a volume, how much volume do I have in the heart, how is my ejection fraction, do I need to give inotropes, or what is my vasoactive activities. And on top of that, for the fluid, it will give you extra vascular lung water, including the origin of long water. Well, now, when we see what the most important parameters are on the PICO, 
is, of course, first of all, the cardiac index. The cardiac index that will be calibrated and then automatically continuously calibrating is what you get. And between three and five is more or less normal. But we have been hearing several talks already today, maybe yesterday, about individualizing monitoring. Because for one cardiac output of 2.5 can be fine in maybe a patient that is elderly, or in a young patient, 3.5 is not enough. It's bringing the oxygen to the cells. That's what is important for us. And if we see that this is not adequate, we want to do actions. And main of these actions is giving the patient fluid. But if you give fluid, and the patient is not requesting for fluid, especially in a critical ill patient, you are in trouble. Especially when you don't identify the origin of the illness of the patient. So that's where extravascular lung water comes in. Lung edema is with all of us between a, a, a normal value of 3 to 7. We say everything below 10 mils per, per kilogram uh, square meters is fine. And if you go up to 10 to 15, it's a bit more, and 15 and more means, okay, I have really overextended extravascular lung water. And it has been proven by the graphometric method. We know that this is a validation pretty good. We see here a study from uh, nine, uh, no, let me see, 2018, where we show that this is a validated parameter and equals to this one. The only problem is that this gold standard version is something you do only once, because this is when your patient is dead. And well, this is a bit difficult when we are in the ICU and we don't want to do this to our patients. So we need to find something that gives us the information that we can really act on it. The other one is the origin of extravascular water. And that is, is it a cardiac or is it a non-cardiac problem? Now the cardiac problem, we get a number which is called PVPI, Pulmonary Vascular Permeability Index. One word I know, but it identifies, is it cardiac problem or a non-cardiac problem? Do I have a high static pressure or do I have an osmosis problem? That's why the patient is leaking and I'm getting edema. Now, these two parameters, long edema and PVPI, are very interested. And that has been shown in a clinical evidence study by Professor Takashi Degami from Japan. He created this overview we see here. Now, if you walk with me and you see this patient and you have a patient with a lung edema that is about 15 or 12 or 13, so in the middle, and we have a PVPI of, let's say, one or two, we are in a more or less normal lungs. But when we are going up with the same PVPI, we are going into a cardiogenic shock. And even the other way around, if we see that the PVP goes up to five or six with a lung edema of 20 or more, we are in a severe ARDS state. <coughs> Two parameters tells you where you are with your patient, so you need, is it safe or not safe to give fluid to this patient? Because that's what you want. Yeah, but I got a low blood cardiac output of two, my blood pressure is not really good, okay. But then I see that my lung edema is 20, and I see that my PVPI is six. Well, if you're gonna give this patient fluid, you will run in a lot of trouble, and you will even drown in more. So, to have this information, to have this knowledge, let's get practical. Let's see if you can recognize it for yourself. So, if we have a patient here, and we have a blood pressure 110 over 65, heart rate 140, cardiac output 6.3. Any device can give you this. There are a lot of pulse culture devices out there and tells you, hey, I've got a patient that is probably hyperdynamic. Yes, but is this patient because he is overfilled? Is he underfilled? What is the issue? What is my problem here? Because I don't see much more as this. And maybe there's a similar prediction. Yeah, well, maybe we are getting this in the future. And still, you don't know what to do, and we're not going to wait until this problem occurs. So, when you get a little bit more information, and I'm going to give you more information, here we have no idea, but here we do see it. Here we can look at it, long edema, 22, PVPI 6. Think of the overview as Takashi Degami. Where are we? 
we are in the right top corner. We have dealing, we are dealing here with a severe ARDS patient. One shot at your bedside. That's interesting. And this is what a technology like Pico can help you with during critical ill patients. You don't know what to do. There is uh, uncertainty in volume stages. You need to do something, and this will help you more. Besides the fact we give you more parameters, I leave it there to it, but this is a direct information. Do another one. This one. Again, 1.7. I've got a blood pressure. Still, I see I've got a low cardiac output, maybe no urine output. Uh, the blood pressure is uh, okay, but the heart rate is 100. Still, what is wrong here? What is the problem I'm seeing here? We see that the curve is a little bit flat. It doesn't look really nice. So we need to have more information. We put in a PICO. We measure it. And we see that we have a highly extravascular long water, extreme high 27, and a PVPI of 1, which puts me in the bottom, or on the left top corner, cardiac gene shock. This is why hemodynamic monitoring can help you in the state at your patient, critical ill patient, in the cases you want to see. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, uh, thank you for showing the basics of physical analysis. At what point you can pursue me that I'm not, not over resuscitating the patient with people? Not just take for a while. Can you? You uh, mean having less parameters at your bedside? No. Uh, well, one thing is that we either give uh, water, mm -hmm. then we give vasoconstrictors. Mm -hmm. Okay. We improve everything that by that. When do we need? Do we know that we are over resuscitating the patient? Well, again, let's let's make it clear. Any hemodynamic monitoring is not going to save any patient's life, for sure. So you will always be the person to decide. Now, what is important in this case, for example, is when we see an over station, let's say we don't have a long water of that high 20, but we have long water of 12, just a bit higher. So everyone, okay, it looks like this patient might be a little bit over resuscitated. But I still need to give this patient fluid. Cardiac index is low, low blood pressure, no urine output, and a long edema of 12 or 13. Then it's important to know that you decide, okay, let's give fluid, and maybe do an echocardiography, as we did yesterday in one of the hospitals in Greece, and we saw that there were still some kissing lungs, and we were giving fluid to the patient. Long edema was not increasing, but we know that he needs this fluid and we saw cardiac index changing. So a trending in this matter, and long edema can be used as a trending warning, be careful. And if it's day 12, 13 after your fluid, you know, okay, I can continue. But if you see a jump from 12 to 15, let us stop, it's a different problem. Catecholamines can, oh, sorry, yes. uh, crystalloid of, or colloids could be an option. So it, it is always a choice. It only helps you to quicker identify and treat quicker on your patient. That's the only thing that Pico will help you with. Not telling you anything. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Then I would like to give the word to my co uh, colleague, uh, Paniotis. Um, let's see if we can start up your presentation. There you go. Thank you you want to use this one? Yes. Okay. So it's there. Uh, good afternoon from me as well. Uh, thank you for uh, it's. Uh, I'm uh, I'm proud to be here and be invited in, in your uh, congress. I'm from Greece. I'm a biomedical engineer and I have been working with uh, ventilation and anesthesia, mechanical ventilation and anesthesia for 20 years in this area. 
and um, I'm uh, covering the Southeast Europe region for mechanical ventilation and anesthesia solutions from uh, Gettingen. Uh, actually, most of you may not Gettingen, you may know Mackey, <coughs> critical care. This is the actual factory in Sweden. So the whole portfolio that I uh, represent is produced in this factory in Sweden, which has been also known as Siemens or Elema many years ago. Uh, I'm here today to talk about easy and safe application of low flow anesthesia, which is, it, uh, sounds a little bit trendy and modern. Uh, I will start with the definition. So what is low flow anesthesia? Uh, we know that uh, we do low flow if we have a uh, fresh gas flow below one liter per minute. And if we go even lower below 0 0.5, then we do minimal flow anesthesia. And uh, if we succeed <coughs> to go below 0 0.25, then we have metabolic flow anesthesia. Well, why do we call it metabolic? Because actually with this uh, low flow, we uh, only uh, replace in the uh, rebreathing system the patient uptake. Th th that's and in, in this case, we only give in the closed uh, uh, anesthesia system, only the fresh gas that the patient uses uh, uh, to metabolize his uh, oxygen and take out CO2. Why do we need to use low flow anesthesia? There are three known and proven factors, benefits that uh, is provided by the application of low flow anesthesia. The first one is uh, actually very reasonable. Uh, when we do low flow anesthesia, we maximize the rebreathing part of the uh, gas that goes to the patient. Uh, when we have higher rebreathing, it means that the uh, gas that goes to the patient is, uh, has higher heat because of uh, the expired gas from the patient and also humidity. And in the same time, the more rebreathing we have, we utilize more soda lime. And soda lime, <laughs> chemical react reaction with uh, uh, CO2 retention is giving heat and moisture. So if we have higher rebreathing, we have uh, hotter, let's say, gas and more humid gas going to the patient, which is good because it helps with the mucociliary clearance, so you have less secretions, and you also have a better preservation of pulmonary function. So it's, uh, by default, lowering the flow, you have but, uh, higher temperature and more humidity in your gas, and this is good for the patient. Another important benefit, which is uh, raising uh, more and more nowadays, is the environmental impact of anesthetic agents. Uh, uh, almost all of the uh, volatile agents, we know that they are greenhouse gases, and so I have put in this table to see uh, what is the impact in comparison to CO2? So you see that sevoflurane, desflurane, nitrous oxide, uh, they have a six, 575 more uh, global warming potential than CO2. Sevoflurane, uh, desflurane, 1,526. And not only that, they have higher warming potential, but in the same time, they survive significantly more time in the tropospheric uh, layer of the, uh, of, uh, the atmosphere. Um, this is the reason that uh, in the last uh, European uh, uh, Society of Anesthesia, they de decided, I think that in uh, 2026, it's almost taken decision that this fluorine will be banned, so there w it will not be available. It's not final yet. In, in, in UK, I think they, are, they start to be faster. And uh, I put also this, uh, it's from a white paper that uh, in order to make it more clear to the users of desflurane, uh, uh, the impact that it has when you use it for two weeks in the regular operating room, it, it has the same impact as to drive a gas around the earth. So it's, it's quite high impact. And uh, uh, the last, the third benefit is uh, money, financial, because 
volatile agents, they have a cost. And we know very well that when we reduce the fresh gas flow, we consume less volatile agent because we, are, we reuse the agent that the patient exhales. And roughly, if we reduce the fresh gas flow from three liters per minute to one, we have about 50% less uh, agent delivered, for, uh, consumed by the machine, by the system. Everything is good, so uh, I, I said three benefits, then everyone should use low flow anesthesia and uh, deliver these benefits to uh, our uh, patients and to the administration of the hospital. But there are risks, of course, as everything in life. We have a bad, uh, we have the good part and the bad part as well. So what is the in, uh, two risks that, we in, that are involved with low flow anesthesia? Uh, first one is that we don't have enough uh, sedation level on our patient because we do not give so much sedation. And the other one is to give less oxygen, of course. Uh, why? Because we, when we maximize their breathing, we have the, uh, what we call the dilution effect of rebreathing. And I, I put this uh, slide to explain this. So usually, in, uh, this is uh, a breathing system, rebreathing system of our uh, anesthesia machine but it is valid for any anesthesia machine uh, available in the market. So we have the, this rebreathing device, the volume reflector, but you could replace this with, a, with bellows, with piston, with turbine, whatever is available, it's the same. So in every uh, rebreathing system, we have the fresh gas flow that is decided by the user. So you set how much oxygen and how much anesthetic agent you need in the fresh gas. Uh, and then this gas uh, meets the rebreathed gas from the patient and forms the gas that is finally delivered to the patient. So now, what is uh, by nature valid is that the rebreathed gas from the patient has always lower oxygen concentration and lower anesthetic agent concentration from the fresh gas. Why? Because it is the fresh gas but we have removed the patient uptake, so it is always lower. As a result, if I maximize the flow from the, re the breathed gas and minimize the flow from the fresh gas, I will actually dilute faster the O2 concentration and the anesthetic agent concentration that I set in my anesthesia machine. Okay, and uh, this is the major risk that I have to be alert and be careful when reducing the flow very much to verify that this dilution effect do not uh, lead me to deliver to the patient hypoxic mixture or a mixture with a, a quite low anesthetic agent. Uh, to uh, deal with these uh, risks, we have introduced with our machine a mode which we call automatic gas control. Uh, and uh, this mode actually, what it does, uh, instead of setting the uh, oxygen that we want to have in the fresh gas and the agent concentration that we want to have in the fresh gas, we set the targets. The targets, what we need to be delivered to the patient. How much oxygen and how much agent we want to have at the end tidal concentration, which is equal to the uh, alveolar concentration. So uh, by setting these targets, we control directly what oxygen goes to the patient, not in the fresh gas, the result, what I showed before, okay? And end tidal is actually the directly connected with the MAC, with the sedation level that we have to, uh, on, uh, to our patient. Uh, what does it look like in the user interface? So in a modern <coughs> anesthesia machine, you have uh, three settings about your uh, anesthesia delivery. You have how much fresh gas flow, uh, how much oxygen should be inside in this fresh gas flow, and how much uh, agent. In older machines, you could probably set 
how much uh, flow of air and how much flow of oxygen, uh, oxygen, and the result would be the same, okay? This is an electronic frescas mixer, which is a bit modern. So we change this with target of inspired oxygen, not fresh gas, inspired, what goes to the patient directly, target of entitled sevoflurane concentration, and we also have a speed in our uh, system. The speed uh, gives you the possibility to alter how, how much uh, economy the machine should do. So the speed is connected with the entitled sevoflurane concentration. The O2 target is always on, uh, on the highest priority. But uh, the, if you set a low speed, then the machine will, and you change your anti-idal sevoflurane concentration, the machine will not increase the flow, will just meet the target later on. I, I have this uh, slide here. So it's a, a tool to plan your workflow. If you want to wake up your patient fast, you will increase the speed, the machine will stop the rebreathing, will uh, increase the fresh gas to meet their target as, as fast as possible. And you have also in your uh, screen how much time you need to meet the target after making any changes you make. Uh, this solution has been in the market now for uh, nine years, from 2015, and we have, it's documented by a lot of uh, centers in the world, in, uh, UK, in Belgium, in France, in Italy, in Greece as well. There is a publication that we save a lot of uh, anesthetic drug when we use this type of uh, solution. I separately put this paper that was published by a center in Belgium and they measured that uh, uh, agent consumption was re reduced by 58% when using this type of anesthesia delivery in comparison with the traditional control uh, by the user. Um, I put a patient case to show you how it is in real, so what do you see in, in your screen? So this is uh, a regular uh, start of, uh, a, f of a procedure with uh, general anesthesia. You start with uh, manual ventilation, you bag your patient, to verify that you have secured your airway and uh, uh, that you are ready to, sh to shift to, to his switch to uh, automatic ventilation. You start with a high fresh gas flow, seven liters per minute, 80% for example, uh, uh, concentration and, and you may start to give agent from manual or maybe later when you switch to uh, the mechanical ventilator, the automatic mode. Uh, when you switch to the uh, ventilator, then the machine changes to the speed, the target of oxygen, and the target of uh, agent concentration. And you have a visual indication uh, of what the system decides to use to meet the targets that you want. So it starts with 5.8 total fresh gas flow and a, a mix of oxygen and air to and sevoflurane consumption to meet the target. And after a few minutes, uh, your uh, target uh, is close to be met and the machine starts to reduce the fresh gas. And uh, when you have your uh, target met, then the, machine will, the system will start to measure what is the patient uptake and will gradually reduce your fresh gas flow to deliver only what is needed to contribute in the rebreathing system, the O2, oxygen, and the agent concentration to maintain your targets. And uh, so you see it's 11 minutes after the initiation of the procedure and you have 0 0.6 fresh gas flow uh, if you see how much several rain is uh, consumed, it's uh, two mLs per hour, and uh, per minute, sorry. And if, if you see before with a 5.8, uh, it's, I cannot see from there, but it's significantly higher. Uh, as a bottom line, uh, we know that a low flow anesthesia is good, three benefits. 
better temperature and humidity in the gas delivered to the patient, financial benefit because we save money through less consumption of agent and significantly less environmental impact. So, and so this solution enables you to deliver and apply with your patients low flow anesthesia by focusing to all the other things that probably you might find helpful with your monitors, with your blood pressure, and you have your O2 level, oxygen level, and sedation level taken care of automatically by the machine, and in the same time, uh, reducing the fresh gas flow as much as possible so that you are efficient. So it's a peace of mind, and in the same time, giving uh, time for you to treat other problems of your patients. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. I think my voice is loud enough. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. I hope they can hear you, not me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I'm a big fan of low flow anesthesia. I'm an expert in low flow anesthesia since more than 20 years. Okay. In the UK, I started that, and we have a low flow anesthesia society. So, for everyone, low flow is a must. Okay. Whether you believe in the environment, what will happen, which is the most important one, in my opinion, or because you're looking to save money, which is important, especially in uh, Macedonia and Egypt, where I am originally from. I came from the UK to Dubai, and in the UK we don't have a lot of uh, Mackay. Okay. So I went to Dubai in a brand new hospital and it was all Mackay. So I introduced myself to the machine, and as I am a low flow user, then I started to bring the Mackay people to see how they can achieve a low flow. Mm -hmm. And I told them, at that time, since that time, because I've been with them, with the high people in uh, Mackay and getting group, many times about what you were saying. So let me explain things to people to make the best use. Number one, the machine as a Mackay is an excellent machine. And in the UK, we have Draeger and uh, GE more commonly. I said Draeger and GE are like Mercedes and uh, BMW. For me, Mackay was a Rolls Royce. So it's better than them. So this is number one. So I'm not against, uh, mm -hmm. I'm saying it's the Rolls Royce. It's how you use and how you actually try to use low flow. For people like me who started low flow and became expert in low flow, we use much lower flow than you suggest. Than usual. The automatic gas control is good for younger generation who are starting to use low flow for the first time. So it's like an automatic car. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm driving an automatic car. I don't need to learn how to, to do the things. And I will drive and it will go. But... What you mentioned, that there are two disadvantages. Mm -hmm. There are no disadvantages at all with low flow. You said number one, to reach the target, and it might be... Uh, uh, yeah, to reach the target, you cannot achieve your target, so you're giving low concentration, or you're in the threat of awakening, mm -hmm. or... Low sedation level. Yeah, this is absolutely wrong, because... You know when you use low flow, I use 0.3 liter per minute. That's my standard. From the start till the end of any operation. Mm -hmm. How much I save, much better than you save. You said here, two mils per minute. Yes. It means 120 mils. I have done operations and I have the patient here and the operation. 13 hours operation, I used 65 mils of sevoflurane. That's true. In 13 hours. And I was not at any minute in a threat of low mm -hmm. or uh, awakening 
or hypoxia. Mm -hmm. And that's again something they insist. Actually, uh, they started the um, hypoxia prevention mm -hmm. in their machine. I told them, you don't need to do that. It's not useful at all. Because what you want to do is you can set your fresh gas flow to 100% oxygen. Because you know that when you start with 0.3, you will never achieve 100% FiO2. So if I achieve 90, 80, 70, fine. At the end of the 13 hours operation, I am setting it on 100 all the time, and it will reach, as you are saying, now it will be 60. Mm -hmm. So my advice is that for people to use low flow, number one, it's a must. Whether you look at the environment, which is our responsibility to our children and the grandchildren, so it's a must, or where you are looking at cost saving, if you are using low flow, you can convince your management that every year you can have a new anesthetic machine by saving... By the money that you save. The money that you save. So they cannot argue with you that you should use the old machine. No. I should use the new machine because I'm saving the environment and I'm saving you lots of money. You know, I went to this hospital in Egypt where I have a new machine, brand new. And they still use the same high flow. Five minutes of high flow will destroy my anesthetic. So I showed them. And the management down, they were questioning, are we using this? You know how much they charge the patient of sevoflurane per hour? How much? 40 mils sevoflurane. I have done 13 hours with 65. How much money I saved? Too that. much money. Hmm. So you are safe. You can control it. If you are new to that, you can use the automatic gas flow to make your life easier. But it is very easy. It is very simple. What you need to do as companies is to teach the people how to do low flow safely, mm -hmm. not by talking, just to bring the machine and to show them. It's very simple and very easy. And the next day, they will be all able to use a very low flow. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes. I don't know if it works. Thank you very much for your presentation, and also I want to thank to uh, Dr. Uh, your name, I for the, his great uh, idea for yes. the uh, low flow. I, I am coming from Turkey, uh, and I am the president of Turkey Society of Anesthesiology. Uh, I have been uh, holding courses for low flow anesthesia uh, since uh, 2018. I believe that if we do not show how it can be done point three in the operation room, uh, it is not easy to change the habits because all of the anesthesiologists are uh, warning about the hypoxia, hypercapnia, but as he said, as he mentioned, it is very easy. It is safe and cost effective and also we should have to uh, think our uh, next generations, children's, to give them a liable board. So, I advise uh, all the countries to hold courses, workshops. yeah, workshops, courses, but these courses must be held on the operating room, not on the machines, because we, show, we must show them how it can be done. Practically. Practically, yes, practically. Uh, up to now, we, uh, hold, we hold about 35 courses, and the last courses was supported by Getinga. Okay. Uh, they just joined us. Uh, we have been uh, uh, we have been holding these courses by uh, draggers, and it is easy to uh, uh, to use low flow anesthesia with dragger. But only I want to uh, share my experience. If you are using blow machines with blow, 
it, uh, uh, it used the carrier gas is used to uh, movement of the below move the bellows below bellows so it is not easy to uh, apply 0.5 uh, low flow if the mention with below thank you very much for your presentation thank you thank you <laughs> any other question Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank Enjoy you your lunch. <laughs> thank you very much for your time.
добър ден. Еве, значи, може да отпочнеме деветата сесија на менета а, за утра, перспективи на утра сам. Го поканувам првиот гостин, доктор Иван Величкович, да ја презентира својата презентација за фокус и преекламсија. Чуи се, баши. Дали е ефект? Вич се пусти, баши. Is there anyone who prefers the lecture to be in English? That's not an issue with me? Okay. Okay. Meni je potpuno... Što sam rekao milijon puta, meni je potpuno sve jedno na kom jeziku pričam. Znači... Sad ćemo da vidimo sa ovim... Page down. Je ovo za pomeranje... Nije. Стрелице горе доле, важи. Оп, ту смо. Важи. Очини. То е уреду. Само ще може видите за активацију видео. Е, па да почнемо. Значи, пациент има 30 година, статус G1, G1, P0, A sa status 3, bez alergija, 160 cm, 73 kg. Kod nas se sad ne zove više sivr preeklamsija, nego se zove preeklamsija sa sivr feature, znači sa veoma ozbiljnom preeklamsijom. Trombociti 214, pacijent neće da ide kroz porođaj, znači idemo za carski rez, ali... U trenutku kad se spremam da idem u sobu da vidim pacijenkinju, ginekološki rezident dolazi i kaže čujem na plućima da ima šušnjeve, nemojte da joj dajete suviše tečnosti. Mi se taman spremamo da uguram, oni izlaze iz sobe, da je guraju operacijnu salu. Ja kažem pa ja sam se spremao da uradim pokus s I ona i na moje veliko zapripašćenje hirurg kaže, ne, ne, ajde da se vratimo da oni završe pokus pregleda. Rekao, dobro, baš. A ako smo došli do toga da se sad na nas čeka, nema problema. E, kako da ja sada ovo aktiviram? Samo na... E, 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 dobro. Znači, parasternal long axis, da vidimo kako je puno srce ili nije puno srce. Svi Samo neki ako može. Da bi ipak mogli da pokažemo snimke, sad ćemo da vidimo. E, to je već mnogo bolje. Znači da vidimo ovaj snimak. Pa dobro, parasternal long axis, kontraktilnost, nema problema, vidi se pomalo. Parasternal short axis. E, tu se već vidi mnogo pristojnije. Znači vidimo levu komoru. Vidimo da se kontrakuje kako valja i vidimo da je ekcijona frakcija poprilično velika. Ovo meni liči da je pacijent, što mi kažemo, na dry side, znači na suvljoj strani. A s obzirom da smo morali da gasimo svetlo za onaj prethodni snimak, mislim da nije nikakav problem da... Ovo sam ja po drugi put uradio parasternal long axis. Znači ako neće po prvi put i ako se ne vidi, ovde možete već... Mnogo bolje da vidite parasternal long axis, znači ništa nije sramota ako ga po prvi put ne uhvatite. Uradite drugi nalaz pa se ponovo vratite i ovde se već 
vidi da nema nikakvih problema na zaliscima, nema perikardijalne efuzije i vidimo da je pacijent na suvljoj strani. Apical four chamber. Znači još jedno vidimo relativnu veličinu leve komore, desne komore, ne, desna komora je 0,6 u odnosu na levu komoru, to je znači potpuno normalno, nema nikakvih intrakardijalnih masa, ne vidimo nikakvih zadebljanja, mapsi, tapsi izgledaju sasvim ok. Right upper quadrant, znači ja idem da pogledam jetru i bubrek, međutim kako ja pođem malo naviše sa right upper quadrant, eh, ali vidite u ovom zadnjem sekundu da se pojavile B linije odmah iznad right upper quadranta i onda samo znači nastavljam gore u right postero lateral area i pogledajte, ovo je znači u, u bazilarnim područjima pluća apsolutno je jasno da pacijent ima B liniju. To je znači znaci extra vascular lung water. Idemo na left upper quadrant, znači tu se vidi opet slezina i bubreg, samo da vidimo, da bome. I, I ovde isto sada kad pođem na gore, ovo izgleda malo bolje nego sa desne strane, ali kad i kod ove preeklamptične pacijentkinje pogledamo, znači sa desne strane je bilo više B linija nego što ima sa, sa leve strane, ali i sa leve strane se vide B linije. I onda na kraju uzmem i stavim tamo gdje ne bi trebalo uopšte da ih bude, to je znači right anterior chest sa desne strane. Znači ja ovdje, ovo je možda pojedinačna B linija, ne vidim, ne vidim B linije. Jer mi je vrlo važno da znam da li da dam više tečnosti ili manje e, tečnosti. Meni je pacijent ovdje izgledao na hipovolemičnoj strani na osnovu kontraktilnosti srca, ali plus ima B linija što daje sukob u tome šta je najbolje uraditi za pacijenta. Carski rez bez ikakvih problema, s obzirom da smo mi teaching institution, to je trebalo 86 minuta, anestezija vreme 137 minuta, to tako ide obično, gubita krvi 850, 130 urina i dali smo 2,4 litra i dosta je trebalo, baš izgledalo u operacijnoj sali kao da nam je hipovolemičan pacijent. Sada se nalazimo u recovery. Kad smo već u recovery room, ajde da ponovo uradimo pokus. Zašto da ga ne uradimo ponovo? Znači, parasternal long axis, ono što smo videli i ranije, znači podjednaka veličina sa desne strane desne komore, left ventricular outflow tract, levog atriuma, nema razlike u veličini, kontraktilnost vidimo da je relativno dobra. Meni ovdje srce deluje malo punije, da smo, deluje mi malo bolje nego pre nego što smo otišli u operacijnu salu kad je reč o intravaskularnom volumenu. Parasternal short axis, znači vidimo da se leva komora simetrično kontrahuje ili pomalo vidimo, znači šta je rješenje? Pa rješenje je ponovo uraditi, kao što smo i ponovo uradili, znači ništa, ja, ja bar mislim da nije sremota ništa ako na tih prvih 10 sekundi ne uspemo da nađemo, da ponovo pustim a, a, probu i da ponovo snimim. Ovo meni deluje, pacijent mi deluje malo punije nego što je delovao pre nego što smo pošli u operacijnu salu, da smo uradili malo fluid resuscitation. Apical four chamber, nema neke, barem po meni, nema neke veće razlike u odnosu na a, vreme pre nego što smo pošli u operacijnu salu. S obzirom da smo, je bebica izvađena, sada već može i subkostalni view da se uradi. Vidimo koliko a, mapsi i tapsi kako se pomeraju, to su znači indikatori funkcije leve i desne komore, da je kontraktilnost i sa desne i sa leve strane e, dobra. Ovo sam prezentirao u Novom Sadu i 
kažem, da bacimo pogled na IVC, inferior vina kjeva. I znači da pitam ovde, ako neko hoće da mi kaže, šta je ovde problem sa IVC? Ja mislim da je 99% da ovo i nije IVC. Ja mislim da ovo nije IVC. Po meni ovo ima veće šanse da bude aorta nego IVC. Po meni ovo mi vrlo sumnjičevo deluje da je ovo IVC. Tad kad sam gledao, tad sam mislio da jeste, a sad kad gledam, meni ovo baš i ne deluje da je ovo IVC, jer jetra je mnogo više odvojena od ovoga. Tako da u Novom Sadu su mi očutali. A ja trenutno mislim da je najsigurnije kad vi tražite IVC da donesete odluku da se prošetate sa probom da vidite i aortu i IVC, to će vam lakše. Ne da nađete jedan krvni sud pa da na osnovu njega mudrujemo da li je to IVC ili aorta, nego oba dva krvna suda pronađite, to će značajno da poveće šanse da ste našli zaista IVC. Meni iz ovog ugla mi možda čak više deluje na aortu nego na IVC, ali je, znači, dokle god ukapiramo da smo nešto loše uradili, nije kasno da se popravimo. Pošto je tu bio i specializant, onda ajde da uradimo i da pogledamo stomak ovde, gastric antrum. Mislim da se ovde prilično jasno vidi da je ovde prazan stomak kod... Gde je? Gde se ovde pritiska? Ovde? Aha. Opa, ali ovde može... Paži. Evo ga. Znači, gastric antrum se vidi. Ne da nam nešto treba, ali tu je bio i specializant. Ne, ne vidite vi kursor. Dobro. Pa evo, gore kod jetre se znači vidi. Jeste. Jeste. Međutim, sada idemo na ono, na što kažu ljudi, mani šoc. Znači, pluća sa desne strane posterolateralni na bazama pluća. Šta možemo da vidimo ovde? Bar po meni ovo je mnogo više B linija nego što je bilo pre odlaska u operacijonu savu. Znači, ovo je po meni više. To je znači posterolateral sa leve strane. Znate da je bila samo jedna sa leve strane. E pa ovo mi ne deluje kao da je samo jedna. Znači, iako je ovo malo bolje nego što je sa... Sa desne strane ovo je mnogo više nego što je bilo pre nego što smo ušli u salu. I ovo je right anterior, znači ovo je sada tamo gde bi najmanje trebalo da ih ima u podignutim delovima pluća. Međutim i tamo gde bi trebalo najmanje da ih ima, to su sve znaci of extra vascular lung water. Normalno mi smo rekli kiruzima da je pacijent ima određeni stepen pulmonarije dima, oni su normalno odmah su skočili. I uradili su chest x-ray, da znači pacijent je bolestan, jer to je znači otprilike koliko znaju hiruzi. Ja lepo odem kući i kako sam otišao kući, tako počnu da mi javljaju specializanti da dolazi do pada urine output na pacijentni. Evo ovde možete da vidite da je u jedan sat popodne bilo 25 na sat, pa 10, pa 10, pa 10. I znači obaveštavaju me da pacijent ima decrease urine output i onda znači šta da radimo sa pacijentkinjom. Znači šta mi znamo da se dešava? Znamo da je pacijentkinja ima sivr prije klamsi ili prije klamsija sa sivr features. Znamo da mi je meni delovala hipovolemično. Znamo da smo dali fluids i znamo da je nalaz na plućima loši nego što je bio nalaz ranije. Znači, da li smo suviše dali tečnosti ili nismo dali dovoljno tečnosti. Normalno, hiruzi su odmah prestravljeni i ajde da pacijentkinji je urađen izvaničan transtoracijalni eko od strane kardiologa koji je bio u okviru normalnih granica. I kad sam ja radio anketu među kolegama, da li trebamo da damo LASIX ili trebamo da damo FLUIDS, kako da rešavamo smanjenje urinarnog outputa, otprilike je bilo pola-pola. Pola su bili za LASIX, pola su bili 
da dajemo tečnost. E dobro, nije ništa strašno. Znači, ako čovjek nešto ne zna, uvijek mora da pita. Ako nekog smatra da neko zna bolje, pitam ja Klemensa Ortnera, da li, šta treba da se da pacijentu? Da li treba da se da Lasix ili treba da se da još uh, fluids? Ono što mi je Klemens rekao da treba da se radi, to je znači poruka koju želim da, znam, da, da prenesem. Klemens je rekao da mi zaista ne znamo u ovom trenutku na kom delu Frank Starlinovog krivulje se nalazi pacijenkinja. Da li se pacijenkinja nalazi na uzlaznom delu i ako damo tečnosti da će doći do povećavanja kardijačnog outputa ili se nalazi na ravnom delu gde dodavanje tečnosti neće dovesti do pojačavanja kardijačnog outputa. E pa kako da znamo na kom delu Frank Starlingove krivulje? Pa Clemens je bio da se radi nešto prema ovoj studiji koju sam vam dao ovde koja se zove a, 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 leg raising test, odnosno test podizanja nogu. A šta je to? Pa da uradimo VTI, odnosno kardijačni output, ali dovoljno je VTI da se uradi velocity time integral pre, pre eksperimenta, pa da onda podignemo noge pacijenkinji i kad se podignu noge pacijenkinji odjednom dolazi do davanja, te, do davanja tečnosti i do povećavanja venous return i da onda uradimo VTI da vidimo da li je došlo do povećavanja kardijačnog outputa. I ako se poveća kardijačni output, znači da je na uzlaznom delu Frank Starlingove krivulje i znači da treba da dajemo tečnosti. A ako podignemo noge, pa znači povećamo količinu tečnosti, ali VTI ostaje normal, ne menja se VTI, ne povećava se, onda smo na ravnom delu Frank Starlingove krivulje i znači davanje tečnosti ne treba i treba da damo LASIX pacijenki. To je za mene tada bio novi koncept, ali sam to želao vama da prezentiram, da vidite kako mi sada koristimo point of care ultrasonografi da bi doneli odluke kada može da bude teško ili komplikovano da donesem, da donesem odluke bez informacija sa ultrasvuka. Hvala na pašnju. Znači, prašanja tako sledat posle završivanja na sesiju. Sega ja pokanovam, doktor Nada Pečić, da go da prezentira svojata prezentacija v smisla na patološki znaci v pri pokus preglede. Dobar dan, drage koleginice, kolege, prijatelji. Velika mi je čast i zadovoljstvo što sam danas ovde. Hvala organizatorima na pozivu i ovoj privilegiji da budem deo ovog važnog anesteziološkog sastanka. Mi već svi znamo da je pokus važna veština svih anesteziologa i da ima svoje značajno mesto u perioperativnom pristupu. Odavno nam je već poznato koliko može biti od koristi u uslovima traume, ali i kod kardiopulmonalne reanimacije. Zaista ima puno referenci koje nas podržavaju da svakodnevno koristimo pokus, preporuke kako treba edukovati osoblje da radi pokus, kako treba organizovati trening. Međutim, još uvek mi koji smo početnici u svemu tome, mi smo našli meru kako da ocenimo koji nam je u stvari pokus nalaz važan, a koji pokus nalaz i nije toliko bitan za situaciju u kojoj se nalazimo i kako sa tim dalje da se nosimo. Sa svakim pogledanim, iskust, sa svakim pogledanim pacijentom naše je iskustvo i veština rastu. I posle nekog vremena mi već potpuno možemo da budemo samouvereni kada procenjujemo veličinu srčanih šupljina, kada procenjujemo kontraktilnost ventrikula. Međutim, kad se pojavi nešto na valvulama, što nije očekivano i što menja onaj očekivani nalaz kod njih, tu se postavlja pitanje 
koliko u stvari ta promjena zaista može da utiče na hemodinamiku mog pacijenta perioperativno. I znamo da je prvi korak u proceni valvularne funkcije u stvari eyeballing, slobodna procena okom. Ona nam omogućava da procenimo i morfologiju i mobilnost samih valvula, da uglavnom ih vidimo kao tanke, dobro pokretne, kompletno se otvaraju, tačka kooptacije je negde u srednjem položaju. I šta je još bitno? Posebno je bitno da vidimo da li ima nekih masa lezija koje su povezane sa samim valvularnim listićima, jer bi nam to bio neki znak postojanja endokardita koji i tekako može da ugrozi našeg pacijenta. I evo ja ću vam ovdje prikazati nekoliko naših pacijenata koji su tako odstupali od nekog potpuno normalnog nalaza. Znači ovdje nam je jedan parasternalni long axis prikaz i vidimo i levu predkomoru i levu komoru i desnu komoru i aortnu i mitralnu valvulu i dok šupljine izgledaju urednih veličina, kontraktilnost prilično očuvana, mitralnu valvulu kad pogledamo vidimo, znači evo je ovdje mitralna valvula, Vidi se da su tanki listići, da su dobro pokretni, da se kompletno otvaraju, znači mitralna valvula stiže skoro do septuma, koaptira u nekom srednjem položaju i to je sve u redu. A kad bacimo pogled na aortnu valvulu, znači kad ovdje pogledamo, šta nam je u stvari tu? I ona se vidi da je tanka i da se dobro otvara, međutim u bazalnom delu imamo neki hiperehogeni odjek. Jasno je da taj hiperehogeni odjek ne zatvara prolaz valvule. Znači, jasno je da nemamo ozbiljnu aortnu stenozu. I to može ići dalje na hiruški zahvat. Nego koliko je to bitno u stvari za stanje našeg pacijenta i da li ukoliko ga dalje uputimo možemo da sprečimo, da preveniramo neku progresiju njegove bolesti ili već kako. Da je pogledamo iz drugog ugla. Imamo short axis parasternal, aortna valvula nam je u središtu slike i lepo se vidi. Ona se otvara, znači nema nikakve stenoze, ali i dalje vidimo da je valvularni prsten prilično zadebljao, kalcifikovan, izmenjen i zato tražimo ekspertsko mišljenje kardiologa, pošto ga ja nemam, za detaljnu procenu nalaza. Ovo je, kao što možete da vidite, jedan vrlo loš snimak. Kad se zamislite, prepoznat ćete da je parasternal long axis, međutim, optimizacija na nivou pre početka. Ovo je jedan od mojih prvih nalaza, ali i toliko sam bila srećena što sam spazila da postoje promjene na valvulama, da mi uopšte nije palo na pamet da bi možda trebalo da je optimizujem, da se nalaz bolje vidi. U svakom slučaju tu nam odmah pada u oči aortna valvula. Imamo potpuno izmenjenu i anatomiju i geometriju aorte, kako kažu stručnjaci. Vidimo da su listići aortne valvule jako zadebljali i da se skoro uopšte ne pomeraju. Ova valvula se skoro uopšte ne otvara. Dakle, da je ovo bio moj pacijent za hirurgiju, ja bez kardiologa ne bih išla dalje sama, eventualno uz neki invazivni monitoring, ali ovo meni izgleda da se skoro uopšte ne otvara. Međutim, to je bio neki random pacijent, samo za vežbanje očiju. Tako da nisam došla u tu dilemu šta sa ovim pacijentom i kako. A kolegama nije bilo interesantno da sad rade kardiološko ispitivanje, pošto pacijent neće biti hiruški lečen, tako da je to ostalo nepoznato za mene kakav je nalaz ovoj bakici bio. I evo ovdje jedan sličan valularni problem, imamo apical four chamber view i dok 
je očito da je ova leva komora malo dilatirana i da se malo slabije kontrahuje. Desna komora deluje očuvane veličine kontraktilnosti. Trikuspidne valvole se ne vide baš najbolje, ali solidno mrdaju i lepo mrda trikuspidni prsten. Međutim, mitralna valvola nije onakva kako ja očekujem da je vidim i da kažem isključeno postojanje patologije na mitralnoj valvoli. Smanjena kontraktilna funkcija, u prilog tome ide i ovo nepotpuno pomeranje prednjeg mitralnog listića prema septumu, znači on ne doseže do septuma koliko bi trebalo, ali se bar pomera dok se ovaj zadnji mitralni listić skoro uopšte ne pomera vrlo nešto malo. Dakle, šta je suština? Suština je da običnom eyeball tehnikom, dakle samo gledanje svojim očima, mi možemo da spazimo najveći deo valvularnih promjena kod naših pacijenata. I da ukoliko ne možemo da isključimo ozbiljniju patologiju na njima, u redu je sasvim da zatražimo pomoć ultrazvučnog eksperta. I zašto je to u stvari bitno? Bitno je da razlikujemo da postoje tri kategorije promjena valvula koje su bitne zbog kliničkog uticaja, odnosno zbog uticaja na kliničku manifestaciju u perioperativnom toku. I to su tri kategorije, devastirajuće lezije, značajne lezije i incidental wild findings, što bismo rekli ni slučajno pronađeni nalazi. U svakom slučaju, ove devastirajuće lezije, kao što sam naziv kaže, su vrlo ozbiljne i mogu da budu životno ugrožavajuće i moramo blagovremeno da ih identifikujemo i što pre lečimo. To je ozbiljna mitralna regurgitacija u akutno dakle, novonastaloj situaciji, ozbiljna aortna regurgitacija i sam endokarditis, koji smo malo prepominjali. Dakle, ovakva akutna stanja vidjet ćemo uglavnom u ishemijskom miokardnom događaju, dakle, u nekom infarktu kada dođe do rupture papilarnog mišića ili aortnu regurgitaciju kod disekcije aorte, Vrlo redko se dešavaju traumatske povrede valvula koje će uzvesti naše pacijente u jedno ovako ozbiljno stanje. I ponovo endokarditis kao entitet kojeg ja bar ranije nisam bila svesna da može tako ozbiljni problem da nam nanese jer ga nismo regularno mogli da vidimo i tražimo u svakodnevnom kliničkom radu. Značajne, important lezije valvula su u stvari umerena da ozbiljna aortna stenoza, ozbiljna mitralna stenoza, hronična ozbiljna mitralna regurgitacija, ozbiljna trikuspidna regurgitacija i sem sistolni prednji sistolno pomeranje mitralne alvule, ne znam kako smo mi to preveli na naš jezik, u svakom slučaju, ove lezije bi trebalo prepoznati, moramo ih biti svesni da postoje, one neće akutno ugroziti našeg pacijenta, ali ukoliko imamo kardiopulmonalno smanjenu rezervu, onda naš pacijent može razbiti ozbiljnu hemodinamsku nestabilnost. Tako da imamo vremena za razmišljanje, da li naši pacijenti imaju ove promene i kako ćemo ih zbrinuti. I na kraju dolazimo do ovih slučajnih nalaza, incidental valve findings, u koje spadaju sve ostale promene na valvulama. Uglavnom su to one zvanično opisane kao fiziološki nalaz ili trace to milk. Dakle, neki minimalna promjena na valvulama. 
Šta je bitno? Najveći deo naših pacijenata uopšte neće imati nikakve promene na valvulama. Međutim, od svih tih pacijenata koji imaju bilo kakvu promenu na valvulama, najveći broj pacijenata imaće upravo ovakve minimalne i nevažne promene. I to je bitno da prepoznamo koje su ove promene, da u nekim kritičnim situacijama ne bismo gubili vreme na slučajni pokus nalaz koji je potpuno nebitan za našeg pacijenta. Znači, moramo da znamo na šta ne smemo da gubimo vreme, naročito u kritičnim situacijama kada je to od životnog značaja za naše pacijente. I šta je tu još bitno? Color Doppler kao druga stepenica u proceni valvularne funkcije je složenija priča i nećemo se tu sada zadržavati, ali ovdje će nam dati neku informaciju o tome koliki je stepen oštećenja valvula. I sama ta frakcija, odnosno veličina regurgitacijone frakcije ne mora da bude značajna. Kao i kod nakupljena perikardijalnog izliva. Bitna je brzina kojom se nakuplja tečnost u perikardijalnom izlivu, odnosno bitna je brzina kojom se razvija problem na valvulama. U akutno nastalim, novonastalim situacijama i mala količina regurgitacijone frakcije može biti devastirajuće za pacijenta i može ga uvesti u životno ugrožavajuću situaciju. Međutim, naš pacijent može da ima i ogromnu regurgitacijonu frakciju, ali je to neko hronično stanje koje traje mesecima, odnosno godinama i u ovom trenutku ta zastrašujuća velika regurgitacijona frakcija njega uopšte ne ugrožava. Znači, nije samo ni da detektujemo promene, nego da budemo svesni koliko brzo te promene nastaju. Znači, još jedno, devastirajuće, značajne i slučajne promene, slučajno otkrivene promene na valvulama. Moramo da mislimo o njima, jer devastirajuće moramo hitno da prepoznamo uzročnika i da tretiramo, a ove incidentalne da pustimo da budu tu gde jesu, jer nam u našem perioperativnom trenutku neće biti od krucijalne važnosti, ali ćemo poslati pacijenta na neko kardiološko ispitivanje, jer će to možda biti značajno za njegovu buduću kardiološku bolest i prevenciju nekog novonastalog budućeg stanja. Hvala vam. Jedan predavač, prezentera, dr. Ivo Filipovci. Igor, povedi se svoje predavanje za krio nevroliza pri tretman nakutne konične bolke. Blagodaram. Blagodaram na pokanata. I mnogo sam sretan što možem denska da vi prezentiram sve što ja se zanimavam posljednje deset godine. I will do my presentation in English because I can see that Ole is here, so it's easier to him to understand what what's going on. I work at the Pain Clinic Copenhagen Crowd Center since 2014, and I'm president of the International Society of Ultrasound Guided Crowd Neurolysis, which I will present at the end of the. Um, we are talking about crown neurolysis. I don't know how many of you have heard about crown neurolysis, but crown neurolysis is a part of the interventional pain treatment that, pro that uh, provides long-lasting pain relief. The effect is the uh, same like uh, local anesthesia, but it lasts much longer, up to two years. We, have, we use cold to ablate peripheral nerves. The aim is to provoke the axon breakdown and to provoke the pr process of valerian degeneration. What is very important is that uh, during this procedure, the endo, AP, and perineurium remain intact. So it means that the, the damage is only at the axons of the nerve. The nerve regrows back with one to two millimeters per day. The process uh, takes about uh, three weeks and then the nerve is growth actually fully back. Um, 
The duration is highly variable. I have patients with zero effect. I have patients follow up for nine years now with uh, pain relief. We do both sensory and motor block. Uh, you, when we use the cryo for, for uh, pain treatment, we, use, uh, we, we treat only sensory nerves. But in some cases, I will show you later, we use also motory nerves to, to treat the pain and patients. The first cryo device was invented in 1961. And uh, since then, we are actually developing more and more new devices which are coming on the market. What is the physics behind the cryo? When we do cryo, we use uh, gas, it's uh, CO2 or nitrous. And uh, you can see the needle, actually there's two needles and the gas is uh, flowing from the outer part and then coming back from the inner part. Of, so no gas is coming into the patient. There is narrowing one centimeter before the, the end of the needle. And this is known as a Julie Thompson's effect in the physics. It means that the velocity of the gas is increasing very much there, and the, the temperature is decreasing. And then this result is in one ice probe, which is, which is formed on the end of the ice probe, of, 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 the, of the probe. The ice ball is usually one and a half centimeter long and one centimeter thick. I have a study here uh, when they measured the EMG on the normal persons where we, they saw actually that on plus 10 degrees, the velocity of the transmission of the impulses in the, into the nerves is decreased with five to 10 percent. What I'm, what uh, we are going to do is that uh, we know that uh, pathohistologically there's five uh, categories of nerve damage. The first degree is neuropraxia and this is when we are going and standing on ski and temperature is minus 5, minus 10. If we measure our nerve uh, conduction, we will see that this is decreased actually with more than 30 percent up to four hours after the skiing. What I'm going after is the second degree of axonot or axonotmesis. This is uh, where we expose the nerve on the temperature between minus 20 and minus 88 degrees, which is the secure window and where we can actually provoke the valerian degeneration. If we freeze with more than minus 100 degrees, then we will provoke third, fourth, and fifth uh, uh, degree, which will lead to permanent nerve damage. This is study on, uh, on uh, rats, sciatic nerve, frozen uh, 36 weeks. On the left slide, you can see untreated tissue, and you can see there are small dots here, which are very difficult to see. This is the axons. On the right side, you can see that those axons are very much visible. It's one week after the treatment, and it means that we have provoked the, the process of valerian degeneration. Same study, immunofluorescent staging on the neurofilaments. You can see on the first light, which is normal tissue, the seven, uh, one week after the cryo, you can see only the few nucleus are back. And 32 weeks after the cryo, we can see that the nerve is grown completely back. I show this study because it's very important to understand that this is reversible. What we are doing, it's, it's actually it, the nerve is growing back. You cannot treat what you cannot diagnose. It's very important before you start to, to treat the patients to have the right diagnosis. It means that I don't accept patients which are not completely cleared from the surgeons or whatever rheumatologists. So you have to be sure what you are treating. The other thing is that the pathology should be isolated from the sensory nerve. And this is the, the process of, of treating is, uh, there's two, first time when I see the patients, you have to do diagnostic block. We are doing diagnostic block with lidocaine 0 0.5 to 1 milliliter, neurostimulation, ultrasound guided to provoke the pain and to provoke 50% pain relief just on one milliliter of lidocaine. If there is pain relief about 50 or more percent, then we can offer the patient to come and get cryo. Not the same day, another day, because we have to do stimulation again. Um, success of the lesion, how big the ice ball is, how close to the nerve can we come. 
tissue permeability to water, how old is the patient, what's the status of the patient, uh, meticulous nerve stimulation, and again, the, the function of the correct diagnosis. We compare cryo always with radiofrequency ablation, it's with warm. What are advantages of cryo? There is no possibility of neuroma formation, can be used of all nerves, can be repeated because the nerve grows back, it's office procedure, and we actually begin to, to use it a lot for post-operative pain treatment for the patients with shoulder or knee for rehabilitation the first three months after the operation. Complications, there is no written uh, reports of permanent nerve damage. It's uh, sometimes you, we can provoke skin discoloration. We can, uh, if I treat the head, so alopecia, you can see on my thrombosis, infection, or bleeding like all interventional procedures. Contraindications, these four are all only, uh, this is the absolute contraindication, paroxysm called hemoglobinuria, but it's only 1% of the world population. Have in Denmark, we have only seven patients, and they have, all of them, they have CART, and they present every time when they come. So basically, there is no, there is no uh, contraindications. I will show some of the diagnoses which we can, uh, where we use cryo. Uh, trigeminal nerve for uh, supraorbital nerve. Uh, you can see how we place the procedure, uh, how we, we put the patient, place the, the cryo needle. Trigeminal nerve, we don't do cryo into the trigeminal ganglion. We use it on uh, V, uh, V2, V3 mental nerve, but not in the ganglion. Radiofrequency ablation is better for, for treating into the ganglion. I have some uh, ultrasound picture how to do the, the V2 on maxillary nerve and just uh, beside of the maxillary artery. Migraines, headaches, uh, cryoneurolysis of great occipital nerve uh, or lesser occipital nerve. I have a lot of patients with uh, pain after herpes zoster or after traumatic injury of the head. Usually the not all mig migraines are, are, uh, are uh, provoked from the brain. Usually some of them are also uh, as a result of nerve entrapment. So that's why we can, we can help these patients with this treatment. This is how to find the, the, the nerve. I always, when I teach, actually I say that uh, when you start first, you should use the, the, the simple approach on the, on the skull. It's very easy to find the nerve, it's very secure. The other procedure is when, when we found the nerve actually just arising from uh, the second cervical um, vertebra and then trace it and you can see there in between the muscles you can see the great occipital nerve and we can do the freezing there. This is how we put the patient, they're laying on prone position and then we're coming and treat the nerve. We use a lot of cryo for shoulder pain from frozen shoulder to preoperative pain we just started in Denmark uh, uh, one study for treating um, rotator cuff injury in young patients. Before the operation, we do cryo and we can see if we can postpone or not to come into the operation. We treat the, the suprascapular nerve and lateral pectoral nerve. I, I mentioned in the beginning that we are using cryo only on, on sensory nerves. This nerve is 80% motory nerve and 20% sensory nerve but it innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. When we do the cryo, the deltoid muscle is overtaking the function of the shoulder. They feel that the arm is a little bit heavy, but they can still actually move it up and down. And when I scan the patient three to four months after, we cannot see any atrophy of the muscles because there is passive movements on the, on the shoulder joint. This is the anatomy of the lateral pectoral nerve. And lateral pectoral nerve is very important because we, we can cover actually the front part of the shoulder joint. And this is what I have begun three years ago. Previously was only a suprascapular nerve, but now the results are much, much better because now I can cover actually the both sides of the, of the shoulder. Intercostal neuralgia, it's very, uh, there's a lot of studies uh, at the moment when, when we are doing cryo per operative 
uh, it means that uh, we have 65 centimeter long needle and then you can do the thoracoscopically actually you can freeze the nerves before or after the procedure. I do a lot of uh, preoperative uh, uh, treatments for, for thoracotomies and then we have a lot of patients with uh, herpes zoster and post mastectomy pain where we also do the, the intercostal neurology. I have it here how, how it looks on ultrasound. And you can see you have to, you can see the pleura here, you can see the arteries you are coming from the other side, how to place the needle. Um, medial branch, this is only a picture of, uh, of a lumbal medial branch, but you can treat actually medial branch from cervical to, to sacral. And, and this is what we are doing with cryo, you don't touch the, the roots because you can paralyze the patient so we do the, the medial branch in order to, to disable the, the facet joints. Um, clunial nerves, I don't know if you know clunial neuralgia is 40% uh, statistically 40% of the patients with low back pain they have clunial neuralgia. This, these are sensory nerves and the, the it, it is known as a pseudo sciatic pain. It mimics sciatic pain but the patient, patients can walk and don't have any disabilities of the muscle strength. Very easy and very very good procedure. You can see here that the nerves are lying on the posterior uh, ilia crest, three nerves and then you can easily find them with ultrasound stimulate and do the cryo procedure. Patients with posterior pain and acne syndrome, I don't know if you know acne, anterior cutaneal nerve and trapkin syndrome. These are the nerves which are the sensory branches from the intercostal nerves. A lot of patients with uh, pain which is uh, spontan pain or some of them when they have laparoscopy, so ports can do damages on the nerve. Um, for posterior pain, I do ileoinguinally hypogastric. For the acne, we do the nerves into the rectus muscles. Uh, this is how to find the, the ileoinguinal hypogastric nerve. This is for the acne. Um, genitofemoral nerve, we are, we are doing now the project with the urologist in Denmark. We are treating the young men with uh, testicular pain where we treat the genicular branch of genicular nerve. Uh, Yes, sometimes it helps, sometimes no. You can see also the yellow, the other one is the femoral branch. We have more and more patients in Denmark coming with uh, femoral branch pain, which is very unusual, but they have changed their uh, technique for, for, uh, for herniotomy, and that's why now they, they damage the nerve much more. Um, sacral pain, sacroiliac pain, pudendal nerve, uh, a lot of patients after birth, uh, trauma. This is how to find the nerve. Um, Meralgia paresthetica. I can see my time is over, but I will just want to, just to give you an overview of what, where we can use cryo. Meralgia paresthetica, lateral femoral cutaneal nerve. Easy to find, very good results. Knee patients. We do a lot of uh, patients after total knee replacement. Uh, when we do cryo, we do two nerves, uh, infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve, which, uh, which have three branches, and then anterior femoral cutaneal nerve. Uh, I have some short video here how to, uh, to find the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. Here you can see there's two branches here, which are just uh, coming out from the sartorius muscle. And this is when we do the diagnostic block. Now we are doing stimulation there and, and uh, so now it's the same for cryo here. And you can see how the ice ball looks when we do the, the procedure. When we are freezing the nerve, we are freezing two times three minutes. So it means that we are freezing three minutes that we are, then we are doing uh, defrozing for one and a half minute. 
and then we are repeating the process of trimmings. You have to, to expose the nerve longer because the ice ball, it doesn't matter how big the ice ball is because the ice ball works as an insulator. So it's, it's actually, it's only on temperature on the needle which, which uh, gives you a, a help actually to, to freeze the nerve. Uh, this is anterior femoral cutaneal nerve. This is the one which is covering the patella and lateral part of the, of the knee joint. Here you can see the nerve, which is lying very superficially. It's a very small nerve. Up there, it's in the, in the, it lays in the, in the fat tissue just below the, uh, above the tendon of the quadriceps muscle. Uh, foot pain, diabetic neuropathy, uh, superficial peroneal nerve covering actually 90% of the foot pathology. Sometimes if it's not enough, so I will, uh, uh, I will supplement with uh, sural nerve and the saphenous nerve. Uh, this is how it looks when we, oh, sorry, when we, you can see here, it lays between the uh, peroneus magnus, peroneus longus, the nerve, uh, it, it, it lays in the fast chain between those. You can see the nerve, you can see the needle for diagnostic block there. Morton's neuroma, it's uh, actually the best procedure for Morton's neuroma. All, all types of neuroma is cryo, because when we freeze the neuroma, it it's, uh, dissolves, and three weeks after, you cannot find neuroma anymore. What is the future of cryo? We are trying to implement cryo as a standard, uh, standard pain treatment for all surgical patients in order to decrease the use of opioids. And then you can see we are scanning the patients before the operation. Reduced risk, we are going with standard care. High risk, we are going with cryo one week before the procedure. And we can see that uh, actually the first three months after the operation are much better, outcome is much better, and then we can see the the chronic pain decreases in the group which we treat with cryo. I do also patients with spasticity after the stroke or multiplex sclerosis or patients with, uh, with, uh, which are born with, with spastic paresis. You can see here a short video One. when we, the, the left can side is before cryo. Two minutes after the cryo, you can see that we can open the arm without any pain or, or nothing there. So I have some uh, studies. Uh, this is double blinded study from United States for before the the total knee replacement, which shows that the the group which received cryo one week before before the total knee replacement they have much better outcome comparing to the normal procedure. Another this is for osteoarthritis uh, osteoarthritis. Rheumatologist study when they 190 patients they saw that uh, the group which received cryo they can postpone the new prothesis actually up to four years just with one cryo treatment. Another knee replace this is uh, all American studies because in the United States it's a huge problem total knee replacement and a lot of money is going there so that's why the focus is there. Uh, so you can see here with CRPS and uh, uh, amputation patients and uh, intercostal, comparing intercostal with, uh, with thoracic uh, epidural, uh, post-amputation phantom lip pain. I would like to promote the International Society of Ultrasound Crowd, uh, Ultrasound Guided Crowd Neurolysis. We found it in 2022. We had our first conference last year. This year we have uh, another conference, uh, 27, 28 of April. The, the aim of the, of the society is uh, to make the international guidelines and help everybody who wants to start the, the procedure. And we are doing a lot of research. We are trying to, to fund a lot of uh, studies. This is the conference we, with a lot of uh, hands-on and presentations. We have two webinars. The one was in, uh, in February. The second one will be in September for pain treatment. And we have one in May for, or in June for spasticity. 
These are our contact information, and thank you for your attention. za tvojata odlična prezentacija. Prašenja sledat posle predavanja. Do sega pokanovam Filip Neumovski so svojata prezentacija. Vodnost na ekokardiografski znaci za pacijente, ko što se odviknuva da ne plata. So I will be talking about uh, echocardiographic insights of, um, uh, of uh, weaning failure in patients. Uh, so it, I, I suppose it's very, it's very important for us who work uh, in the ICU settings, uh, so it will be interesting for you till the end of the lecture. Uh, I have nothing to uh, declare, no disclosures, and uh, in my presentation I will go through the uh, frequency of, uh, and incidence of winning failure, uh, the role of echocardiography while, um, uh, while uh, diagnosing and treating winning failure, and, and, and um, after that uh, what are actually uh, the predictions uh, that we, uh, the with the use of echocardiography and is there any uh, in our daily practice. Uh, how we define a winning, winning failure? Winning failure is defined as uh, um, unsuccessful spontaneously breathing tests because um, w when we would like to extubate the patients which were uh, on a mechanical ventilation for uh, several days, we just try to uh, put them on a T piece and after that to extubate them. If the patient is not capable to uh, run th through these tests, so we have uh, an un unsuccessful uh, winning process and we, are, uh, we should consider that as a winning failure or winning failure is defined as uh, uh, needing when p uh, the patient demands intubation after 48 hours uh, of being extubated after experiencing mechanical ventilation and if you look uh, about the incidence of the uh, winning failure we can see that the incidence is very big uh, according to the most of the studies that was con that were consulted for this presentation the win uh, in winning failure incidence is around 20 to 30 percent but there are some sporadic radic studies that say that the winning failure could be met is in some intensive care units around 60% of the patients which is very high incidence uh, so what we can do, uh, because, the impact of the, because the impact of winning failure is very big, actually it was found uh, in a lot of studies that the winning failure um, uh, had a, uh, have an impact of, uh, uh, in morbidity and mortality in uh, patients because those patients need uh, long-lasting tri treatment in ICU, long-lasting mechanical ventilation and complications related to mechanical ventilation. Uh, so um, this is the, uh, the etiology of winning failure. Um, if you if you look uh, uh, on these slides, there are several uh, only only few of the reasons are mentioned on this slide. We ha we have uh, we have a lot of reasons why some of the patients cannot be winned off. But I will be talk uh, I will be talking on uh, these presentations only only for the reasons related to the heart, only to, to, uh, to the for the reasons of cardiac origin. 
Um, this is the pathophysiology of why some patients are uh, developing weaning failure. Actually, if you can see, the, the, the main, the, the, the main um, uh, reason why, the, uh, the main reason, uh, why uh, weaning failure develops in most of the patients actually is the switching them off from positive pressure ventilation. Switching them off from positive to negative pressure ventilation, it means that the preload in these patients will be bigger, will, be, will become bigger. But as well as afterload. So there is a lot of pressure over the heart, even, even, even in patients which heart is uh, healthy. Uh, but w you can consider that some of the patients, they're they are having uh, or experiencing some uh, heart conditions, some, some heart problems. So in those patients where uh, contractility of the heart is uh, already, al already, um, uh, already uh, injured before the uh, admission to the ICU, before the starting of the winning process, uh, they will be uh, they will be um, those candidates that can develop uh, heart failure due to winning uh, and uh, the winning will not be possible in them uh, so a lot of uh, uh, you can look at this slide that the, the pathophysiology of winning failure is very complex uh, at the main the main reason uh, of developing those pathophysiological mechanisms is switching the patients of, of positive to negative pressure mechanical ventil um, ventilation and some of the authors that w w uh, that were discussing about this uh, topic uh, they said that uh, actually switching the patients from uh, mechanical to spon mechanical ventilation to spontaneous breathing is like a stress test for the heart so those who have a uh, um, uh, already have uh, heart problems, they, uh, they are prone to develop wi uh, weaning failure to the uh, process of weaning. So um, w when I was searching an articles for, for this uh, topic, I found that uh, even 42% of the patients who experience weaning failure uh, are experiencing uh, weaning failure because of cardiac problems, because of cardiac etiology. And uh, it's, uh, it's been said a, a, w a weaning failure uh, from cardiac etiology. Uh, in this article uh, named cardiac dysfunction induced by weaning mechani uh, from mechanical ventilation, um, they found that uh, actually weaning, uh, pul in, in weaning induced pulmonary edema or weaning failure uh, has been uh, in weaning failure patients has been found that 59% of them develop heart failure, they develop some uh, problem or, 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 or or already have some problem with the heart. Uh, and uh, also in this study um, was mentioned that the cardiac comorbidities, uh, comorbidities and COPD was the main reasons why patients cannot be weaned off or we have a problem with weaning uh, in, in these patients. As well, um, they found that negative pressure lack uh, raising tests, as uh, Dr. Ivan Velichkovich has mentioned, negative tests. Uh, is already one of the one of the measures that um, before you start the sp spontaneous breathing test, if you if you if you try to make an, uh, a passive leg raising test, and if it's negative, it means that uh, these patients have a positive fluid balance and. They, they are very very prone to develop a winning failure throughout the process of winning. In this study, uh, they found that. Uh, left ventricular diastolic function or dysfunction is even more important than left ventricular systolic function. Uh, the patients who will uh, can who cannot be wind off because systolic function, we can see that very easily, uh, like Nad Dr. Nada Pechic showed us. But uh, those who are uh, with diastolic are mm, a little bit. We, we need a little bit uh, skills, more skills to to, to do the exam. And uh, most of them who have a cardiac origin winning winning failure, they develop a left ventricular uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction, not systolic dysfunction. So uh, how we can assess diastolic dysfunction? Uh, it's uh, quite easier. If you can, if you can look uh, on this picture, if you can get an image of the heart with a four-chamber view, we, you, uh, you look at the uh, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and left le uh, right ventricle. We should find uh, some of the some of the uh, um, above mentioned uh, parameters. It's transmitral um, uh, valve Doppler. It's uh, septal E. It's uh, lateral E, pr e prime and the uh, 
uh, indexes EE prime and EE prime. I will uh, go through them now. Uh, so at, uh, at the first image, the first image, Okay. At the first image, you should you, you can see the E and A. E E stands for early di di diastole. Early diastole is the process when the uh, when the blood is pouring down to the ventricle from the atrium. So it's the, the the early phase of diastole. A stands for atrial kick. A is the late diastole when the atrium contracts and uh, uh, gives another amount of blood into the ventricle. So this is the normal uh, diastolic uh, diastolic uh, uh, Doppler found, uh, and we can do we can perform this very easy. When you found when you when you when you find the fourth chamber view, you just put the tip of the of the Doppler uh, over the mitral valve and. Uh, start pulse wave Doppler and you will get this image. Um, this patient will be wind off uh, easily but the other one on the other picture you can see that E wave is very low and A wave is quite big. This patient, uh, th this patient has already diastolic dysfunction so this patient probably probably will not be wind off uh, quite easily and we will be experiencing problem with weaning off. Um, and uh, how, you, how we can assess E prime uh, and E prime, small E prime. E prime, uh, big E prime and small E prime are different parameters. Uh, small, uh, the bigger E, e prime is uh, assessed when we put the uh, Doppler marker on the, s on the uh, lateral wall and the septal when we put the Doppler on the septum uh, of the heart. So we get E prime small. When we divide e uh, uh, the E from uh, mitral valve and E prime from the lateral or septal wall, we get the indexes of E, uh, e, prime, uh, e, e prime small. So this is very important to get this number because every single patient that will be experiencing E, e prime uh, index uh, bigger than eight before starting the spontaneous breathing test it's probably, w uh, he will probably develop a winning failure. He will be one of the uh, patients with winning failure and he will develop a heart failure uh, throughout the process of uh, winning. So uh, some studies, they consider that the patients who have uh, a very bigger E wave and small E prime wave before starting the spontaneous breathing test, they will develop uh, winning failure and we should be very careful when starting the uh, winning process in them. Uh, if, if you divide uh, uh, E from the mitral valve and E prim prime, you can get the left atrial pressure. And if you use the Nage formula, you can get a, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So it's very easy to get to some numbers which in the past were given only using invasive monitoring. Uh, now we do not need invasive monitoring. Uh, diastolic dysfunction as a predictor, so in, uh, it's another study that says that uh, patients who experience diastolic dysfunction before uh, starting the spontaneous breath breathing test will uh, develop a winning failure. Uh, another uh, study has said that uh, serial uh, Doppler it should be done uh, when we would like to assess the patients during the winning process. So uh, we should, done, uh, we, we should uh, do uh, echocardiography before starting uh, spontaneous breathing tests in winning process and we should be uh, doing uh, in 15 to 30 minutes just to look up does this patient will develop or is developing uh, a winning failure very early, not to, not to, not to go to the, uh, um, to, to the, to the end stage uh, heart failure, acute heart failure. Uh, so um, if, you, if you take a look of this slide, we have uh, all of those uh, previously mentioned indexes and numbers have uh, their usage in every single phase of the process uh, before starting the spontaneous breathing test, during and after failed. Um, we can do before and if we have a number of EE prime bigger than eight, we should not start 
spontaneous breathing test um, because those patients will be developing uh, winning failure. We can do uh, throughout the process of winning uh, process and, uh, and we can see that this patient uh, is developing, is in process of development of uh, winning failure or uh, it can be the winning process will be going smoothly and this patient will be successfully extubated. Um, in this slide, I'm showing uh, how the patient, how you can see uh, in a time framework, uh, the patient is going from normal finding of uh, uh, Doppler signs to the pathologic one, which is showing that this patient is experiencing a heart failure due to, due to spontaneous breath breathing test uh, uh, on the left end of the picture. It's, it's absolutely normal Doppler finding, and uh, this patient, uh, at, uh, this is at the start of the uh, winning failure, uh, uh, winning process, but at the end of the winning process, when we concluded that this patient uh, cannot be wind off, look at those uh, picked high E. Uh, um, e waves of the mitral Doppler and those small, small, small E waves, small e, e waves um, of the of the septal uh, septal E, uh, which means um, a very, very big index of E E prime or very big um, left atrial pressure. Um, and in this study, uh, they found, uh, as well as I said, uh, that um, uh, they found that uh, higher indexes of EE prime are associated with uh, diastolic dysfunction, and uh, also uh, they under th they constructed a study in which patients who uh, who are um, given dobutamine, like a dobutamine stress test, um, uh, and previously uh, they have they had normal findings, but throughout the stress test they experienced um, diastolic dysfunction and those patients are not ready for uh, doing spontaneous uh, 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 breathing tests. Th on this picture I'm, I will be talking about uh, something that uh, Dr. Nada Pejic already said. It's very easy to assess mitral regurgitation. Just you have to find four chamber view and you put a solar doppler over the, over the mitral valve and if you see uh, if you see those greeny and yellow uh, uh, and yellow uh, colored uh, regurgitant jet, you can diagnose uh, a mitral valve um, regurgitation. And if patients, at, uh, if the patient uh, before the beginning of the spontaneous is in this condition, and after beginning the spontaneous breathing test is going. You can now see that uh, spontaneous breathing tests make this patient to um, to experience a bigger, bigger, bigger mitral uh, mitral valve insufficiency and mitral regurgitation, which is uh, one of the signs of uh, diastolic dysfunction and can contribute to um, uh, winning failure. Uh, at the end, I would like to conclude that echocardiography uh, is really, really helpful for all of us to use in the, uh, in the ICU before starting the spontaneous breathing test and during the spontaneous breathing test because uh, gives us value valuable information about the patients. Does this patient will uh, be wind off successfully and smoothly or we will have will experience problems uh, during the process of uh, during the process of uh, winning. Za prezentacijata otvaram prašanja za diskusija v odnos na sete iznesene prezentacije. Povedajte. Okay. I have uh, some question for Dr. Igor uh, about the complication, percent of complication and type of complication with cryo. We have actively just for the Messiah Macedonsky pushed in Stenia. Never put her back at that. Procent na complication me. Bilo je preko 4000 pacijenti izrabotano, okolo 3% od pacijenti da dobiva komplikacija ili side effect da ga krstime na alodinija 4 do 5 dena posle tretmana. To znači deka bo dermatomat koji što je tretiran, kožata je toliko senzitivna da mora da napravime nekoliko pati shutdown blok i da je povtorime procedurat. Zašto se pojavlja to? To se pojavlja zato što verovatno nervot ne je zamrznat dolgo. To koliko njegov zamrznem je celata cirkonferencija na nervot i sve ušte ima aksonje koji što se živi vnatre, 
тие се толку активни што фактички го ја влошуваат целата си состојба на, на болка на пациентот. Две компле... сме имале две инфекции, двете се сестри по анестезија на стопалата и две два случаи три на на тужби за незадоволни пациенти и така да. А иначе друг вид на компликации не сме имале. Прашање. Ти благодарам што си тука, нели што ни кажа за твојата работа. Ја, мене ми интересира околу тригеминална болка, хронична тригеминална болка. Дали сите типови на тригеминална болка можат успешно да се третират со крио? Тригеминалната болка исто е, трик прашање. Во 2022 година Англиската асоцијација на неврохирурзи дојде со, една, е, со еден рапорт 86% од пациенти со тригеминус неуралгија имаат фактички тоа што се вика неуроваскуларен конфликт. Од, од е, мозошното стебло, артерија базиларис кога излегува, она го, го фактички го загушува ганглината. Тие пациенти, колку и ние да ги третираме периферно, не може да им помогне. Тоа што се прави, тоа е една неврохирушка мала интервенција преку масто и се влегува и помеѓу артеријата и вената, они ставаат тефлон. Пациентот кој се буди од анестезија, болката е... Тоа што е... Значи, прво се прави секоја што кога се помислува на тригиминал стоералгија, треба се направи магнетна резонанција на тригиминал ганглион, за да се види дали има неуроваскуларен конфликт. Доколку нема, може да разговара и доколку има травма со нели забарска травма, по повреда скршеници на лице, тогаш може да разговараме за третман на В2, В3, евентуално ментал, зависи, зависи кој да одне. Благодарам. Е, повели, Иван Величкович. Я бих дел само коментар. Нада и Филип и смо говорили о ултразвуку у три различите области анестезија, свако е стручњак за дел анестезије и могли сте да видите колико е се отишло са, значи употребом Point of Care, Altra, Sonography да нам помогне у свакодневном рату. За људе кои желе да добију више информација, ево, јас сам отворио поготово кад је рече о Diastology, Матилда, Гидросимард или како се год веќ нјено име изговара за 13 минута е тако лепо објаснила диастологи на uh, YouTube. Uh, Хавиер Кубиос, он је из Western University, Лондон, Онтарио, Канада. Нјихов вебсайт, вебсайт о покусу, не департмана анестезиологи, него и мрдженси је можда најболји уд Роберт Артфилд, uh, то е можда најболје што можете на интернету да најдете о Point of Care ултрасонографи и тоа е вестерн соно. Значи само могу да, да охрабрим луѓе кои желе да добију још више знања да погледају ствари на вестерн сон. Благодарам. Ја свако од овој аспект на работите можам да кажам дека а, многу ме радува што ентузијазмот за утразвук, односно за покус во анестезија, веќе во подем. Имаме веќе практични, вака многу прагматични работи, кои што може само да не радуваат. Еве, значи, во нашата секојдневна работа, особено интересен е трудот на Филиповски во однос на овие ендиастолни пореметување, ендиастолни дисфункции, значи, кои што еве може да најдат и место во многу една наша практична работа во интензивно толекување. Мене ме интересира, обично вие диастолни дисфункции, а, значи едноставен е приодот, четворо коморен, гледаме дали имаме, дали има валву, односно а, најчесто регургитација, поврзана со валвуларни ова дисфункции, враќања, или тоа може да оди и без патологија. Видете, некога, може да, ова може да не мора да го, е, мислам, диастолната дисфункција не мора да ја проценуваме само кај пациенти во интензивно. Некогаш го правам тоа и пред сала, затоа што посебно кај итни пациенти, 
може да ги внесеме во сала и да не може нели да се ослободат на крај на операцијата. Поготово при да. мајорен тип на да, хирургија. Да, посебно кај абдоминални мајорни хирурги кај искрварени да. така. Не секогаш тоа е врзано за не секогаш е врзано за ам, валвуларна абнормалност. Пациентот може да нема никаква валуларна абнормалност. Меѓутоа ако ќе го ставите доплерот, ќе видите дека он има стифнес. Майокардиал стифнес. Практично, веројатно има долгогодишна хипертензија која што го обтоварува. Таа не прави се уште дилатација на митралниот анулус да, да, да има манифестна регургитација, но пациентите имаат нарушена диастолна функција. Или диастолна дисфункција, многу често таа е диастолна дисфункција од е, тип е, Не сакав сега да ја обтоварам публиката со градус 1, 2 и 3, тоа за нас не е ни важно, ние не сме кардиолози. Важно е да ја препознаеме. Тогаш кога е тип 1, Посебно кога ќе ја видиме дека е тип 1, многу често тие пациенти имаат проблем со вининг, проблем, интраоперативно проблем. На тие пациенти, колку и да се празни, кога ќе им дадеме многу течност, на крај имаат а, плуќе со, со белини. Така да, ова е стварно корисно. А, од овие два параметри, аз дори и него не користам латералниот Е, го користам септалниот Е, затоа што Е од а, големото е од митралната валвула и е септално, кога ќе ги поделиме, го добиваме left atrial pressure. И вие преку left atrial pressure може да знаете колку овој пациент може да издржи течност. А ако го ја искористам нагех формулата, таа е, та е еднаква, буквално 98% точност давам за пулмонал веќ прешер. Така да и веќе и во кардиохирургијата нема потреба да се избегнува употребување на на инвазивни, инвазивно мерење на, на со ове катетри. А, туку баш оваа метода може точно да ни покаже за тоа какви се притисоците во пулмоналната циркулација. Значи, благодарам на одговорот. Значи, исклучителна можност. Значи, апсолутно ова сакам да го спровоцирам значи, и во нашата рутинска пракса, добро, за мајорна хирургија, употреба на неинвазивни, имаме можност за неинвазивни показатели, веќе се објективни, каде што можеме да пратиме една, да правиме една мощна, успешна проценка. И за состојбата на еуволемичност, односно отстапки од, е, од секоја еуволемија. Е сега тука, значи, као што те разборов, значи, мораме сепак доплер да употребиме. Тоа е битно. Три знаци предпоставувам овој прв степен минорна улога има тука. Обично се работи за отстапки од втори трет степен. Тоа ни, и ние веќе еве навлегуваме полека овие основни прозорци, мислам дека и навлегуваат кај нас во рутинска пракса. Она што треба понатаму да одиме веќе не претендираме да бидеме кардиолози, меѓутоа не е нешто не знам што напредната нешто или бал ова техника да почнеме доплер да употребуваме, стварно е корисни податоци, можеме, прозорец, доплер, дугмето, не е нешто, не знам што. Така да ова нека биде ден подтик, ме, ме радува имаше учесници, амбициозни, млади, и кои што веќе на работилниците веќе стануваат гледам фамилиарни, и тоа беше идејата од нашите почетоци од лани веќе, се чудевме што е покус, помина времето година, две, значи дојдовме до една понапредната фаза, па еве сега и овие работи. Ја ги поздравувам, штета што не сме во поголем број, али благодарам на сите и за дискусиите. Не мислев да завршиме, Величкович има... веќе шансу да имају кардијак дизиз лејтен он у, у, у свом животу. Али није било лако пронаћи те пацијентније који ће од прије кланције да оду и да после имају сивр кардијак дисфанкшн. И Клеменс Лотнер је публикало, има још једна индиска студија где је дао едиториал Клеменс Лотнер о процени диастолсне дисфункције код пацијентињја са сивр прије кланцијама. И нарочито
smatra da je nošenje ekstremno važno, da li ćemo mi da radimo procenu kao anesteziolozi za porodiljstvo, mi da radimo procenu diastolične disfunkcije ili da možda na osnovu prisustva B linija imamo indikaciju da pozovemo kardiologa. Zašto? Sa ciljem da ukoliko pronađemo da su te pacijenti imale diastoličnu disfunkciju, da posle toga postoji long term follow up, da bi probali da preveniramo razvoj i dalju progresiju diastolične disfunkcije kod ovih pacijenata. Znači, pogotovo mi koji se srećemo sa mladim pacijentinjama, koji imamo mogućnost da to otkrijemo i da dalje pratimo veoma, veoma velika uloga i veoma mnogo možemo da pomognemo kada dobijemo još malo novih informacija. Da, blagodaram. Izvolite, Branislava Kulić. A zaradi prenosa, onda dobro. Znači, ideja je bila da okupimo sve lidere iz univerzitetskih centara iz naših bivših republika, tako da su polaznici prvi bili ciljani polaznici, načelnici službi, profesori koji su posle to u svojim implementirali u svojim ustanovama. Profesor Sivenski je bio jedan od njih. I na naše veliko zadovoljstvo ovaj program je ekspandirao. Nismo mi očekivali da ćemo imati stotine polaznika, ali je diskretno toliko koliko je krenulo i hvala Bogu da mladi ljudi počinju da usvajaju, jer mladi ljudi to brže usvajaju od nas. Mladi ljudi su drugačije mentalnog sklopa u današnje vreme i njima je to sve normalno, sva ta tehnika koja je nama sada možda teška za savladati. Ono što je jako lepo je povratna informacija koju sada počinjemo da dobijamo od prvih polaznika. Povratna informacija da je neko u intenzivnoj nezi ušao u koštac sa hiruzima zato što je tvrdio da na ultrazvuku postoji slobodne tečnosti u plućima, a gde rengen nije pokazao da postoji, pa su se oni gombali da li će raditi pleuralnu funkciju ili neće. Na kraju se ispostavilo da je onaj koji je video na ultrazvuku bio u pravu i da su to bile ozbiljne količine od 800 ml tečnosti, a ne nešto sitno, već nešto što ugrožava pacijenta. Onda u ovej... Mislim, imamo povratnu informaciju iz Novog Sada, iz Intenzivne, iz Mitrovice, iz Nade, od svih mogućih koji su radili i sada jednostavno ljudi žele da se program nastavi, da mi ovo nastavimo, a kreće se od osnova, ali Filip radi nešto više, Nada radi nešto više. Znači, to će konačno zaživeti u našoj svakodnevnoj praksi. Mi ćemo otići u penziju, ali oni će ostati da to rade. I hvala Bogu. Hvala vam na tome što ste nastavili. Ja sam sekundu, a to ste gotovi. Samo da ve pozdravam site i da kažem koliko smo bile vizioneri. Ako se sekavate pred 15 ili 17 godini, ve sobrav site mladi moji anesteziolozi vo dojran, Ви го представив ехо апаратот, ви дадов можности преку кожа да боцкате и да ја гледате иглата за да можете во регионалната анестезија. Денеска ехото стана еден извонреден помошен апарат во нашата струка. Мислам, визија секогаш треба да се има. Јас скажувам каква сум имала визија тога и кога ве собрав сите во Дојран да почнете да работите со ехо. Денеска ова само се потврдува и покажува колку се корисни сите овие можности на семинари, конгреси или слично, кои што ви даваат можност да гледате во перспектива. Ја поздравувам колешката, ја поздравувам иницијативата и браво, така треба да се продолжи за младите важи. Благодарам, професор Сулякова. Дали некој има збор? Димче, изволте. Ме радува е вака дискусија, треба да ги одбележуваме работите. Значи, што се однесува на, на користенето на ехото, посебно ево, на професорот, ќе му собија, обратам. Значи, во гинекологијата е исклучително важно. Ќе ви кажам само еден краток пример. 
Значи пациентка не дека 6 и 7 месец, он има конгенитална бикуспидна валвола, кај што има хипертрофија на миокардот, која што е исклучително важна за диастолна функција. Жената треба да се породи не дека 7 и месец, мислам, или така, 7 и месец, порано, одамна им работа на гинекологија. Сега, таа пациентка да ставиш на екстракорпорална циркулација, ја ставаш во ризик и неа и детето. И на крај одлучено е да се направи тави, значи, привремена процедура на решавањето на аурадната валула и на тој начин пациентката и здрава си има породено и поминато како што треба, па после неколку години замена на аурадната валула. Значи, многу е важно ке овие помлади пациентки да се внимава да нема конгенитална бикуспидна валула. Толку мене. Благодарам. Да, благодарам, Димче, преголемо искуство. Сега во, во обзир ке земеме. Еве сака и а, доцент Весна Дурнев, Ме радува што сака да се уклучи. Сигурно има да каже уклуча, нешто. Да, Практично сакам да кажам. Те се заблагодарам на доктор Борислава Пуич, на Иван Беричкојич, на Сивевски, на Нада Пичич, на Вистина. Ја почнавме приказната благодарите на вас. Така? Да, тоа треба да се каже. Тоа треба да се каже, да. Ние кога првпат отидовме во Нови Сад, на Вистина, видовме дека имаме многу бенефит, беше многу квалитетно тоа направено. И некако со Сивевски професорот го максимално го искористивме престојот таму за да почнеме со работилниците за покус и за регионална анестезија. Еве овде и Игор Филиповски, кој што ќе ни помогне, зашто он е председател па на неговото крио, ем, да не сгрешам ништо, <laughs> кажи. и со ехо, значи можностите се голем. И на вистина јас, на пример, не боцкам регионална анестезија, меѓутоа не ли покусот, сакам да го користам многу повеќе, а меѓутоа, еве и со Сибевски, сакаме сите млади да, регионалната анестезија да не им биде пречка со користење на ехо апаратот, значи на вистина, мислам дека анестезиологијата оди во тој правец. Во 2008 година бев ја член на една група во Данска која што работеше на програмот за специализација на анестезија. И 2008 година се донесе една одлука дека сите специализанти по анестезија кои ќе завршат анестезија мора да знаат 100% да направат 6 базични блокови за регионална анестезија. Од тогаш од 6 сеа станаа 15 блока. Веќе не постои боцкање централна вена вени тоа артериска линија без ехо. Значи они сега од друга страна па ги направивме инвалиди, не знаат да боцкаат без ехо. Ама сега е толку достапно да да се така да и тоа исто треба да се уклучи во во специализација. Јас имам вчера едно предавање за развитието, развито и плановите. И плановите на што ќе значи утрезвукот. И барајќи не ли по материјалите за предавањето. А, а Европа ни бара веќе во курикулумо да го имаме покусот. Да. Тоа е 2022 усвоен курикулум, ние веќе мораме да го примениме, еве, ние сме членови на катедра, мислам дека тоа мора да биде иницијатива и дури они права студии да ехото биде во курикулумот на медицинскиот факултет. Веќе во Америка е почнуваат видови така Точно, значи студентите на медицински факултет е хото да не им биде страно и поготово во Танзанија видов студија, прва година студенти праеле некои испитување за користење на нехо апарат имат одлични резултати. Да. Се полесно, да, точно, да. Точно и тоа го сретнав дека анатомски, да. И вака, мислам дека се уште свесноста за значењето на ехото и за регионална можност. Ке бенефитите се огромни и за интензивното лекување се уште не се на завидно ниво. Еве, ја кажувам од нашата околина, така, дали грешам? Па добро, мора Али, да гледаме... Има интерес, има интерес, али мислам дека ќе има... Така. Да. 
Ай, Еве ние сме свестни, значи, какви плодни дискусии, значи, да. прекрасни презентации, от кои што много, може вака стварно да видат. Тук имаме човек надвор кој што може да окористиме абсолютно секојаш во... Мора така да се гледа на работите. Ние што можеме во тоа да, го поддржуваме и ке го поддржуваме и понатаму. Ние многу успешен покус направивме лани на во физички во просторите на гинекологија. Гинекологија, тоа ни беше нашиот и... прв покус така. Така, значи, апсолутно ова ние како катедра нема бегање, прашање на време, што прашање поскоро тоа време. подобро да се воведе во анестезијат. И нема тоа да биде, не знам кога. Еве, за една година ние имаме одлични резултати. Она покус, остетоскоп што беше, еве, останува утразвукот во медицината. Тоа е, тоа е неминовно да, и ние сега да. апсолутно нема одлагање на тој процес. Нема Него поддршка, е, така, охрабрувам поддршка. и младите. А, ние што може да помогнеме така. На било кој начин еве Али имаме сепак, младите, со време ние хова апарати. Работата. Така да а, мислам дека оваа сесија беше прилично корисна и во аспект на а, вашите презентации и дискусиите ви заблагодарувам и ја завршувам оваа сесија.
Može. Ajde, može. Kako sakate, da, ne imam, nima problem. Važi. Važi. Važi, važi, važi. Dobar den, dragi kolegi, prisutni vo salata, ga pozdravujem, i ti je što ne se prisutni, isto tako ga pozdravujem. Menem je mnogo drago, što ovaj kongres je mnogo uspešen. Vo izminatite denov imavme preuve predavanja i se nadevam, da ga tako i ke završi so ova sesija, denešna, posledna. Imam čest da ja najavam našata profesorka, od Štipskijot univerzitet, profesor Biljana Eptimova, so nezinoto predavanje, da slušneme i da naučime nešto od profesorkata Eptimova. Povelete. To bde na ovaj kongres i posle toliko vreme povtorno se sobrahme da se podružime malko i da naučime nešto novo. Ja sobrah, samo moment ima neko problem so prezentacijata tamo. Održljivosta i ekološkata održljivost i anestezijata, to je nešto što mislim da ga treba sega da go da se poveke da se zadržime na to, da obrneme po golemo vnimanje, zato što od mnogu do sega on je do sega studij koji se napraveni Nije kako anesteziolozi i naša ta anesteziološka praksa v sušnost se učestvuje so golem del vo globalno to zatopluvanje, odnosno vo efektot na globalno zatopluvanje i uništuvanje na životnata sredinja. Da, to možem, nego tukaj ima nekoj mali problem i voret. Može da prodlža? Klimatskite promeni se klimatskite promeni se definira nikako svetski globalen zdravstven predizvik na 21. vek. Međunarodnite organizacije kako što je međuvladiniot panel za klimatske promeni povikuvaat na fundamentalni promeni na sekoj nivo na naš odličen i profesionalen život. Spored objedinetite naciji i jedna publikacija koja je izdadena v 2021. godina na naučnu nivo, na naučen koncenzus, je utvrdeno da ga se ušte postoji vreme da se dejstuva, no potrebna nije idna akcija za da se pobara održljivi namalovanja na koristenje to i emisijata na jeglerodni dioksid, tako narečen greenhouse gas ili staklenički gas koji učestvuje vo globalno to zatopluvanje i vo uništuvanje na životnata sredina. Ima golem broj na studiji vo izminatata polovina dekada koji učestvuvat i izotkrije da ka globalno to ekološko vlijanje na zdravstveni od sektor je mnogo značajen 
и нивната, нивниот допринос на тоталното глобално затоплување и емисија на така наречени гринхаус гасови изнесува близу 5%. Овие студии јасно покажуваат дека лекарите и здравствените работници играат главна улога во е, намалување на ова така наречена е, емисија на овие гасови, гринхаус гасови, па затоа е, и е, има една е, така наречена е, покана или е, светската здравствена организација е, издава едно сообштение според кое смета дека а uh, најголемо uh, најголем uh, нај, на еден начин uh, uh, нај, најголема закана за глобалното затоплување се и uh, овие наши uh, гасови кои се употребуваат во uh, текот на uh, оп, на анестезиолошките техники независно за каква техника се работи. Што значи гринхаус ефект? Тоа е всушност заробувањето на топлината од сонцето на површината на атмосферата и нормално овој е, ефект на затоплување на сонцето е корисен бидејќи нашата планета ја претвара од е, една студена планета каде што температурата е минус 18 во е, место пријатно за живеење од некаде просечно плюс 15 степени Целзиусови. Кога веќе зборуваме дека е пријатно ова затоплување и дека треба да постои, зошто е целата ова фама околе за глобалното затоплување што в сушност представува. Три четвртини од ова затоплување, или тој грихаус ефект, е благодарение на затоплувањето од страна на Сонцето на водите, испарувањето, формирањето на облаци и на влажнувањето на воздухот, каде што јаглеродниот диоксид учествувал со многу мал процент, но во последните 200 години јаглеродниот диоксид почнува да се создава многу повеќе благодарение на соборувањето на овие маслата кои се употребуваат во автомобилската индустрија како и уништувањето на шумите. Па денеска се смета дека с голем емисијата на јаглероден диоксид е некаде 28% поголема во однос на преиндустријската зона од 80-тиот век. Па затоа, а, а, тоа е благодарение на активностите и на, на здравствениот сектор, односно употребата на овие гасови. Еве го тој ефект, гринхаус ефект сушност, сонцето кое, учест, кое зрачи на површината и предизвикува затоплување, благодарение на кој овозможува нели, да биде тоа пријатна а, атмосфера на, а, во која ние би живеели, пријатно место за живеење. Но додатно а, емисијата на јаглероден диоксид од голем број на а, интервенции, голем, употребата негова во, во здравствениот сектор предизвикува а, уште поголемо затоплување кое веќе влијае на а, еколошки влија, односно влијае на животната средина. Ова за, о, о, на овој начин всушност затоа и се запитавме што е всушност како вие ова животна средина како вие дефинирале таа одржливост на животната средина. Самото загадување од здравствениот сектор му штети на јавното здравје и може да, би, да влија и индиректно бидејќи на тој начин ќе имаме а, потреба од учество на а, здравствениот сектор, односно а, зголемување на здравствените услуги бидејќи поголем број на а, луѓе би побарале а, здравствени интервенции. Од друга страна, Uh, тој влијае на животот и здравјето на луѓето преку uh, влија, влијание на основните елементи кои се важни за нашето uh, здравје. Тоа е uh, водата за пиење, храната, воздухот uh, и сите тие се uh, на еден начин под закана од ова глобално uh, затоплување. Здравствениот сектор uh, допринесува на uh, промени во климата, в сушност на тоа глобално затоплување, некаде со 4% од uh, целата емисија на uh, јаглероден диоксид. Uh, како високо технички развиена uh, и uh, една дисциплина која бара uh, голем uh, број на uh, ресурси, анестезијата и, uh, се рачуна дека има голема улога 
во емисијата на јаглеродниот диоксид. Додатно 30% од дневниот медицински отпад кој се создава во операционните сали се припаѓа на анестезија некаде 25% од тој дневен отпад медицински, од кој 40% е потенцијално рециклирачки отпад. Иако интересот за еколошката одржливост во анестезиолошка пракса расте, имплементацијата, спроведувањето на ова во пракса е многу потешко и треба да се надминат голем број на бариери. Основно е да се влијае на свесноста кај оние кои ще даватели на медицински услуги, пред се на анестезиолозите и анестезиолошката екипа која учествува во пружењето на во давањето на анестезиолошки здравствени услуги. Здравствените импликации поврзани со климатски промени се многу пораспространети од порано и благодарение на и мајки го предвид сушност тоа здравствените работници како лидери во секоја здравствена струка требе да имаат своје влијание да бидат свесни и на еден начин да бидат да учествуваат сушност во намалувањето на тоа штетно влијание овде како големи главни причинители од секогар се сметале волатилните анестетици односно испадливите анестетици тие имаат голема улога во промена на на климата бидејќи имаат голема емисија на јаглероден диоксид овие волатилни анестетици Основно е што во после употребата имаат минимал, минимален инвиво метаболизам и се ослободуваат во атмосферата, во трофосферата пред се, со едни минимални промени, така да 95% од нивната емисија е непроменета. Посебно се во флуранот и десфлуранот, кои, откако ќе се ослободат во трофосферата, презистираат некаде од 1 до 14 години во просек. Анестетиците, било кои од овие анестетици, се смета дека учествуваат во 50% од периоперативната емисија на еглероден диоксид, а в сушност во, или пак во вкупната хоспитална болничка емисија некаде со 5%. Еве го примерот за Себо Флуранот. Еден час од овој газ, има глобален затоплувачки ефект од 800 до 1600 грами на јаглероден диоксид емисија, што е еквивалентно на возење од 5 до 10 км со автомобил со средна големина. За разлика од него, ацетниот оксид, пак оксидулот, има многу поголемо влијание. Употребата на 500 мл на овој диазот оксид во секоја минута при процедура која трае еден час предизвико затоплување на атмосферата еквивалентна на 16 кг на јаглероден диоксид. Тоа е исто како да возење на мала кола некаде просечно 106 км и издувните гасови кои таа ги ослободува при поминати 106 км. Инако азотниот оксид се употребува многу бидејќи е ефтин, лесно може да се користи, лесно и ефтино се произведува. И а, но друго што е негативно за него што откако ќе се ослободи во атмосферата е пресметано дека се задржува некаде околу 110 години. Затоа се смета намалувањето на употребата на диазотниот оксид ќе води кон а, една од главните насоки главна причина за намалување на емисијата на јаглероден диоксид и глобалното затоплување. Овде имаме споредба на три гасови кои ние најмногу ги употребуваме. Тоа е себофлуранот, изофлуранот, азотниот оксид и десфлуранот. Се гледа дека ако се употребува дека зрачењето емисијата на CO2 кој е, кој е еквивалентна при еден минимална алвеоларна концентрација, значи еден час употреба на себофлуранот е еднакво на 6,5 км возење на просечен, просечен автомобил. Што се несува до изофлуранот е некаде 14 км, азотниот оксид е 95 км, додека десфлуранот, како најголем загадувач, 
Prosječno oslobodovanje to emisijata na CO2 na jegleroden dioksid iznesuva kako vozenje od 320 km. Što je celta? Što je preporakata? Preporakata je da se prvo odi na low flow anestezija, odnosno na anestezija so nizog protok na gasovi, ako veke ne može da se izbegne upotrebata na ovije gasovi i upotreba samo na sebofluranot i izofluranot, dodeka desfluranot i azotni otoksid bi trebalo se preporačuva da se izbegnuvaat. Potoa, koristenje na intravenska i regionalna anestezija sekade kada što može da se koristat, kako i investiranje vo investiranje vo uništuvanjeto na anestetičkite na anestetičkiot otpad preku ili da zarobuvanje ili nivno uništuvanje so soodbetna tehnologija. No se ušte postoje zagriženost deka ovije gasovi predizvikuvat odredeno zagaduvanje i učestvuvat vo globalnoto zatopluvanje. Drug problem so koji nije se sudruvame i doprinesuvame v sušnost pri prakticiranju to na anestezija, to se plastičnite proizvodi koji se za jednokratno upotreba. Bo sodenete amerikanske države je presmetano, bi deki tije se kogaš se presmetuva, a ti imat golema statistika, deka prosečno v operacijonite sali ovi je, tako narečeni, plastični proizvodi za jednokratna upotreba, se učestvujat so 30% od 5 milijona toni na medicinski otpad, koji se proizveduva godišno v bolnicite v Sodinetite Amerikanski državi. Četvrtina od ovoj tvrst otpad se odnesuva na hirurgija, odnosno na anestezija, po pravilu na anestezija, bidejki nije upotrebujen golen broj na plastični, plastična delovi od aparatura, kako što je plastični produkti koji se upotrebujat, predse toa se maskite koji se upotrebujat, on je kompletite za intravenska aplikacija, potoa crevata koji se upotrebuvat v aparatite za anestezije. Plastičnite produkti za jednokratna upotreba počnale po masivno da se upotrebuvat v 50-te godini od minati od vek in se upotrebuvat se poveke in poveke in ne samo nivno to proizvodstvo in nivno to koristenje, pa in nivno to vrlanje, tako narečen, bi deki se to za jedna upotreba, se koristat posebno v zemljite so povisok standard, bi deki se smetat deka imat pogolema zaštita, predse zaštita na samite pružači na zdravstveni usluge, kako i zaštita na pacijentite. V Tek na COVID pandemijata site sme svesni, da imaše upotreba na golem broj i upotreba i proizvodstvo i medicinski otpot sozdaden od samata pandemija, pred se je protektiven materijal i to plastični protektivni obleki za personalot, se smeta po higijenski otkuk, oni koji bi se upotrebovali po veke pati, isto taka golem broj na maski, on je skafanderi, se toa predizikuvaše jedna golema količina na plastik otpad od ovije plastični proizvodi koji se za jednokratna upotreba. To je mnogo seriozen problem i se smeta deka i posle pandemijata, ne samo v tekna pandemijata, imame sozdavanje na ogromna količina na ovije plastični proizvodi za jednokratno upotreba. Koji se preporakite deneska, pa i celot golem broj na, bo poslednjite 50. na godini, ima golem broj na anesteziološki združenija, 
кои имаат публикувано такви препораки со кои анестезиолозите можат да допринесат до намалувањето на емисијата на еглероден диоксид и нивното штетно влијание на глобалното затоплување односно на екологијата. Светската федерација на здружение на анестезиолози исто така продолжува да дава такви препораки со кои треба да имаме транзиција, односно премин од една пракса која до сега сме имале во пракса во која би имале одржлива еколошка средина, значи намалување на штетното влијание на на анестезиолошките гасови на, на, на средината, односно на глобалното затоплување, со намалување на медицинскиот отпад, препорака на повторна употреба, значи не употреба на пластични преце производи за еднократна употреба, нивно рециклирање, преработување и повторно користење. Постои една студија која мене ми се чинеше дека може да биде корисна токму за о, со цел за тие направиле одредени испитувања. Студијата е мала, на мал број на пациенти, но сепак е многу значајна, ни дава одредени насоки за понатаму. Прикажана е во British Journal of Anesthesia во 2020 година од Мегейн и соработници кои дале детална компарација помеѓу ослободувањето емисијата на еглеродниот диоксид кај обшта, регионална и комбинирана интравенска анестезија за при замена на колено колено во Австралија е оваа студија се употребени употребени се мал број на пациенти по 10 пациенти во група значи 10 пациенти за кои имале обшта анестезија за ова интервенција 10 пациенти комбинирана интравенска и 10 пациенти со спинална анестезија. Од сето ова, собирајќи ги сите податоци кои се употреб... што е употребено, кои анестетици, каква анестезија, кои гасови се користени, се добиени одредени резултати со кои се тој така наречен life cycle assessment е направено при што има одредени малку зачудувачки резултати, но сепак и покрај тоа што имало големи вариации во самите групи, затоа што се однесувало за пациенти кои имаат различни други коморбидитети, сепак од сите овие испитувања и се тоа што се одвивало употребените анестезии се донесени одредени заклучувачи кои секако не се користат. При обшта анестезија се во флуранот кој е користен допринесува со просечно 4,7 кг на еглероден диоксид еквиваленти просечно 2,7 до 8,6 кг или 35% од тоталниот тоталната емисија на јаглерод. Но треба да се напомене дека Овде инхалационите анестетици, инхалационите гасови имаат своја улога, но сигурно би била поголема, поголем допринос за емисијата на еглерод ако се употребувале десулуранот и азотниот оксид. На почетокот на самата студија е кажано дека десулуранот и азотниот оксид ќе бидат исклучени ќе се употребува за при општата анестезија ќе се користи само севофлуранот и пропофолот како интравенски анестетик. Пациентите кои добивале тотална интравенска анестезија пак имале биле на долниот ниско ниво на загадување и продукција на на јаглерод преку бидејќи употребуван севофлуранот, значи учествувале некаде со само 19% во просек. Во спиналната група, односно пациентите кои биле водени со спинална анестезија, се разбира дека имаме а, нула а, допринос, односно нула зрачење преку а, емисија на еглероден диоксид, затоа што не биле употребени инхалационни анестетици, но а, за чудувачко овде е утврдено дека е зголемена емисијата поради тоа што е употребено се употребени голем број на пластични 
produkti, nali, za, za jednokratno upotreba, nekoj koji se potrebovali i so, koji se takan reči reusable, no pri to je upotrebena energija za nivno zatopljuvanje, za nivno mijenje, potoa je upotrebena zgolemena emisija poradi sterilizacija na ovije proizvodi na site oni koji su potrebovali kako hiruški tako i anesteziološki tako da iznes, emisijata je nekada 4,5 kg na jaglerodin dioksid ekvivalenti i potoa kaj spinalna anestezija što je začudovački deka imame produkcija poradi to što su potrebova nazalna maska za intra, za oksigenacija na pacijentite nali pri spinalna anestezija produkcijata na CO2 je 2,8 kg što uh, bideki potrebujeme high flow nazal, nazalna uh, kanila za oksigenacija na pacijentite. Drugo što uh, je raz, isto za poveke od ovije grupi, uh, najgolem del od njih učestvuvat so 25% i pokreto što se različni se učestvuva so 25% na emisijata na jeglerodin uh, dioksid uh, poradi zatopljuvanje na pacijentot, pri što se upotrebova električna energija, isto tako i 10% za rabota na samite anesteziološki mašini. Što znači oba vo praksa? Poradi golemite variacije na rezultatite vo vsekoja grupa, ne može da se kaže deka ima, deka može da se dadat nekoj nasuki, no sepak generalno može da kažeme deka i se dobijeni nekoj preporak. Prvo, vodnostna tehnika, ta, da se namali upotrebata na plastični elementi, plastični, na plastika koja je za jedna upotreba, so što ke se namali produkcija testo taka na CO2, potoa da se koristat proizvodi koji možat poveke kratno da se upotrebovat, i uh, so vse to ova bi se namalila ta emisija na, uh, na jaglerodin dioksid, odnosno bi se namalilo, uh, namalilo učestvoto na našite anesteziološki uh, tehniki vo globalno to zatopljuvanje i uništuvanje to na, ošte, na oštetuvanje to, odnosno uništuvanje to na životnata sredina. Uh, važno uh, ed, edno deka um, je potrebno namalovanje na site onije uh, cela to na aparatura koja nije koristime, no se razbira da ne bide na šteta na pacijentot, odnosno da ne vlijat na be, uh, upotrebata na bezbedna uh, sigurna anestezija, namalovanje na zatopljuvanje to na ventilacijata, na e, na uh, provetruvanje to na sistemite za pročistuvanje, no se da bide vo sklop na sigurna upotreba da ne predizvika bilo kakvo oštetuvanje odnosno da ne bide na šteta na pacijentot. Drugo važno je produkcijata na na taka narečen medicinski otpad, namalovanje to na produkcijata na medicinski otpad preko recikliranje to, potoa namalovanje da ne nastanuva sogorovanje na ovoj medicinski otpad bi dejki v toj slučaj. Produkcijata na, jaglerodo, na jaglerodni dioksid i oslobodovanje to bi bilo mnogo pogolemo i a, treba da se upotrebuja takvi tehniki pri, bi koj, pri koj bi se prerabotovalo prerabotoval ovoj a, medicinski otpad za drugi celi. Kako zaključak može da se kaže, deka iako je ova mala Uh, prospektivna uh, nerandomizirana studija uh, sepak ima uh, odredena, uh, odreden značaj uh, i uh, treba da ja zememe v predvid koga ke uh, za ponatamu pri uh, koristenje to na tehnikite na anestezija i koristenje to na ovije taka narečeni uh, plastični uh, produkti koji se za jednokratna upotreba. Uh, ova ne dava nekoj konečen odgovor, no sega, no se pak uh, preporačuva, uh, dava primjeri kako može da se namal, da se namala tovije uh, emisiji na gasovi, predsjed na jaglerodin dioksid, uh, koji predizikuvat uh, oštetuvanje, odnosno uh, se pričini za uh, 
globalnoto zatopluvanje. Ovdje je daden eden na slika na idealna anestezija, rekovme nije, da ka idealna anestezija ne postoji, no sepak bi se potrudili na eden način, da razmislime na kako bi go namalile od jedna strana emisijata na CO2 pri upotreba i svrljanje na onije gasovi koji imat najgolemo učestvo, to se desfluranot i azotni otoksid, upotreba na sebo fluranot. Poto upotreba na koristenje na intravenska anestezija ili kombinirana opšte intravenska anestezija ili spinalna anestezija sekade kada što to je možno. I na toj način nije bi učestvovale vo bi se inkorporirale vo ta globalna svetska na jedan način emisija za spasovanje na planetata. Zato je potrebno anesteziolozite, odnosno svi te oni koji učestvovat vo prakticiranje to na anestezijata, da učestvovat vo primjena na ovije promeni pred se upotrebena ta anestezija, najmalku što može da se upotrebujat ovije isparljivi anestetici koji učestvovat vo globalna ta emisija na eglerodin dioksid, upotreba na izofluranot i sevofluranot namesto desfluran koji se pokaže deka i kako i azotni otoksid ima najgolema emisija na CO2 i najgolema pričina, najgolemi vinovnici za globalno učestvovatu vo globalno to za globalno to zatopluvanje. Sekako, potrebno je i samite nije da bideme svesni deka je potrebno da na jedan način doprineseme so promeni na načinot na koji nije je prakticirame, se razbira se kogaš na prvo mesto stavajke ko pacijentot. Postojat odredeni parametri, odredeni načini na koji nije bi možele da pridoneseme vo namaluvanje na emisijata na eglerodin dioksid, pred se upotreba na odredeni novi tehniki na recikliranje na site onije plastični delovi koji imame za jednokratna upotreba, namaluvanje na na stvaranje to na toj medicinski otpad, bidejki golem del od njih se oslobodova odivo zemljata vo forma na kancerogeni materiji, vo vozduhu tisto tako, što znači jedno treba da zna, da zapametime deka globalno celite može da se postignat samo ako si te dejstvujeme zajedno i ako dejstvujeme sekoj vo svojot del. Zato i može da se kaže da ne postoji čovekovo zdravje bez planetarno zdravje. Morame da ja začuvame planetata za da bideme i nije zdravi. Blagodar. Blagodarime profesorke za vaše to iscrpno predavanje. Pa da vidime nešto okolo diskusijata i prašanja ako ima v odnos na predavanjato na profesor Eftimova. Da li nekoj saka nešto da praša, da se nadovrze ili nekoj zaključok da... Ne, znam dika sme pitumali brzo, no mi bih tam bih mnogo brzo. Znači, ja samo sam da zaključim. Ti rastaj za nešto, me rastaj si prave tu na se dijelo, kad se zemljame to su vrši, kaže da je kooperativno predstavljeno. Tu su predlađeni da ako rabutime v rudnici, vednož... Mikrofon vam poveli. Ako rabutime v rudnici, vednož bi bila zatvorena. I to mi beše prvo, vtoro, jaz se evo floranot na vistina go čustvam, ako je peta sala, jaz sem bo prva, ja go čustvam in na vistina mi smeta. Počnem so halotanu, si te znajo, ma kako, mislim, pomladite, ne znajo, profesorka te znajo. Da, vi je prethodno in vi je go na, znači onaka dojahme doma. Vtoro, što mi je onam najbitno, to što najposle se setivme, da ka nije, Isto tako pridonesuvame ne samo samo zagadu, samo oštetuvanje, tukaj vlijajame i na sredinata. Jaz, ki go povaram predavanje, to najserjozno vi kažem od profesorkata, mislim, znam, nije se znajem i ki mi go dade, međuto, sakam da to se proširi in mislim, da ki naše to združenje, treba malo se poaktivno da nekoliko pati povtoruvame, imalo i denes, ki se bajale predavanje, to jaz ne uspijem da go pratim, međuto, da postaneme svesni za naša ta sredinata, sekojdnevna praksa, deka vlijajeme na oštetuvanje, to na desfluranost, zašto se ja ne go nudat besplatno, mislim besplatno, se izvinuvam, međutoa, 
Fakt je deka predizvikova zagodovanje, fakt je deka ona što mene za spinalnota, na primer, totalno zaborav na maskite, deka ke se vraćame na reusable, na povtorno recikliranje, samo da bideme svesni, ništo poveke. Samo od tuka da počneme, mislim deka ke go podobrime i zagadovanje to v operacionata sala, so to ke go podobrime zagadovanje to na... A jaz sot mu zaradi toa i go spremi v ovo predavanje, bidejki mene mi беше за влијанието на диазотоксидот како што правилно не ли е не е тој азотоксид него е диазотоксид врз персоналот во операционните сали испитувањето беше реално заедно со та лабораторија така и нас на Рударски факултет во Штип и на вистина резултатите беа фрапантни посебно во тој дел кај што сегашниот ректор тој инаку е експерт за проветрување и за токму за условите за работа во одредени делови пред се во рудниците и тој сам ми кажа дека во вакви услови сите рудници би биле затворени бидејќи се работи нели за рударите треба да бидат заштитени така а за докторите воопшто не е важно ние имавме една сала каде што немавме централен довод одевме со воци големи воци со кислород и азотен оксидул Таму за два часа работевме орел анестезија, тонзилектомии. Бидејќи беа многу почни случаи, почни случаи, тоа за два часа веќе беше максимум и по тие нивни мерења ги носевме ние сите. Кај нас би требале ние сите да бидеме мртви. Ама ние, пошто сме многу поотпорни, не е проблем. Јас само да прокоментирам. Значи... Прво докторатот на Билјана беше up to date, денеска што значи животна средина и што све нашите анестетици можат да направат. Баш во тој период тој Европското здружение ми прати писмо дали некој од кај нас се занимава со полуција. И ја си Билјана одговорив ме да и би можеле да се вклучиме во некоја европска студија. Значи, ја би само нешто кажала во однос на она што денеска го работевме. Денес се чуја многу нешта за токсичност, овај, применливост на некои анестетици и како треба да се работи. Полека да почнем да се преориентираме. Таму кај што азотниот оксидул се употребува веќе да се снабдат апарати кои што работат кислород и воздух, а не со азотен оксидул. Понатаму се виде дека тивата може би и е, сега овај е, новите ставови за е, мултипна анестезија во кој што ги сите овај можности на интравенозна апликација може да се користат да бидат она што ќе биде иднина на нашата анестезија. Па после 4 години да направиме една анализа како сме денеска анестезирале, а како ќе анестезираме. То би можела да биде еден проект на нашето здружение во кој што ќе ги прифатиме обштите услови кои што ги денеска нашата планета захтева. Тоа е вака мој Стафи мислење. Да, да. Порак. Јас се извинувам, морам и кај хирургија. Ајде. Да, во ред. Во врска со тоа што спомнете здружението да се активира на оваа тема, ние веќе имавме едно со турците, една баб сесија, на која што јас го представив нашето здружение на тема Greening the OR. И доста читав за да се спремам за тоа предавање. И да, првите препораки се да се користи тива наместо инхалаторна анестезија, меѓутоа сега најновите препораки излегуваат дека пропофолот, т.е. фенолот како метаболит на пропофолот е најден во отпадните води од болниците и во почвата долго време после исфрлање на отпадните води. Па од тука произлегува дека веќе тивата не е над волативните анестетици, туку се во флуранот може да се употребува, а останатите да се забораат. 
Така да, се уште не, не, не е конклузивно дека тивата е идеално решение, не и тоа точно е што го рече професорката, кога ќе се направи сума сумаром енергијата која што се троши за да се уништат пластичните, значи струјата што ја трошиме за префузорот, шприцевите, фрлањето, сето тоа се израмнува некаде со штетата што ја прави инхалаторната анестезија. Па препораките се уништувањето да биде со, со времена технологија во која би се направиле а, производи кои повторно би ги користеле. Значи да не ствараме да ние рецикла, да рециклажа, не ги, а не уништување. Гориме како нели да ги согоруваме при што се ослободува исто така голема количина на CO2. Да се прават а, производи кои нели reusable, да бидат повторно употребени за а, друга цел. Uh, сега, секако за тоа некој друг треба да, 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 се, да го каже како. Нашето е да бидеме свесни дека ние учествуваме uh, со голем процент во ун... глобалното затоплување. Нели, како така. Бидејќи имаме голем број на апаратура и, и тоа што беше изненадувачко дека и кај спинална анестезија, сепак имаме емисија на CO2, бидејќи се користат uh, high flow нели, за оксигенирање на пациентите. Црхе, мислам дека и дискусијата беше баш продуктивна, успешна, разменивме некои искуства и веј од помладите колеги. Би благодарам. Сега ја најавувам доцент доктор Ваня Трајковска, нашата лидерка во единицата за интензивна нега. Повели Ваня. Па, 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 така е. Лидерка, ама. Така е. Дел од тимот. Да. Добар ден, драги колеги. За почеток сакам да им честитам на организаторите на овој прелбав конгрес, доктор Весна Дурнев и посебно доктор Филип Номовски, кој што зема, зема огромен терет во организацијата, исто така и во сите, на сите други а, учесници во, во организацијата на овој успешен конгрес. Се надевам дека и понатаму ќе продолжиме со овакви конгреси, сдруженија, медицински едукации, да се гледаме, да се дружиме и да имаме предавања. Исто така, сакам да им честитам на сите предавачи за прекрасните успешни предавања, на сите слушатели и се вкупно, како последна сесија, да заклучам дека конгресот е успешен, може да биде пример за сите други професии, па примери за и за понатамошни вакви организации, едукации и така натаму. Околу тоа што да одберам тема една кратка презентација, се мисле помеѓу неколку работи, некако ми дојде идеја за вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија, не дека е нешто ново, меѓутоа пак е нешто со кое што ние некако секојдневно се сопнуваме во брзината на ослободување на пациентите од механичка вентилација и као во нашата брзина на лекување и добивање на побрз да, побрз одговор, побрзо ослободување, будење и така натаму ни представува стално една сопка, па тоа ми беше и да речем на некој начин, ајде идеја, предизвик, не знам, да направам едно а, кратко предавање околу тоа што до сега се знае и што е нешто ново во третманот на вентилатор асоцираните а, пневмонии. Вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии се пневмонии, назокомијални пневмонии, кои што се развиваат кај пациенти, кои што се на механичка вентилација. Според времето на појавување се а, делат или се дефинираат како рано настаната вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија, која што настанува помеѓу 48 и 72 часа после тракеалната интубација и а, покасно настанати после 72 а, часа. Според патогенезата има два важни процеси на настанување. Тоа е бактериска колонизација од аеродигестивниот тракт или аспирација на контаминирана а, содржина во ниските дисни, дишни патишта. Механичката вентилација, интубација нормално, а, го превенира а, ослободувањето, кашлањето и чистењето на мукоцилиарниот а, апарат, а изворите може да бидат на инфекција може да бидат ендогени и екзогени. 
Значи, на ова слика може да видиме на кој начин а, настанува а, вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија. Значи, тоа е колонизација или контаминација, да речем, на дишното стебло со бактерии, а, кое што може да биде од различни причини, значи од надворешно влијание или хематогено а, ширење и продирање во а, ниските партии на белите дробови и настанување на инфекција. Во однос на патогенезата, значи, настанува преку, да речам, колонизирање со бактериски инфекти од, во субглотичниот дел од гастричната содржина, нивна инхалација или контаминација преку, да речам, нечистите раце на, на персоналот кој што работи со пациентите. Може исто така да настане со хематогено ширење, со инхалација или, со, или со друго некое ширење. Без разлика, сето се сведува на пренесувањето на инфекцијата на долните респираторни патишта и настанување на пневмонијата. Значи, ширењето, односно во патогенезата, може да постојат два начина, како што кажав, ендогено или а, екзогено. Ка ендогеното е, а, знаеме дека е а, значи, нарушена а, протекцијата на аеродиегестивниот тракт, колонизација на назофаринксот и спуштање на инфекцијата а, надолу. А, исто така, според механизмот на, на кој што настанува вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија, настанува аспирација на а, колонизирани секрети а, во долните дишни патишта и, или преку а, хемато, а, хематогено ширење, преку а, крв, настанување на а, инфекција во однос на екзогеното ширење и допренесување на настанување вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија е преку контаминираните раце на персоналот кој што работи со пациентите кои што се на механичка вентилација. Па затоа многу често врнуваме, многу често да речам секој ден тоа е станати рутина во однос на одржување на хигиената на, на персоналот кој што директно работи со пациентите кои што се на механичка вентилација. Како што кажав, нозокомијалните инфекции се кај пациенти кои што се на механичка вентилација во единиците за интензивно лекување. Уш еднаш ке повторам дека настанувањето и патогенезата е ендогена и екзогено ширење на најчесто грам негативни бактерии или мрса. Настанувањето на вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија може да оди со висок морталитет и овие инфекции се доста резистентни на антибиотици. Инфекциите кои што настануваат во единиците за интензивно лекување ке пациенти кои што се на механичка вентилација, значи ги делиме на две групи, вентилатор асоцирани пневмонии и пневмонии кои што се, не се а, вентилатор асоцирани, туку се резултатот веќе настаната а, повреда на, на белите дробови. Вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии се нозокомијални инфекции а, кои што настануваат во хоспитални а, услови ке пациенти кои што се на механичка вентилација повеќе од 48 часа. А, за поставување на диагнозата потребни се да се исполнат некои параметри кои што ги гледаме како а, клиничка слика на вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии, а тоа се висока или ниско, на, ниска температура која што е ново настаната кај пациент кој што е веќе на механичка а, вентилација, ново настаната а, променета секреција, на дишното стебло, диснеја, берадикардија, тахикардија, нови микробиолошки резултати, добиени од крв, од спутум, од трахиален аспират, од плеврален аспират. Исто така, наоди од ренген, наоди нови од компјутерска томографија. На сите овие компјутерска томографија или ренген наоди може да видиме нови инфилтрати кои што не водат кон диагноза на ново настаната вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија. Та, значи, вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија настанува кај пациенти кои што се повеќе од 48 часа на респиратор, кои што се интубирани или имаат трахеостомска канила, имаат нови рентгеновошки видливи пулмонални инфилтрати и исполнуваат најмалку два од следните критериуми: температура на 38 или под 36, со леукоцитоза на 12.000 или леукопенија под 4.000 и а, порулентен а, респираторен а, секрет. 
како што кажав, рано настаната, касно настаната, рано настаната два до четири дена после интубацијата, најчесто кај рано настаната како патогенеза или причинители се стафило колку се уреус, трепто колку се неумонија, хемофилус, инфлуенце, протиус специес, серација специес, клепсиела или шерихија коли. Касно настаната вапе после пет дена од интубацијата, значи пет дена и поише од пет дена, Овде како причинители се најчесто псеудомонна са ерогиноза и овие се тие бактерии против кои што ние најчесто се бориме и ни прават проблем. Мрса, ацинетобактер специес, ентеробактер специес, ванкомицин резистентен ентеробактер. Како што кажав, радиолошки може да се видат нови единични дифузни или нови, нови сепак инфилтрати кои што не водат кон диагноза на вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија. Вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија пред да се третира треба да се превенира. Како? Значи не фармакологски со одржување на многу сериозна а, хигиена и стерилност на персоналот кој што работи со пациентите, пациентот да биде во една полулежичка позиција за да се спречи тоа аспирација и микроаспирација на желудечната содржина во респираторниот тракт, да се превенира а, користење на големи, голема количина на а, хранење по голем болус од 200 мл, значи помали почести а, болуси на храна, а, континуирано а, чистење и одржување на респираторниот тракт, потоа на влажнувачи, менување на положбата и некои а, други. Ова е исто слика како изгледа на настаната вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија кај пациент кој што е веќе на респиратор. Од фармакологските а, стратегии се превенција на стрес, укус, профилактична антибиотска терапија која е потребно, а, користење на хлор а, хексидин и а, Профилакса исто антибиотска кај неутропенични и други ризични типови на пациенти со а, низ, ниско ниво на имунитет и многу ретко вакцини, пишани се во литературата, ние не сме користеле. Значи, рано настаната а, ВАП кај пациенти интубирани, како што кажав, помалку 48 а, часа, таа е со подобра прогноза, предизвикувачи се а, бактерии кои што се а, посензитивни на антибиотици, побрагу и полесно се лечи, а додека касно настаната ВАП е предизвикана од посериозни микроорганизми кои што се доста резистентни, има повисок морталитет и потешко се лечи. А, третманот, најчесто емпириски, а, затоа што се уште немаме идентификувано нели, кој патоген микроорганизм ја предизвикува оваа пневмонија и се уште немаме резултат за да знаеме целно да, да, да делуваме. Ке, ке ви покажем и една статистичка анализа од нашата интензивност. Најчесто е псеудомонас аерогиноза како причинител за вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии кај нас, па и во светот го делат првото место со ацинетобактер а, баумани и ацинетобактер а, специес. Значи, во третманот, иницијално треба да бидат третирани пациентите со широк спектар на антибиотици кои што ги покрива сите овие познати а, можни причинители, се дека не се добие точно за кој микроорганизам стане во збор, а потоа, како што кажав, да се стесни кон целна терапија. Значи, ова е една, да речем, мала статистичка анализа, а, мислам дека е од пред некоја година ја направивме, еве, кој е најчест причинител во нашето индесивно, како и секаде во светот, тоа е псеудомоносаерогиноза, на второ место ацинетобактер специес во литературата, во другите интензивни во светот, ацинетобактер Бауман е обично, меѓутоа од прилика се тие, тие бактерии, кои што се најчести, доста се резистентни на антибиотици, на вистина тешко се искоренуваат. Патогениот организам може да биде и настанувањето на пневмонијата може да биде секако искомплицирани од самата друга патолошка состојба на, на пациентот. Честотата на псеудомоносерогиноза добиен во единиците за интензивно лекување е од 23,47% 23,4% на седмиот ден и 57,8% на 14-тиот ден. Значи, е доста често. Вентилатор асоцирани тепнеумони ги зафаќаат 15% од 
от веќе настанатите хоспитални а, инфекции, 9 до 70% од пациентите кои што се на механичка вентилација добиваат некој тип на ваква бактерија или добиваат некој тип на полесен или потежок тип на вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија. Настанувањето на вентилатор асоцирана на пневмонија го продолжува хоспиталното лекување за една до три недели, има морталитет од 13 до 55% и го зголемува трошокот на, на болницата. Како што кажав на прво место псеудомонас аргиноза, ацината бактер специи, ацината бактер баумани и на трето место е мрса. Ризик фактори кај кого нели, и кога би се појавило се секако дека има поризични помалку ризични пациенти, меѓутоа кај секого може да а, очекуваме. А, сепак поризична категорија се а, пациенти кои што се помалку хранети, детска возраст, по возраст на имунокомпрометирани, пациенти со различни коморбидитети, пациенти со сериозна а, друга примарна патологија, тешко повредени пациенти, пациенти без свест, кома и пациенти со мултиорганска слабост. Третманот сепак е антибиотски, како што кажав, емпириски и целен, но раното препознавање, брзото делување со, со дветен антибиотик води кон успешно лекување. Значи, третманот е антибиотски, прво емпириски, по потоа таргет терапија со добивање на точните информации за кој патоген механизм се, се, се работи. Од антибиотската терапија која што може да се користи, цефипим или пиперацилин, тазобактам или меронем, левофлоксацин или комбинации, кога постои а, ризикот да биде а, мрса, а, тогаш се размислува за ванкомицин. Значи, во емпириската терапија се оди прво со антипсеудомонални а, пеницилини, пиперацилин и тазобактам, или цефалоспорински антибиотици, или карбапенеми. Значи, се зависи од клиничката слика, од пациентот и од искуството на тимот кој што работи во единицата за интензивно, точно со а, кој тип на антибиотик ке се а, почне, се додека се, не се добие целниот а, патоген механизам и да се оди со целна антибиотска терапија. Доколку не добиеме одговор на антибиотската терапија, треба да се размисли и продолжува клиничката слика на инфективно заболување, треба да се размисли и за други а, можни причини, дека се работи за некој резистентно патоген, а, патогена бактерија, дека е суперинфекција, некој нечеста бактерија, нова, и тоа се случува, имаме некои нови бактерии што се појавуваат, што не сме ги имале а, порано, настанување на абсцез во белите а, дробови или некоја друга екстракомунална инфекција. Или може да се работи за некој неинфективен а, настан, како што е, на пример, конгенитално срцево конгестивно срцево попуштање или арц или пулмонална емболија, телектаза и некоја друга а, причина. А, по, друга, а, други антибиотици кои што може да се користат емпириски се флуорокинолони или аминокликузиди или полимиксини кои стимат многу често доколку се потврди а, постојање на ацинетобактер специес или ацинетобактер баумани. Веќе имаме и резистентни соеви на, од ацинетобактер на колистин и одиме веќе и со повисоки дози него што беа а, порано. А, доколку се потврди мрса, се оди со ванкомицин или линезолит, во зависност од тоа а, а, што ќе покаже антибиограмот. Времето на лекување е 7 до 14 дена, доколку се утврди псеудомонас или ацинетобактер, кои што се високо резистентни, се оди со подолготраен третман 14 или 21, 14 до 21 ден. Доколку се работи за имунокомпрометирани пациенти, тогаш ще размислуваме и за друг тип на инфекции, не овие стандардните кои што ни се предизвикува, че за вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија, то се пневмоцистис, 
карини, цитомеогаловирус, туберкулоза, фунги, исто така имаме кај пациенти со коморбидитет, да речеме диабетес мелитус или имунокомпрометирани пациенти. Како компликација и несоодветно лекување или немање одговор на третманот, може да настане МПМ, кој што има специфична клиничка слика и лекувањето е комбинирано терапевски, конзервативно и оперативно, ако е потребно. Што се новините? Ова е се нешто што до сега го знаеме, го практикуваме и, да речам, дел од нашето искуство. Што е новината околу третманот на вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија? Ова ми беше баш и некоја, од тука ми излези идејата, да речам. Тоа е една нова студија која што излезе на сега, 2024 година, во Лансет, во јануари февруари 2024, значи баш е нова, дека Студијата покажува а, дека краткорочното а, делување и лекување на вентилатор асоцираната пневмонија не е инфериорно во однос на долгорочното лекување. А, значи, станува збор за рандомизирана клиничка а, студија, која што е а, извршена во, во три азиски земји и констатирано е дека краткиот индивидуализиран курс на антибиотска терапија дава исти клинички одговор и не е инфериорен во однос на долгиот антибиотски третман кај вентилатор асоцираните пневмони. Значи ова студија која што вклучила 39 единици за интензивно лекување во 6 болници во Непал, Сингапур и Тајланд вклучила вентилатор асоцирани вклучила пациенти со вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија кои што се механички вентилирани повеќе од 48 часа и кај кои што име ординиран антибиотик според антибиограм кај пациентите се се поделени во две групи пациенти со пократок третман, седум, антибиотски третман 7 дена или помалку и а, третман како што до сега веќе е користен 8 дена или а, повеќе. Значи краткиот, пократкиот третман 7 дена или помалку со целна антибиотска терапија не е инфериорен во однос на долгиот да речам подолготрајниот третман антибиотски. Како што кажав, пред третманот поважна е превенцијата на вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија. Таа вклучува неколку, да речам, работи кои што можеме ние да ги користиме пред да добиеме и да навлеземе во диагностика, третмани, компликациите што ги носи вентилатор асоцирана пневмонија. Тоа е елевација или полуседнечка положба на горниот дел од креветот на, пациент, на пациентот. Честа хигиена на устата со хоехексидин, профилакса на стрес укус, дневен план за седација, брзо будење на пациентите и профилакса на главокавенска тромбоза. Како заклучок можам да кажам дека вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии се многу чести во единиците за интензивно лекување и наша секојдневна борба се карактеризираат со тоа што имаат што се предизвикани од бактерии кои што се доста резистентни. Вентилатор асоцираните пневмонии имаат и висок висока стапка на морталитет. Многу е важна превенцијата, како што кажа, в организирањето и однесувањето на персоналот во однос на хигиената и ракувањето со пациентите на механичка вентилација, рано препознавање рано делување со антибиотски третман, рано ослободување на пациентите, добивање брзо на буден пациент, добра физикална терапија и брза мобилизација. Значи, вентилатор асоцираните пневмони остануваат наш, еден од нашите главни предизвици во единиците за интензивно лекување. Секој ден сме, да речам, се поискусни и а, попредострожни во однос на тоа. Се повеќе одиме кон превенција, се повеќе одиме кон брза целна терапија. Ова со пократкорочното лекување тек ќе го пробаме да го имплементираме и ќе видиме како, какви резултати ќе даде. Ви благодарам многу за вниманието и ви посакувам да имате убав престој во убавиот охрид. Како? Да. Да, да. И да се дружим да и понатаму. Да. Благодариме Ваня за да, многу дали има некој убаво предавање, да, да, дали има некој нешто да праша или може би да некој заклучок. 
некое свое мислење да даде во однос на оваа тема? Или... Па може секако вашето мислење и вашите прашања ни се драгоцени. Па ние чекаме да ви ни... <laughs> нешто да ни предложите. Значи, помина Секогаш, да. многу време од кога излегов от интензивното да. лекување, ме интересира. Да. Како сте со интрахоспиталните Да, е, имам за тоа, вие уште не бевте, баш имав и статистички, ве сега ќе ви, ќе ви да. го кажам. Да, значи, имам. много нашето... ме интересира, оти, ова е едно да. со друго поврзано. поврзано. Значи, да. еве, ова е статистика од една година од нашата, да. нашето интензивно. А, значи, предизвикува, че сте до момента во Еридиноза, на второ месе, ако не се бакте, да. Значи, тука нема промена, нема тоа е тоа. Нема никоја промени, значи мрса, ечерикија, кови, ентерококус, ентерококус, артемите бакте и ова Значи, на тоа се, се и, уште... Се уште се тие најактилни, најчесто се удрујат и артемите бакте. Значи, бактери кои што се... Доста твърдокорни. Да, е доста Тоа се резистентни. Е што зато ме интересираше да. дали се нещо сменило. Ебе, тие се бактериите. Значи, тука само личната хигиена на болните, да, која што зависи од персоналот. Од персоналот, така е. Значи, тука борба, што да кажам, да. мислам, треба да бидат упорни, пошто тоа го работите. Да, тоа. Мегу превентивните мерки, уште од мое време, а секако и денеска активно, Убаво го стави, значи, неколку пати во тек на денот хигиена на устата. Најефикасна хигиена на устата е мијење на забите. Да ги научиме сестрите да ги мијат забите на нашите така, болни да. во интензивно лекување. И мислам дека дури и до 20-30% ке се намали инциденцата ке се намали. Така е превен... на овај... Абсолютно. Тоа е вака мојот коментар да. и што ме интересираше. Да. Благодариме професорке многу на да. прашањето. Да, прашање? Велате, ако има друг некоја прашање? Добро, ако нема. Добро, да ако нема, тогаш ви благодарам многу. Благодариме, Бајан. Одиме по натаму. Чеки само, не знам како да... Може да. Да, секако. Uh, кај нас во единицата за интензивно лекување сестрите ги мија ги вања пациентите. И на вистина имаше многу помалку uh, по uh, условите беа многу по така едноставни да не кажам во однос на сега. Сега веќе сите ги мија, ги бришат со влажни мараници, ги мачкаат со некои кремови, а пациентите ни се по uh, секој втор има некоја инфекција интрахоспитална. Не мора да биде на вентилатор, зборувам за било кој yeah. пациент. Значи, едноставното мијење со вода и со, и со сапун, сапун <laughs> многу повеќе ги превенираш от Абсолют... сега. Да, да, да. да Тоа зборувам се пред 30 години кога почна специализација. Се согласувам. Во Бригада за здравствена нега на сестри да. си напишала нешто што се знае во светот. Кога се ваня болен, правиш три работи. Прво хигиена, превенција од инфекција, Најважното нешто што нашите болничари на времето доаѓаа во 6 сатот од Савајле, ги ваняа болните и ги масираа. Полека, полека, 8 сатот, у 8 сатот сите сме тука, не можат они да посветат внимание на болните и почна и интрахоспиталните инфекции да се јуваат работи, кои што јас кога се запослив не постоева. Така, значи, да. тоа се чоланчески доаѓаше од Англија и вика постојат интрахоспитални инфекции. Што е бе тоа чове интрахоспитална инфекција? Леле, зар имало Кај време кога не имало? Да. <laughs> да. Ви, ви благодарам. Да. да, превенција, хигиена и превенција, тоа, тоа би било... Најдобро. Ви благодарам многу на сите. Да. Ја поканувам доцент доктор Александра Петрушева да, да ја изложи својата презентација. Uh, 
почитувани колеги, да ве поздравам уште еднаш тие што сте присутни и тие што не сте присутни, исто така ги поздравувам. Многу сум срекна за успешноста на Конгресот, повторно ќе го истакнам тоа и се надевам дека така и ќе завршиме. Тоа го кажав и на почетокот како модератор, тоа го кажувам и сега како предавач на едно предавање во кое што сакам пред се да ги разменам своите искуства со вас од операционата сала при водењето на пациентите кои што се реципиенти на бубрежна трансплантација, но исто така и да споделиме некои познавања од досегашната понова литература околу ефикасноста на преемтивната мултимодална неопијатна аналгезија кај овие пациенти, но не само ефикасноста, туку да биде тоа и на некој начин безбедна анестезија за ова група на специфични пациенти. Пред се, значи, уште пред да започнам со своето изложување, неминовно е за да дојдам до крајот на целта на ова предавање и заклучокот, морам да го потенцирам, да ја потенцирам всушност дефиницијата што представува хронично бубрежно заболување и кои се тие ризик фактори кои што допринесуваат за настанување на ова заболување. А особено би сакала да истакнам нешто што не се содржи во овој слайд, дека ова представува една прогресивна состојба, која што всушност се однесува на повеќе од 10% од обштата популација и проценува Светската здравствена организација дека всушност ова ќе биде петата најчеста хронична болест до 2040 година и водачка причина за смртност на 21. век. Што значи дека ова не представува само здравствен, туку представува еден глобален, обштествен, социјален и економски проблем, особено за земјите во развој, како што е Република Македонија. И исто така побарува примена на некој од можните терапевски опции за долго преживување, долгорочно преживување нели, на овие пациенти, но исто така оваа прогресија на ова хронично заболување всушност истовремено и значено го зголемува ризикот од кардиоваскуларните заболувања, кои што се честа причина за хоспитализација на овие болни и всушност се честа причина за зголемено зголемена смртност на овие болни. Нешто со маусот имам проблем. Значи, како? Да, од многу предавања, да, дали може со маусот да видиме што е. Не, 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 па сакам да... Аха. Ам... Значи, во суштина трансплантацијата на бубрек е единствената долгорочна опција за третман на хроничната бубрежна, бубрежна болест во крајниот низен стадиум и се смета дека стапката на ова операција исто така ќе се зголемува во наредните децени која е нели, споредбата помеѓу трансплантацијата на оджив дарител и кадаверичната, секогаш значи, living донор трансплантацијата, значи, примателите имаат поквалитетен живот, имаат помал ризик од компликации и секако подолго преживување на графтот, особено кога таа се применува како превентивна стратегија. Како и секоја друга значи, хирушка интервенција, така и бубрежната трансплантација предизвикува повреда на ткивото, исто така предизвикува стрес, одговор и болка. Меѓутоа, болката кај овие пациенти, односно менеджирањето на болката кај овие пациенти е доста специфична и ограничена е премената на аналгетиците поради потенцијалната токсичност, променетиот метаболизам, дистрибуцијата, модификација на врзување на протеините и одложениот клиренс. 
Но исто така сакам да потенцирам дека овие пациенти, освен основното заболување, односно ова хронично бубрежно заболување, имаат и повеќе, повеќе коморбидитети, кои што всушност кога ќе се искомбинираат на некој начин со лошо менеджираната болка, всушност доведуваат до кардиоваскуларни, хемодинамски пораметувања, исто така респираторни компликации, кои што пак имаат влијание на целокупното закрепнување на овие пациенти и преживувањето на графтот. Поради сето тоа, сега во поново време се оди кон тоа да менеджирањето на болката кај примателите на бубрежна трансплантација нели се оди со тој мултимодален пристап на аналгезија се со цел да се минимизира опиоидната аналгезија. Но не треба да ги заборавиме и опиоидите како една традиционална опција за лекување на болката во постоперативниот период. Секако дека нивната зголемена примена ке доведе, значи тоа се докажало и низ повеќето студии како точно, како факт, дека доведува до лоша, лоша значи, на крај да речаме ефект врз бубрежниот, бубрежниот графт и преживувањето на пациентите, значи дури има и влијание, влијание на, на смртноста, односно на зголемува смртноста кај овие пациенти. Исто така, кај оваа група на пациенти се образуваат метаболити, кои што всушност допринесуваат за поголемо постоперативно, значи почесто гадење, повраќање, ефекти на седација, значи неволен миоклонус и респираторна депресија. Затоа, неодамнешната литература и ерас патеката ја нагласуваат ефикасноста на мултимодалната, значи аналгезија со минимално опиоидна аналгезија во комбинација со поновите регионални техники, односно интрафациални блокови. Ерас, ерас протоколите в сушности ја потикнуваат раната мобилизација на овие пациенти, значи раната исхрана кај овие пациенти, раното отстранување на инвазивните бенски артериски линии, понатаму катетри, намален болнички престој, значи добро влијаат во оздравувањето на овие пациенти. Постојат повеќе можности, значи повеќе неопиоидни аналгетски модалитети, кои што кога се користат меѓусебно во една комбинација, значи ја подобруваат аналгезијата и при тоа може да се минимизира или пак во некој случај целосно да се елиминира изложеността на опиоидите кај овие пациенти. Една од тие опции е примената на нестероидните антиинфламаторни лекови. Со нивната предоперативна примена сите знаеме дека е докажено и се овозможува намалување на болката, намалување на потрошувачката на опиоидите, намалување на гадење, повраќање и така натака. Но што е сега карактеристично за овие пациенти, дали е така едноставно да се даваат нестероидните антиинфламаторни лекови кај пациентите подложени на бубрежна трансплантација? Не, заради тоа што нивната поврзана со зголемена инциденца на акутно бубрежно оштетување е потенцијален ризик значи, од крвавење, како и нефротоксичност и се препорачува нивно одбегнување кај примателите на бубрежната трансплантација и исто така што е доста карактеристично нивната комбинација заедно со заедно со имуносупресивната терапија доведуваат до нефротоксичност односно да дојде до оштетување на функцијата на графтот исто така Парацетамолот е најчесто применуван како составен дел на таа мултимодална аналгезија, дел од протоколите на измени. Тоа е поддржано и е докажано во повеќе метаанализи, особено значи кај пациенти кои што биле примателни на бубрежна трансплантација и кај тие пациенти кои што примиле парацетамол, в сушност, во првите 4 часа во постоперативниот период, белката била значајно помала, 
Исто така, значено, помала била потребата да се даваат опиоидни аналгетици, што е многу значено, но сега и тука имаме некакви известни ограничувања, поради фактот дека кај овие пациенти обично истовремено имаме и хронична промена на хепарот, така што, така што употребата на парацетамола, таа рутинска употреба, не е баш така едноставна и неговата дневна доза значи, би требало да се намали кај овие пациенти. Понатаму за лидокаинот, апсолутно докажано, за употреба негова во состав на мултимодалната аналгезија, особено кај пациентите кои што се подложени на бубрежна трансплантација, докажано преку студија, каде што примателите на бубрежна трансплантација во текот на интервенцијата примале инфузија на лидокаин 2% и во постоперативниот период, на вистина, болката била многу помала и исто така, потребата за аналгезија во постоперативниот период многу помала. Габа аналозите исто така во обичајно се користат во мултимодалните пристапи на аналгезија, меѓутоа мора да се внимава поради нивните несакани ефекти секако. Кетаминот во поново време повторно се применува како дел од мултимодалните протоколи, Меѓутоа, не треба да се забораваат неговите несакани ефекти, особено оние хемодинамски промени кои што би имале влијание на самиот бубрежан графт. Невроаксиалните блокови. Значи, тие се применуваат со децени на назад и никако не треба да ги заборавиме како регионални техники, бидејќи се докажани дека со својата примена имаат многу придобивки во намалување на болката, но исто така и намален ризик од лабока венска тромбоза, рана мобилизација кај пациентите и други бенефити. Како и кај сите други големи абдоминални интервенции, така и кај бубрежната трансплантација, невроаксиалните блокови се покажале успешно во купирање на болката во постоперативниот период. Тие овозможуваат една хемодинамска стабилност кај ваквите пациенти и нормална заштита со тоа на функцијата на графтот. Меѓутоа, ризикот кој е кај овие пациенти, присуството на коагулопатијата и тромбоцитната дисфункција, кои што и не се така не во обичаени кај овие пациенти, така што мора да се внимава со администрирање на оваа регионална техника кај ваквите пациенти за да не настанат компликации во смисла на хематом. Интрафасцијалните блокови се нешто ново, нова генерација на техники на регионална анестезија. Примарната цела се како од лабоката фасција, која што ги обкружува нели мускулите, нервите, нервните влакна и механорецепторите. Поентата на овие блокови е всушност да се избегне директното вбризгување во нервот, и се а, минимизира ризикот од компликации, односно оштетувањето на а, нервот и настанување на невроаксиален хематом. А, овие блокови се исто така докажани во примената кај бубрежната трансплантација, а, како една ефикасна техника за обезбедување на контрола на болката, со значено намалување на примената на опиоидите. Што би кажале за ТАП блокот? Тоа е еден е, од најпроочуваните методи на аналгезија кај примателите на бубрежна трансплантација. Е, првпат тој е опишан во 2001 година, меѓутоа во последните децени е, представува еден од главните компоненти на ЕРАС протоколите и мултомиодолната аналгезија и е идеален за примателите на бубрежна трансплантација. Е, затоа што лапаратомијата која што се изведува кај овие пациенти е всушност покриена со овој блок. Меѓутоа, меѓутоа неговата е, негативна страна е тоа што не ја покрива висцералната болка. Исто така е, разните повреди кои што може да настанат при администрирање на овој блок и е, се разбира системската токсичност која што може да биде предизвикана како и кај секој друг локален анестетик и секоја друга техника која што се применува. 
квадратос лумборум блокот што се однесува до него во однос на примателите на бубрежна трансплантација, постојат а, студии кои што во суштина докажуваат дека тој на некој начин има предност во однос на а, тап блокот. А, но тој има пак од друга страна негативни, а, негативни ефекти во смисла на тоа дека а, неговиот механизам на дејствување а, се уште е нели, непознат, дилема и дискусија а, и исто така неговите вариации а, се на некој начин а, негативна страна а, и непредведливото покривање на дерматомите. Но тоа и не е толку важно, колку што е поважно дека ова представува еден така наречен, сите го знаеме како длабок а, блок, а, кој што во суштина може да биде а, многу поризичен кај овие а, пациенти, баш заради тоа што може да настане почесто нели компликација во смисла на а, хематом. И на крај еректор спайн плен блокот, а, кој што за прв пат а, е опишен во 2019 година кај пациент кој што е приматал на бубрежна трансплантација, Во 2016-та е прв пат опишан како блок, меѓутоа за три години подоцна веќе се преминува кај бубрежната трансплантација и до сега се направени многу студии, многу споредби на овој блок со останатите интерфасцијални блокови и исто така со другите регионални техники и на крај е докажано и покажано дека овој всушност интерфасцијален блок е може би најбезбеден за пациентите кои што се приматели на бубрежната трансплантација, а тоа е заради неговата анатомска локација, местото на администрација на, на локалниот анестетик. И исто така може да се применува кај пациенти кои што имаат и висок ризик од крварење, односно па ги пациенти кои што примаат антикоагулантна терапија, па дури и хепарин. И на крај, како заклучок, менаджирањето со болката при бубрежна трансплантација се уште представува предизвик и покрај за селената подршка на протоколите за минимизирање на опиоидите и распатеката, заради тоа што и нивната примена не е така едноставна кај пациентите за бубрежна трансплатација. Така што пристапот кон менаджирање на болката потребно е да биде индивидуализиран и мултимодален. Ви благодарам многу за вниманието. Благодарам за преубавата презентација. Дали некој има прашање или коментар? како пример за... Да. Да. Честитки, Александра. Има... Може микрофонот само... Да, значи моето лично искуство со дексметомидинот можам да кажам дека не е големо во однос на бубрежната трансплантација, меѓутоа низ литературата, низ нашата работа во однос на твојот доктор, докторат, твојата докторска дисертација, всушност имаме веќе неколку нели пилот студија и неколку резултати кои што всушност покажа дека и дексметомидинот може да а, биде дел од а, терапијата, односно а, дел од а, нели начинот, еден од начините на созбивање на болката, како интраоперативно, така и постоперативно и би бил безбеден, безбедна метода, значи не само ефикасна, тоа и на почетокот го кажам, значи не треба да биде само ефикасна, туку треба да биде и безбедна за овие пациенти затоа што на вистина се специфична група на пациенти. Да. Да. Колешката сигурно Uh, ние го користиме. Имаме некоја студија за веќе 60 на пациенти. Почнавме од она дека имавме алергии, 
Odlično ni ide, iskreno jaz poveke očekujem teka ga koristime vo intenzivna, nikogaš ne uspevame samo 24 časa, stalno nešto ili pacijentite ni treba ušte poveke sedacija, ali zato v operacijonite sali, kako musim odolna, odlično ni ide, jaz na mojata prezentacija kaže veke koleškata Jandreska go počina, ima poveke načini, međutoa jaz lično, ne sem rabotala se razbira, da nije ne rabotim, međutoa odlično ni ide. Tako da probajte videti, ki ni kažete rezultat. Nije, veke sme probale, to je go kažel, znači veke sme probale so koliškata, znači i oda dobro i graftot, odnosno funkcijata na graftot je sosema uredna, duri možem da kažem i koga se naprave nekoja izvesna sporedba so vodenje na pacijenti klasično i so deksmetom i din, znači imaše dobri efekti. Така што и кај другите операции, значи не само кај бубрежните трансплантации, кај радикалните простатектоми. Да, особено кај пациентите. Да, значи особено кај пациентите кои што се подложени, можам да кажам, на лапароскопска хирургија која што трае подолго и на некој начин има заштитна функција и улога во бубрежната, да ја заштити бубрежната функција, еве да речеме и графтот на при бубрежната трансплантација. Дали некој друг има прашање или коментар? Благодарам уште еднаш за прекрасно предавање. Ја покануам доктор Марина Темелковска-Стевановска да ја изложи своята презентација. Драги колеги, добар ден. Да не се повторувам, по кој знае кој пас, значи имавме прекрасен конгрес. А јас ја ќе објаснам мојата тема. Значи мојата тема нема анестезиолошки елементи. Ова е една од редките теми. Иако се работи за една хирургска интервенција, јас ја одбрав поради искуството кое што го имам на клиниката за ортопедија со пациенти кои што се оперирани од сколиоза и нивното богато а, а, искуство и а, во однос на а, менталното здравје, како влие, а, како резултат на сколиоза, така што е ка нив диагностицирана. А, мегутоа, оваа тема се однесува а, не само на сколиозата, значи може да се однесува на било кое друго хронично заболување, кој што се диагностицира ка едно дете, а се одразува на целата фамилија. Така да може воопшто да го сватиме како едно а, 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 обшто пореметување на менталното здравје на едно семество, кај чие дете е диагностицирано сериозно заболување. Сега да започнам значи, со мојата тема, односно со идиопатската сколиоза. Шок несигурност, непознаница, страф на пациентот, страф на родителот, чувство на нерешлива ситуација, контрадикторни информации на интернет. Се во ова едно благо опишана состојба, која што е крајно хаотична, а го ја зафаќа не само детето, туку и семейството, како резултат за, нив, за страшувачката диагноза на оваа хронична состојба. А, за жал, голем брод од пациентите им не знаат в суштон што представува сколиозата. Сколиоза представува комплексен тридимензионален деформитет на арбетот, кој што се карактеризира со латерална девијација од најмалку 10 степени, а со ротација на прошлените, кој што пак од своја страна доведува до асиметрија на рамењата, на градниот кож, градите, струкот и крлицата. Се разбира и асиметрија на мускулите на грбот. Зависно од возраста во која што се јавува идиопатската сколиоза, може да биде инфантилна, ювенилна и адолесцентна, 
Адолесцентната е најчеста и се јавува во период од 10 до 19 години, почесто кај девојчиња, а во однос а, некои 5 према 1 во однос на машките деца. И токму поради осетливоста на оваа возраст, значи тоа е период кога децата, а посебно девојчињата, неверојатно обрнуваат внимание на собствениот изглед и, изглед, и собствениот развој, Најчесто тие се предмет на испитување на нивното ментално здравје како резултат на пораметување од самата сколиоза. Диагнозата се поставува едноставно врз основа на ренген графија која што се прави во ПА позиција, во која преко користење на КОБ методот се одредува степенот на кривината, а латералната снимка се прави со цел да се утврди дали постои а, и а деформитет во сагиталната регија. Да напоменам, бидејќи еден од главните проблеми кои што ќе ги нагласам за родителите и за децата се информациите до кои што многу тешко доаѓаат, значи оваа стимка може да се направи единствено во општата болница Ремедика. Кај нас може да се направи во сегменти па да се лепи, меѓутоа тоа не е тоа, значи кога родител треба да ја снима и да направи панорама на рбетниот столб на своето дете, мора да отида во приватната болница Ремедика и да си ја направи стимката онака како што треба. Третмано зависи од големината на кривината и се состои во обсервација и во вежби кои што се специфични за сколиозата, најчесто препарачувани шрот асиметрични вежби, понатаму носење на корсет кај поголеми кривини, а според најновите сознанија, ако кривината е поголема од 40 степени, веќе постои индикација за операција. Се разбира, операцијата не е апсолутна индикација. Значи, детето, ако е полнолетно или фамилијата, само одлучува дали треба да ја прифатат или не операцијата, како и да е сакам да кажам дека апсолутна индикација ке сколиозата не постои. Многу битна работа за овие а, девојчиња кои што се во период на пубертет и она што многу ги загрижува е дали нивната кривина ќе прогредира. Тоа зависи од повеќе фактори, кои што се полот, големината на самата кривина, низиниот облик и локализација, како и преостанатиот период на раст на детето. Кривината, колку е поголема, толку повеќе покажува тенденција да прогредира и доколку е преостанат поголем период од расто, значи детето се уште не е порастато, а најчесто прогредира во периодот на наглиот раст. А поголеми кривини дури предизвикуваат и белодробен функционален дефицит. Токму затоа, а, а, конзервативниот третман, а го се диагностицира заболувањето со време. Конзервативниот третман кој што опаќа ја сликнува. Конзервативниот третман кој што опаќа а нели а, обсервација, вежби и корсет треба да започнат веднаш после диагнозата, да се изведуваат многу интензивно со цел да се намали и да се помошност да се спречи прогресијата на кривината, а со тоа понатаму да се спречат и долготрајните здравствени последици. Ова се прашалници кои што се користени во студиите за истражување на адолесцентите, јас тема да ги читам да не губиме време, и врз основа на нив е утврдено кај адолесцентите дека некаде околу 20% од нив страдаат од помалку позитивен поглед кон животот, страдаат од а, помал степен на самодоверба, имаат проблеми во конекција со нивните врсници, а анксиозноста е нивниот најголем проблем кој што го чувствуваат и ту има а, 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 сличен интензитет како оној кој што се јавува кај а, деца кај кој што е диагностициран канцер или пак трансплантација на срце. Родителите исто така покажуваат нели, елементи на пораметување на менталното здравје и квалитет на живот во облик на анксиозност и депресија и причина најчеста за оваа анксиозност и депресија е тоа што тие побаруваат 
а адекватни информации за сколиозата и незимниот третман. Значи тие тешко доаѓаат до информации. Информациите на интернет се многу контрадикторни и не знаат за што да се одлучат. А тие точни информации нити им се необходни за да може да го поддржат своето дете и се разбера заедно со него понатаму да одлучат за кој тип на третман да го применат. Се разбира понатаму мора да превземат веќе некои нови одговорности кои што им ги наметнува самата ситуација да се откажат од минати активности, се грижат за системот кариера стрес, се грижат се разбери за фамилиарниот буџет за тоа што доколку се решат за операција надвор од оваа држава, ова е една многу инвазивна и екстремно скапа операција. А, а, ова се исто така а, прашалниците врз основа на кои биле испитувани родителите и кој што кажа врз основа на нив е утврдено дека тие во поголем процент, значи ако 25% од а, адолесцентите страдале од анксиозност, кај родителите тоа се јавува некаде во 30% и анксиозността и депресијата кои што се јавуваат секогаш од заедно и секогаш се меѓусебно поврзани. Причина за а, 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 токму таја анксиозност и депресија имаат влијание на а, долгорочниот а, исход на нивната здравствена состојба, доведуваат до намалување на до зголемување, пардон, на нивното чувство на умор, доведуваат до појава на хронични заболувања како асосето тоа и до намалување на нивната физичка способност. А, доколку а, пациентите, односно адолесцентите, се решени да извршат оперативен зафат, а, исто така а, има студии а, во кои се истражувани овие пациенти во периодот додека ја, чек, ја очекуваат самата операција, и били истражувани не само адолесцентите, туку и нивните родители, и при тоа во студиите се генерирани четири клучни теми. Првата тема е продолжување со внимание. Тоа се однесува на фактот дека адолесцентите започнуваат, чекајќи ја операцијата, започнуваа да се откажуваат од одредени спортови кои што ги практицирале во минатото, си со цел а уплашени од деформитетот кој што веќе го има да не го влошат и а, во едно тие активности кај не веќе предизвикуваат чувство на замор и исцрпеност, а, поради, а тие се свести дека мора да водат сметка и да бидат очувани за а, изведувањето на самата операција. Ова е изјава од девојче која што ја за да не губиме време, нема да ви ја читам, значи, Малата се откажала од нели школска екскурзија, од страв за да не се занимава со одреден спорт, кој што ќе ја замори и може да ја влоши со стојбата. Втората клучна тема е дали сум по инокот. Клучува перцепција на адолесцентот на неговиот поинаков, на неговата поинаква појава и на видливоста на неговиот деформитет. Овие девојчиња во таа возраст се значи многу осетливи на деформитетот кој што го имаат и само за да го прикријат и носат широка облека, широки мајци, значи не излегуваат на плажа, не облекуваат бикини, зборувам за дел од нив се разбира, не за сите пациентки, а, а, не носат тести мајци, значи убаво се прикриваат така да Дури која ќе се погледнат од страна, тешко дека некој ќе каже дека имаат некаков деформитет на телото. Третата тема е емотивното патување и таа вклучува две подтеми. Ролер костер на емоции од шокот кој што го доживуваат по моментот на диагнозата, па се до за нив за страшувачката реализација на тежината на состојбата во која што тие се наоѓаат. А тие тоа го сваќаат за тоа што веќе а прифатиле да бидат оперирани и со самото тоа тие се свесни колку нивната состојба е сериозна кога побарува една многу инвазивна хирушка интервенција за да може да го решат деформитетот кој што го имаат. Не сум единствен, а тоа е а, опфаќа а всушност комуникација помеѓу сите оние адолесценти 
кои што ја исцекуваат операцијата и при тоа дел од нив сваќа дека има и други адолесенти кои што имаат потешок коглик, страдаат од потешки деформитети и а, на некој начин сто, а, сето тоа а, може и да ја, да ја намали нивната анксиозност. Последната тема е без болка нема добивка и се однесува на нивната загриженост и очекување од а, идната операција. Тие в сушност ја прифаќаат операцијата и нивна единствена цел е да завршат со незе и да остават позади себе и повеќе да не да размислуваат на операцијата. Родителите кои што во истиот период во истата студија биле испитувани, покажуваат намалување на степенот на анксиозноста од предоператив, предоперативниот до постоперативниот период, но се уште кај нив овој степен на анксиозност останува на едно одредено високо ниво за разлика од она кај децата. Причина за тоа е тоа што тие деформитетот на своето дете и стресната состојба во која што тоа се наоѓа го доживуваат многу посилно од самото дете, а од друга страна нивните грижи и очекувања од самата операција се на многу повисоко ниво за разлика од очекувањата на нивните деца. Значи децата само сакаат да завршат со тоа и не размислуваат што после тоа. Би сакала да ги наведам нашите искуства во врска со еве последните четири девојчиња кои што беа оперирани на нашата клиника. Значи четири женски адолесентки на наведената возраст, од кои двете се веќе во а, напредна адолесентна или рана адултна возраст, беа оперирани на клиниката за ортопедија, се разбира со користење на неуромониторинг, Првите два дена, а, тука мислам на значи, нулти и први постоперативен ден, на континуирана опиоидна анализија, втор постоперативен ден се прекинува постепено и се префрлаат на мултимодална неопиоидна анализија. Вториот ден, кога опиоидната анализија е веќе прекината, тие се стануваат од кревет и започнуваат да се движат. Предност тоа што се оперирани сите четири во, во исто време и на исто место, а во голема мерка им ја олеснува нивната состојба за тоа што тие меѓусебно комуницираат и ги споделуваат собствените искуства што ги доживуваат во тој постоперативен период. А, а, сите девојчиња операцијата ја одоживеа како крајно решение на нивниот проблем. Односно, како што има изјава во една од студиите на еден од ед, ед, испитаниците, очекувам дека кога еднаш ке завршам со операцијата, ке се вратам во нормала и ке почнам да водам нормален живот. Тоа беше размислување и на сите четири пациентки кои што беа оперирани. А, по натамошните наши искуства, значи тие беа испуштени 12-тиот ден од болница, после месец и пол веќе започнуваат со физикална терапија во термални бани во траење од 21 ден, придружени од страна на нивните мајки, каде што повторно може да ги разменуваат искуствата во врска со, а, со водената терапија, масажите, фи, а, вежбите кои што ги прават, Нели, мене ме боли еден мускул, мене друг и така натаму, така да таа комуникација повторно им ја олеснува состојбата и они в сушност по договор сите заедно одат на физикален третман. По завршување на физикалниот третман, по препорака на хирургот, веќе само после некој ден, тие се обавезно, значи, а мораат да започнат со вежбање, со симметрични вежби овој пат, од типот најчесто на теретана без тежина или кливање, со цел да, ја вратат, да го вратат тонусот на нивните мускули, посебно на мускулите на грбот. Во разговор со нивните мајки, а, кои беа главните проблеми на нивните мајки в сушност на нивните семејства, на нивните родители, а недостаток на информации околу сколиозата и начинот со нејзиниот третман, 
a kada da se napravi, koji da ja napravi, a što sa operacijata, koji sa komplikacijite, kakvi sa očekovanjata od sama ta operacija. Znači, da ne spomnam kakvi kontradiktorni podatoci ima majkite dobijeno od drugi doktori, kao na primer, vaše to dete pored ekribinata što ima ne može da zabremeni, što je strašno, ne li za jedan roditelj da go slušta. Ili, na primer, razobedovanje, to je strašna operacija, ta je mnogo rizična, sve to toa može da se postigne samo sa vežbanje i tako na tamo. Tako da, jaz moram, ova veke ne je reklama, treba še jaz izgleda prezentacija takve hirurzi, pa da održam. Znači, ova ne je reklama, ova se informacije, koji što smetam, deka nije, kako zdravstveni rabotnici sme obvrzani, dokolko gi znajme, da gi spodalovame, pomedju pacijentite, dokolko dojdeme v kontakt s ovakvi pacijenti ili da se raboti za nekoj drug tip na hronično zabolovanje, a imame informacije kada toa može da se tretira, znači potrebno je da gi spodelime informacijite za to što verujte mi, a roditeljite nemajat podatoci i nemaše Едно семејство кое што не беше отидено во странство за да бара лек за собственото дете. Значи, целокупниот третман на сколиозата, почнувајќи од конзервативниот до оперативниот, се изведува во нашата држава. Најсериозниот третман се разбира операцијата, се изведува на ортопедската клиника од страна на доктор Нерон Поповски, на Универзитетската клиника за травматологија од страна на доктор Хасани и доктор Марджановски и во приватната болница Аджибадан Цистина од страна на стручниот травматолошки и ортопедски тим, а сите тие под надзор на искусни професори од Турција, кои што се занимаваат со години со оваа патологија. Кој беше бенефитот за нашите пациентки? Нашите пациентки беа третирани од искусен тимна анестезиолози, значи има задов... беа задоволително обезболени, а, беа третирани од страна на љубезни сестри, а, а, кои што покажа за нив и за нивните родители големо разбирање и токму затоа степеното задоволство на девечињата беше на многу високо ниво. Тоа може да се види од следните слики. Ова е наша пациентка, на која што во предоперативниот период многу убаво се гледа не само деформитетот на рбетниот столб, туку и деформитетот на незините мускули. Само два дена после изведување на хирушката интервенција, каде што грбот е веќе исправен, и две недели после изведување на хирушката интервенција. Овие резултати со текот на времето понатаму, кога детето започнува да вежба, да се движи, да живее нормален живот и да функционира, стануваат се подобри. Никогаш може би нема да бидат идеални, но а, а, трудот и тенденцијата на овие деца е да постигнат резултати кои што се најблиску до идеалните. А, а, поради многуте контрадикторни податоци, кои што кажа во литературата, па дури и во стручната литература и студии, околу операциите, колку пациентите се задоволни, дали паци, а, операција треба да се из, а, извршува. Има студии кои што тврда дека а, пациентите чувствуваат болка пред операција, но и после операција може да чувствуваат исто така болката, што со дискусот, кои што се наоѓа исто чипките и така натаму. А, изп... Правени се студии, значи, кои што го испитувале задоволството на пациентите во постоперативниот период. Во студија од 2022 година е докашано дека со операција се постигнува многу подобра корекција на аголот на коп, добро функционирање на пациентот и многу низок степен на компликации во постоперативниот предел. Оваа слика е слика на девојче не од самата студија, туку наша пациентка, која што после само два и пол месеци, која што гледате, самостојно вежба во теретана и функционира со сама задоволително и добро и не е потребна никаква помош. Како заклучок, 
Како да се справиме со анксиозноста поради сколиозата? Препораки за адолесцентите. Разговор со оние кои што го имаат истиот проблем. Вежбање за да се одржи телото силно. Прифаќање на сколиозата. Подршка на другите кои што исто така страдаат од сколиоза. И психолошки третман, особено од типот на CBT, то колко е неосходен за детето. За родителите, подршка на нивните деца, собирање на адекватни информации за сколиозат и незимниот третман, а овие информации се разбира може да ги соберат само ако се упатат на вистинско место, кој што кажат, значи, тие мора да отидат кај искусен ортопед, а не кај а, некој кој што не се занимава со сколиоза. А, а, решавање на нивните грижи и проблеми што ги имаат околу операцијата, а, споделба на искуствата кои што ги имаат и, за крај, подршка на други фамилии кои што ги имаат истите проблеми. Се разбира, таа подршка може да се обавува дали лично, дали преку интернет групи за сколиоза и така натаму. Сите овие препораки се однесуваат не само на сколиоза, така што кажав, туку и на било кое друго хронично заболување кое што е диагностицирано кај дете и при тоа страда целото негово семејство, односно целата фамилија. Ви благодарам. Благодарам, Марина, за прекрасното предавање. Поради тоа што имавме една разноликост во темите, некако мислам така ќе бидам развивме монотонија, ама нема да бидам нескромна, на вистина е една од поуспешните сесии според мене. А, така да на вистина убаво предавање да, нешто што е надвор од Значи ова е работа која што ретко за која што не ретко никогаш не изборуваме и затоа сметав дека еден конгрес е можеби а, на вистина згоден момент да се каже нешто што ретко го кажуваме, а при тоа може да го слушнат многу луѓе и да имаат корист од ова што ќе го слушнат, бидејќи видете, ние здрава држава имаме од здрава нација. Ако немаме здрава Точно. нација и ако имаме ментално болни а, значи, луѓе, тогаш ще имаме не здрава држава. И ако нашата држава реално и не е здрава баш, Мегуто си бака да се потрудиме да бараме полетоа. Благодарам, Марина. Дали има некој прашање? Да, професорке, констатација некоја? Да. примениме тоа како што имаме рекавери како што имаме рекавери да не се има предоперативна особа каде што доаѓаат најблиските на пациентот и анестезиологот разговара со нив претходно и хирургот разговара веќе таа време и секој фамилијата може да го праша значи анестезиологот што сака значи дали сака да праша што компликации каква анестезија ќе му даде за разлика кај нас кој што Пациентите се толку стресени, не знаат ни што им правиме, ни како им правиме. Значи. Една убава можност и тоа се, мислам, една просторија која ќе е отделена со зависи, со паравање, ништо посебно, мислам. Са тројца со пациентот седат.
И пациентот воопшто нема потреба од вако од анксиолитици. Мислам тоа е невозможно, мислам да, да. Еве не знам кај вас како е. Добар ден на сите. Јас работев тука на универзитетската клиника во тука не во Скопје. Сега сум околу 12 години во Германија, едно време бев долго време бев на ортопедија. А ваквите пациенти ки на не на ортопедија во Германија. Ам ваквите пациенти ки ам претходно обично еден месец ки подготвувавме со разговор од страна на хирурзите, со разговор од страна на анестезиолозите, но сепак им дававме пак анксиолитици затоа што мислам дека се премногу вознемирено и посебно во таа возраст на 15, 16, 17 години. Да, јас сакам да додадам нешто, значи а и кај нас постои тој разговор. Јас сега тука не го гледам, а нашиот доктор мене не ме интересира кој што ќе помисли. Меѓутоа секоја честан доктор Нерон Поповски, значи он има еден став, а кој што а не само што анестезиолозите разговараат со децата, туку закажува термин кога му одговара на детето на пациентот закажува термин и притоа му кажува на детето да спреми да ги спреми сите можни прашања што го интересира детето околу операцијата и во договорениот период тој седнува со девојчето и одговара на сите можни прашања значи вие не знаете какви прашања се поставуваат тоа се девојчиња тоа се тинејџери нив ги интересира кога ќе можам јас да се измијам косата Може да замислите за тоа што он има огромна рана и они не смеа да ја мократ рана и тука има проблем како една девојка која што се јави ке има добра коса како да ја измие. Сакам да кажам и он на сето тоа им дава објаснување така да секоја чест ја не знам сега како е на травматологија но знам дека исто така оперираат групи на пациенти и ваквиот групен третман е одличен за тоа што На самите пациенти им е многу полесно и многу си се подржуваат. Уште една работа пропуштив да кажам. Прва болница која што започна со интервенирање, со оперирање на оваа патологија, тоа е костозглобната болница во Охрид. Јас се извинувам што не ја спомнав, мислев, ама во ова брзање како што касниме, нека ми извини и даре, и он чека да презентира и конечно да заврши, Значи, морам да ја спомнам ко со сглобната болница како многу успешна се разбира со по-застарена метода. Е, сега, во денешно време јас добив податок дека а не ли они е стари хирурзи кои што сега веќе го прекинале својот работен однос тука, меѓутоа ги имаат едуцирано младите, така да младите, а, моите колеги анестезиолози кажуваат дека работат и започнуваат со интервенции за сколиоза и во костозглобнава болница. А бидејќи е голема таја офаќа и, а, колку што јас знам, и конзервативен третван, значи, кога, а, кога а, ке се усовршат тие а, а, млади доктори, комплетниот третван од самиот почеток до крај би можел да се обавува тука. Така да... А, а, сакам да кажам, а, то е големо не само олеснување ментално, олеснување во поглед на буджет и во многу, мислам, од многу други страни се разбира. Благодарам, Марина. А, јас Даре. мислам дека сепак веќе треба и да го најавиме нашиот помлад колега, кој што пред многу години а, беше дел од нас. Мислам дека тука му беа успешни почетоците токму на нашата клиника, па потоа отиде по својот пат и замина во приватната болница Систина, повели Дарко Саздов со своето предавање. Добар ден и од мене. Благодарам на организаторите за можноста да бидам дел од овој конгрес. Знам дека сме на крај со...
Добро, добар ден и од мене. Значи, јас сум доктор Дарков Саздов, работам во приватната болница Ачи Баден Систина. Инаку сум асистент професор на Интернационалниот Балкански факултет. Мојата презентација денес ке биде за неинвазивни тестови за флуид респонсивност, повеќе околу ехокардиографија и флуид респонсивност. Значи, са, пошто веќе сите зборуваа на македонски, јас ке зборам на македонски, инаку првично се спремат во англиски, ајде ке тераме на македонски. Значи, терапија со течности е практично прва терапевска опција за која што размислуваме и со која што почнуваме при третман на пациенти со акутна циркулаторна слабост. Целта на терапијата е да го зголемиме кардијалниот аутпот, значи да го зголемиме системскиот притисок, тој да како а, да донесе до зголемен зголемен повраток на срцето и да имаме зголемен кардијален аутпот. А се со цел да имаме повторно зголемена подобра микроциркулација. Меѓутоа, студиите покажале дека практично само кај половина од пациентите тој ефект настанува, односно само кај половина пациенти имаме зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот. И тоа е веќе одамна покажано од оваа системски ревју на 13 студии од Фредрих Мишард, каде што практично од сите овие 13 студии се забележало дека само 50% одговараат на терапија со течност и со зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот. Останатата половина се од зголемен ризик за флуид оверлоуд, а ризиците од флуид оверлоуд се сега веќе сериозно се докажани од ткивен едем, под, подолго потешко ослободување од механичка вентилација, с голем, с големен број на престој во интензивното лекување и во болниците, исто така и флуид оверлоуд е практично докажан дека престава предиктор за морталитет, особено кај пациенти со септичен шок, кај пациенти со арц, интраабдоминална хипертензија и акутна, акутно бубрежно попуштање. И ова се некои од тие студии кои што практично го покажуваат ефектот на позитивниот баланс со течности, особено кај пациенти со сепса и пациенти со акутен респираторен дистрес синдром. Е сега што представува флуид респонсивност? Флуид респонсивност всушност представува иницијално првата дефиниција од Марики со работници кои што дефинираат флуид респонсивност како зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот од повеќе од 10% на даден болос со течности повеќе од 4 мл на килограм телесна тежина. На што се должи тоа принципот е многу едноставен, се должи на Франк Старлиговата крива, каде што даден далено зголемување на прилоудот треба да даде одредено зголемување на кардиолниот аутпот. Меѓутоа се тоа не е така едноставно бидејќи во одреден момент не можеме да претпоставиме во кој дел од кривата се наоѓа пациентот, нашиот пациент. Во текот на лекувањето таа состојба исто така е променлива. Ако денеска бил флуид респонсивност во наредните неколку часа може да биде флуид респонсив. Зависно од тоа во кој дел од кривата се наоѓа. Ако се наоѓа во асцидентниот дел од кривата, значи даденот зголемување волумен на течности ќе доведе до значајно зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот. Меѓутоа во ако е во еќе во хоризонталниот дел од кривата, тогаш имаме врече си незначително зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот. Ако на тоа ја суперпонираме и Марек Филипсовата крива ќе забележиме дека тој тоа исто зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот, односно не зголемување на кардијалниот аутпот, ако сме во хоризонталниот дел од кривата, кај пациенти со сепса ќе доведе до значително зголемување на екстра ланг васкулар ланг вотер, што беше беше во предходната сесија на начната. Е сега како да предвидиме во кој дел од кривата се наоѓа нашиот пациент? Во последните две децении се користени а, статичните тестови за флуид респонсивност како мерка за флуид респонсивност, меѓутоа сите студии и повеќе рандомизирани, а веќе и мета анализи покажуваат дека овие статички а, индиц, а, тестови како ЦВП, пулмонарен алтериски оклузивен притисок, а, десно, срце, десно срцеви волумени или поновите тестови за, дес, а, за дијастолна дисфункција измерени само еднаш во единица, во една точка од времето на пациентот, не покажуваат корелација со флуид респонсивност. И освен во нивните екстремни вредности, на пример, ако збориме за ЦВП, ако биде вредност на минус, тогаш веројатно да, или ако збориме за некои од другите параметри, значи ако се тие во нивните екстреми, тогаш може би да не укажа дека пациентот ќе биде флуид респонсив, иначе во сите останати случаи не е тоа случај. Заради тоа се препорачува динамички параметри, односно динамички тестови за проценка на флуид респонсивност. И тие може да ни помогнат да утврдиме во кој дел од кривата нашиот пациент се наоѓа. 
Значи, што представуваат тие динамички тестови? Практично тие представуваат еден стрес за срцето, преминувајќи го кардиалниот прилод и да видиме како на таа промена на кардиалниот прилод срцето ќе одговори, односно дали тоа ќе има ефект на кардиалниот аутпут. Тоа можеме да го направиме со наједноставно, со класичен болус на течности, со пасивно подигнување на нозите, односно пасивен лелек райс тест, или користејќи ги хартланг интеракциите. Се класичниот флуид тест на флуид респонсивност то означува давање на болус со течности од 200 до 500 мл за период од некои 20 на минути. Меѓутоа, што е недостаток на овој тест, недостаток е што ако треба тој да се повтори неколку пат, неколку пати во денот, тогаш тоа можеме да тоа ќе допринесе за позитивен баланс на течности и тогаш има ги имаме сите негативни ефекти. Заради тоа одиме на помала, по, да речам, по безбедна варианти, ајде да пробаме со помали волумени и прв пат нели е, опишани од милери со работници, каде што се оди со волумени од 50 до 150 мл и, и сега овие се даваат за многу краток период, од некој си е, една минута, да речеме, и во тој период бараме промена во кардиалниот аутпут. И практично со овој мини флуид чалендж е забележано дека има многу висока сензитивност и специфичност и е, може да се мери ефектите негови мора да се мераат во реал тайм зато што се кратко трајни и се многу минимални мора да се мераат во реал тайм и како метода која што може да се користи неинвазивно пошто збориме за неинвазивните се ехокардиографија. Извинете. Е сега за меѓутоа и, и овој минимал флуид чалендж ако го повториме повеќе пати во денот сепак можеме да допринесе за флуид оверлод и која ни е алтернативата алтернативата ни е да искористиме пасив лег рајс тест практично овде ка немаме ризик од флуид оверлод пошто ги го користиме в собствениот крвен волумен на пациентот односно што престава пасив лег рајс тест практично ја менуваме положбата на пациентот од семи рекумбент значи телото да биде од 45 степени над нозата и во обратна позиција, значи телото да биде хоризонтално, а нозите да бидат во 30 до 45 степени и на тој начин предизвикуваме редистрибуција на волумен од околу од некои 300 мл од нозете и од сланкничната регија и пелвичната регија према срцето. И практично представува тоа еден прилоу чален за пациентот и ако тоа допринесе да зголемува за зголемување на кардиалниот алпо, значи можеме да заклучиме дека двете комори се флуид респонси. Е сега кои се пет а, необходни работи кои што треба да, да ги, да ги а, направиме како што треба за да биде успешен тестот. Значи, прво мора да се започне од семи рекумбент позиција. Не може да се започне од хоризонтална позиција, тестот нема да биде валиден. Ако е пациентот на механичка вентилација пред тестот, треба да се направи туалета на трахеално, брохеалното стебло, зато што ќе го свртите пациентот во хоризонтална секретот, ќе добие, ќе предизвика кашлице, однак тестот нема да биде валиден. Да, при тоа не се допира пациентот, најдобро е да се користат контролите на креветот, за која што, што секоја манипулација со пациентот може да го зголеми стресогениот одговор, па повторно тестот да биде а, невалиден. Превишно пре да го започнеме тестот, правиме мерење со кое што ќе го следиме и после тоа. Значи, ако користиме ехокардиографија, мериме есе ехокардиографија. Ако користиме пулс контура на било кој тест да го користиме, значи пре да ја започнеме процедурата го мериме и после завршување на тестот мериме уште еднаш. На, на максималниот ефект на овој тест се забележува меѓу 30 и 90 секунди и заради тоа е добро да се прави да се следи во реал тайм. Ехокардиографијата дава прекрасни можности да се прави тоа во реал тайм. После враќање на пациентот во првобитната положба повторно се прави мерење и необходно е да се добијат базални вредности оние како што се добиени првично, затоа што ако не се добиат тогаш значи дека други фактори допринеле за да биде тестот позитивен, а не самиот тест. И на крај се, се дава болус со течности за да се потврди реално дали пациентот е флуид респондер или не е флуид респондер и да се потврди а, сензитивноста и специфичноста на тестот. Пасив лег рейс тестот е, е значи, веќе потврден и со повеќе студии и со метаанализи, има многу висок процент на сензитивност и специфичност и многу добра позитивна вредност и негативна предиктивна вредност. Вклучен и во најновите препораки за surviving sepsis. Значи, рековме дека промените со кои што се настанати од овој тест може да се да се следат ехокардиографски. Значи она што се прави е практично се добива пет коморен прозорец, left ventricular outflow tract, значи на аортата се поставува доплер сигналот и се добива reading. По новите а, апарати имаат можност за автоматизирано да го искалкулираат, ако не потоа значи може самиот да си ги треснеме од добиениот сигнал. 
Практично она што бараме е да има повисок зголемување на ВТИ индекс од повеќе од 10%. Ова е нашата студија, значи она што се ние го сработивме, практично исто како и другите студии, користевме значи пасив легре и тест кај пациенти во интензивно лекување, пациентите беа на со на спонтано дишање не беа на механичка вентилација и добивме некој процент од 56% пациенти кои што се флуид респондерс и имаме многу висок процент на а, сензитивности и специфичности ери under the curve од 0 скоро 0.9. Кои се предностите значи предностите се тоа што може значи немаме ризик од флуид оверлод може да се користи кај пациенти на собствено дишање Може да се користи кај пациенти со срцеви аритми, оно што другите тестови него не го можат, односно имаат многу пониска корелација со флуид респонсивност, кај пациенти со е, вентилација со низок тайдал волумен, пациенти со нарушена комплијанса, пациенти со арц, онаму каде што се практично пулс прешер варијешн и строг волјум варијешн многу по многу помалку осетливи. Ако немаме е, N tidal Ова, ако немаме ехокардиографија, ова најчесто станува збор за операционните сали. Можеме да, пошто таму е МЦО2 скоро на сите апарати, достапно може да се користи за мерење на флуид респонсивност. Поради тоа што во операционните сали пасив легре и стест, дека и некои оперативни интервенции не може да се користи, заради хирургијата може да се користи трендер положба. И она што бараме во кај N-Tidal CO2 практично е докажано дека зголемување на N-Tidal CO2 за повеќе од 5% е предиктивен за флуид респонсивност, односно зголемување на кардиалниот инг за повеќе од 15%, со висок процент на сензитивност и, и практично специфичност од 100%, што значи овдека немаме лажно негативни. Тие што нема да одговорат, сигурно нема да одговорат. Ова е табела која што практично ги сумира предностите и недостатоците и методите кои што може да се користат за мерење на на мерење на кардиалниот аутпут, значи на прво место е пулс контур анализис, меѓутоа таа инвазивна метода со помош на артериска линија од неинвазивните инкрист, она што го зборуваме со ехокардиографија и NTIL CO2, а другите се се уште со многу мал број на студии за да може да се за да може да се препорачаат. И третиот, третиот начин на кој што можеме да го речем, предизвикаме срцето и да видиме дали ќе биде флуид респондер е со користење на хард ланг интеракциите. Практично тоа се промените кои што настануваат во тек на респираторниот циклус. Она што се случува под, под влијание на позитивно притисочна вентилација, односно влијанието на позитивно притисочна вентилација на срцето, практично тоа доведува, значи при позитивен притисочен инспириум имаме намалување на а, прилодот на десно срце и намалување на и изголемување на афтерлоудот, како резултат на тоа ќе имаме намалување на ежекционата фракција од десно срце, што по неколку срцеви одчукувања, времето кое што е потребно за таа та количина на крв, ја помине белодробната циркулација и стигне до левото срце, ќе имаме намалено полнење на левото срце и веќе во експириум тоа ќе се забележи со намалување на срцевиот ударен волумен. Значи, принципот е дека колку повеќе двете комори се прилоуд респонсив, толку повеќе ударниот волумен ќе се намали за време на експериментот при позитивно притисочна вентилација. Други два механизми кои што се помалку студиите покажуваат дека се многу помалку имаат многу помално влијание во ефектот на механичка вентилација се овие два кои што се кај пациенти со хиперволемија и кај пациенти со левовентрикуларна дисфункција, меѓутоа да за во интерес на времето само ќе ги Прескокнеме. Ова се првите методи инвазивни кои што се користени за да се мерат промените во тек на хартланг интеракции. Инвазивни, значи тоа е строг волум варијација, кои што покажува многу високо ниво на сензитивност и специфичност. Меѓутоа, не може да се мери кај пациенти со спонтана вентилација, кај пациенти со тайдал волум под 8 мл на килограм, пациенти со кардиални аритми и арц. Потоа следните се пулс прешер варијешн и пулс контур анализис. И она што кога овие две методи кои што се инвазивни не можеме да ги правиме и заради тоа што да речеме немаме артериска линија кај пациенти на оддал, можеме повторно да искористиме ехокардиографија. Принципот се саснува ист практично на она што го прави пулс прешер, односно строг волум варијешн. Повторно мериме лево вентрикуларен аутфлоу трак, можеме да мериме на ниво на лево вентрикуларен аутфлоу трак пик велосити или можеме да мериме VTI индекс. Како и да е во двата случаи, доколку добиеме со овој метод варијабилност поголема од 12%, тогаш сме докажали дека се работи за, за флуид респондер. Значи, кај пациент на механичка вентилација, 
ако биде, или пациент со спонтанно дишање, ги мериме пик велосити и ако добиеме поголема вариација од 12%, тогаш сме докажале дека пациентот е флуид респонден. Е сега, многу често кај пациентите не можеме да добиеме адекватен петокоморен прозорец, ехокардиографски, особено кај пациенти на механичка вентилација. Практично студиите покажува да речи се некој, по некои студии до 40% не може да добиете адекватен прозорец и не може да направите соодветно мерење. Како замена може да се искористат големите артерии крвни садови, значи може да се искористи заедничката каротидна артерија и брахиалната артерија како замена и практично истиот принцип на оваа артерија се мери пик велосити, се мери ВТА индексот или се мери така наречен коректед флоу тайм и доколку имаме варијабилност поголема од 12 14% во некои студии, тогаш со сигурност можеме да докажеме дека се работи за флуид респонда. Значи, ова е како тоа изгледа на каротидната артерија. Значи, ја добиваме каротидната артерија во надолжен пресек, ги включуваме доплер сигналот во средината на артеријата, го коригираме гейтот да биде ангол, аголот на корекција меѓу 30 и 60 степени, уклучуваме пулс доплер и ја добиваме кривата. Од кривата можеме да ги измериме пик велосити или area under the curve, ако сакаме VT индекс, и ако добиеме разлика меѓу максималната и минималната брзина во тек на еден респираторен циклус поголема од 12%, тогаш сме, или 14% во некои студии, тогаш сме докажале флуид респонсивност. Истото со коректед каротид флоу тайм. Меѓутоа, како и за пулс контур анализис и како и за строг волум вариейшн и овдека, пошто истиот прицим се го мериме ехокардиографски, ограничувањата се пациентот да нема аритмија, да нема спонтано дишање. Тайдал волум над 8 мл на килограм, кај пациенти со ARDS ке имаме многу помала реалбилност и кај пациенти со интраабдоминална хипертензија исто така ке има помала реалбилити тестот. Уште еден од тестовите кои што практично има најмала корелација со флуид респонсивност, а тоа е варијабилноста на диаметарот или површината на вена кава инфериор или супериор. И зависно од равенката која што се користи за пресметување на овој индекс, практично диагностички критериум е од 12 до 18% промена во диаметарот кај пациенти на механичка вентилација или кај пациенти на спонтана вентилација, повеќе од 50% варијација во диаметарот е доказ за флуид респонсивност. Ова се промените во диаметарот на вена кава инфериор, различни во спонтана вентилација, спот сосем спротивника и механичка вентилација промените, се мери во надолжен пресек, значи лонгитудинален пресек, оваа вена, 2 см од влезот во каво артериалната јункција, од практично негде на влезот на вена хепатика супериор, се включува мед М мод и се добива онаа слика долу и практично со мерење на минималниот и максималниот диаметар, преку равенка може да се пресмета кавалниот индекс, меѓутоа сега докажуваат повеќе мета студии практично дека овој кавален индекс има многу мал, многу мала а, веродостојност во предикција на флуид респонсивност од дури 0.65%, многу ниска веројатност, практично многу блиско на вртење паричка. И сега за крај, значи респираторен оклузивен тест Ова е нешто што групата на Ксавиер Моне и Жан Луи Тебул го препорачуваат кај како, како можност за мерење на, на флуид респонсивниски пациенти на механичка вентилација. Она што се прави се користат овие хартланг интеракции, меѓутоа се прекинуваат во одреден дел. Значи, како са, значи можеме да го прекинеме, да ја прекинеме механичката вентилација на крајот на експириум или на крајот на инспириум. Ако ја прекинеме механичката вентилација на крај на експириум, тогаш го прекинуваме цикличното намалување на кардиалниот прилод. Кардиалниот прилод се зголемува транзиторно, кој што може да доведе до зголемување на кардиалниот одпут, што значи двата вентрикула се флуид респонсивност. Од другата страна, ако, ендекс, ако направиме ендиспираторна пауза, тоа би требало да го намали кардиалниот одпут во случај на прилод, прилод зависност. Она што треба да се запази, дека времето на оклузијата треба да биде меѓу, меѓу 12 и 30 секунди, значи треба да се внимава, некои од пациентите сепак не можат тоа да го истолерираат, меѓутоа обично се користат 15 секунди, значи доволно период за тој прилод да може да го ја помине белодробната циркулација и стигне до левото срце. Меѓутоа, што е лимитација, ако се користи само еден од овие тестови, практично промената во кардиалниот волумен е многу мала и таа се однесува негде околу во предел од 5% промена во кардиалниот алпот. И ако користиме ехо, тоа е практично многу ниска вредност за да ехо може да ја детектира. 
бидејќи е интраоперативната разлика кога кога еден оператор го користи ехото и прави исто мерење кај ист пациент со тргање на сондата може да добие различни вредности во некои си вариации од 11%. Ако не ја тргне сондата од пациентот, варијабилноста е негде 5%, што значи дека многу блиску е до трешхолдот на ехокардиографијата и може да ги да ги да не ги детектира промените. Заради тоа оваа група од Моне и Джан Луи Тебул препорачуваат комбинација од двата теста. Значи комбинација, прво ќе направиме ендиспираторен, ќе го комбинираме после пауза од неколку секунди со инспираторен тест и практично забележува дека веќе добиваат зголемување на а, промена на кардијалниот одвод од 13%, што е веќе многу блиску до трешхолдот на ехокардиографијата и може со сигурност да се детектира и практично докажуваат гледајте многу висока сензитивност од ареандата крв од 0,97%. Е сега, што правиме со ПИП кај овие пациенти? Правим дали ПИП ќе влијае на овие тестови? Практично е докажано со студии дека при различни нивоа на ПИП од 5 до 15 см воден стоп, диагностичката сензитивност или точност на тестот не се менува и тоа е докажано со метаанализи. Е сега дали е ова важно, тоа се е убаво и фино што ние докажавме дека пациентот е флуид респондер, но дали тоа значи дека треба да му дадеме течност. Значи прво и основно тестот не се прави кај секој пациент. Значи мораме да имаме причина за да му направиме. Значи прво пациентот треба да докажеме дека има акутна циркулаторна слабост и тогаш да размислиме што ќе правиме. Ако пациентот, значи многу често се случуваат, се јават од ургентен центар, пациентот дошол хипотензивен, они му дале веќе 2 литра течности, меѓутоа немаме промена со состојбата и сега прашуваат да му даваме уште течности или да го качуваме во шок соба, што да правиме. Значи во такви ситуации кога не знаете веќе на која страна е пациентот, е добро да се направи некои од можните тестови за флуид респонсивност и да да видиме што е најдобро да правиме за пациентот. Она што студиите покажуваат дека вклучувањето на овие тестови на флуид респонсивнес во една заеднички во еден протокол за гол директед флуид терапи односно гол директед менеджмент докажува има позитивни ефекти кај пациенти во периоперативниот период со намалување на постоперативните компликации и кај пациенти во интензивно лекување исто така со намалување на бројот на компликации намалување на бројот на денови во интензивно лекување намалување на престојот на механичка вентилација Што значи, со користење на овие тестови, практично ние добиваме дополнителен метод за како по-оптимизирано и по-персонализирано да ја скроиме нашата терапија со течности и на тој начин да помогнеме во еден дел за неговото успешно лекување во единиците и во нашите болници. Ви благодарам. Благодариме и на тебе, Дарко, за навистина многу убава прекрасна презентација мислам дека може и ќе развиеме некоја дискусија околу ова дали некој би сакал нешто да праша да додаде да искоментира добро со оглед на тоа дека немаме прашања да разбирам да така е значи ние пасив легре исте справиме тоа го прави Наједноставно, да. Сега му наоѓаат нова примена. Да, повторно го воскресуваат. Одамна беше препорачан, сега само наоѓаат. Она што Филип го кажа во предходната негова презентација во однос на вининг од механичка вентилација, самиот вининг представува еден вид на флуид респонсивност или флуид толеранс. Значи, од едната страна на кривата или на медалјата е флуид респонсивност, од другата страна е терминот на флуид толеранс. Значи, колку пациентот може да толерира течности, а тоа веќе можеме да го следиме со овие други како што спомна Билайнс, како што спомна диастолна дисфункција и така натаму, меѓу тоа беше некој друг концепт. Интересно е тоа што многу а, стари а, техники и методи, а, како анестезиолошки, така и хирушки, а, некако се возобновуваат и во суштина а, има корист од нив на некој начин. Така да, тоа би било нешто што и да јас би го... Да. Викаше, не ги заборавајте старите лекови. Точно е. 
Да, наједноставното во суштина е и најдоброто, да. Добро, доколку нема некои други а, прашања, јас а, ти благодарам Дарко, благодарам што си, да. А, ја затварам оваа сесија и ја прогласувам за навистина многу успешна и многу ми беше драго што бев дел од неа. Со сите вас заедно. Ви благодарам.